are just so many so if we delay a little bit we'll run out of time 
So let us have someone to pray for us and then we start our sessions. Anyone touched to pray for us? My lady, kindly pray for us. Thank you very much. Uh, members, welcome, welcome to the second Mombasa Plastic uh, Waste Management Sector Dialogue. My name is Lucy Nyambura. I'll be your MC for the first bit of uh, uh, the meeting today. I want us to look at the program. I believe all of us has a program. It's, it was placed on the table. Uh, most of us were sent in our mails. Kindly also check your mails you'll be able to get the program. So this is a two-day uh, dialogue session. And uh, we've already start, started by uh, registering ourselves. I believe there's a form that is going around. Kindly uh, write your name in that form. And then we'll have opening remarks from uh, WWF. These are the sponsors that have made this day happen. And it will be done by Madam Asma Awad. We will have Hand in Hand East Africa by Albert Wambugu. We'll have Comrade by Dr. Innocent Wanyonyi. Boost Eva uh, Kimani. Can we, can, we, can we just probably? Yeah, thank you. And then for Mombasa Technical Working Group, I'm the chair, so I will do the presentation, just a welcoming remark. And then county government, we're expecting our colleagues from the county to come. And then the opening will be done by one of our, uh, the county government uh, of Mombasa. So on theme, we have the policy. That is the first theme. Uh, so our county uh, CEC, Dr. Nato, will open up with the Mombasa County Government Solid Waste Management Act. And then soon after, we'll have the NEMA, where we will discuss about Sustainable Waste Management Act. That is extended producer responsibility and reg regulation, the APR. This will be done by Mr. Calvin uh, Rashid. And then we'll have a plenary discussion that will be hosted by Eva. Then we'll have our tea break and come back for the second theme, which is the partnership. Then after that, we'll have Jaika do a presentation, and that will be done by John Mwingai. And then uh, Kepro and Petko, Susan and Gadoni. This will go on until 12.15, uh, uh, where we'll have Kenya Primary Sector Alliance, that is the Kenya Plastic Pact, by Ebenezer. And then Kenya Association of Waste Recyclers, by Kainika. We'll also have the Likoni Waste Recycling uh, Corporation, Cooperative Limited that will be at 12.45 and it will be done by Idi Muhammad and then we'll go for our lunch break which will take us one hour and then in the afternoon when we come back we'll do the partnership for growth and that will be led by Alex. And then at 2.15, we'll have our partnership and data management by Dr. Innocent, and then a plenary discussion, which will be hosted by Brian from GIZ. We'll have our evening tea, and then we leave for the day. On the second day, that will be on Thursday, at 9 to 9.30, we'll do the innovation and incubation information and awareness by Lillian and Eva, and then at 9.30, we'll have the Green Entrepreneur, Entrepreneurship by Albert Wambugu. 
Then at 9.45 to 10, we'll have the waste to value by Asma Nawad. And then we'll have our tea break and come back for the Vince recycling, that is Sarah Jau, and then plenary discussion. We'll go for our lunch, and when we come back, the room will be set up again afresh so that we can have the displays from the exhibitors that will be participating. So the exhibitors are from different organizations and different, uh, they do different things. And so it will be an opportunity for us to see the different things that are happening within the county of Mombasa and also out of Mombasa County. We'll also have some uh, exhibitors online and they will also showcase what they are doing uh, in terms of uh, plastic waste and solid waste management. So it is my hope and prayer that we'll all be here today and tomorrow and we'll appreciate the different categories and different things that every member who is here will bring on the table. So at the end, we'll have a closing remark or just chatting away forward. And this will be led by Arafa from the Ministry, Department of Water and then have our evening tea and then we close. So it's my hope and prayer that all of you will enjoy the sessions and you're welcome to be part of this second plastic waste uh, sector dialogue. So karibuni sana, sana, sana. So we'll start with our introductions also. Among us, you need to know who we are. So allow me to start with WWF. The members of WWF, I need one person to introduce the rest of the team. WWF, then you introduce your team. Thank you so much, Madam Lucy, for this uh, chance and opportunity to be part of this team. Uh, my name is Henry Masai. I'm the project lead EPR project, WWF. And uh, I came with a team from WWF, so please kindly uh, stand. And maybe I can just introduce them. Uh, we have Hussein Ahmed, a pro project assistant. Uh, Sakli Economy, we have uh, Julie Myra, project assistant, EPR. Then we have uh, Lily Kabaka, also an assistant in the Circular Economy Initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, WWF. Then we have Hand in Hand. Yes, thank you. Uh, probably the team from Hand in Hand can stand. Uh, we are a number of us. Uh, Gerald Gichuki Mwangi uh, is my name. Branch manager, uh, Hand in Hand Eastern Africa, uh, Mombasa branch. Allow me also uh, to introduce my, uh, the team that I'm with. Uh, we have Albert uh, Wambogo, uh, who is our CEO. Uh, he will be having a session uh, uh, in the program. Then we have Linda Sego, a business relationship officer. We have Collins Omondi, uh, a program officer. And Anthony uh, Odiambo, uh, m and &E. And then we have Hilda Maloa, our communication uh, person. Thank you, and looking forward to engage. Thank you very much, hand in hand. Uh, Conrad? Conrad? Your, the people have come with? Uh, th thank you, Lucy. You, you, I didn't hear the name of the organization. <laughs> so my name is Innocent Wanyonyi. I'm from uh, uh, Comrade, not Comrade, okay. Coastal and Marine Resources Development okay. in full. And I'm here with a team, so please uh, stand up wherever you are if you are from Comrade. Uh, at the far end is Catherine. Uh, she's uh, uh, doing uh, communication and all the things that are happening here. Then next to her is uh, Eunice. She's uh, also working with us on uh, Mijibora and Bandaribora. And uh, finally, we have Titus, uh, who is also uh, working with us. Today, I've brought a new team. 
you're used to the other names. So there's one more new one who will come in the day. And um, I just wanted to say that uh, on, um, I got a message from one of our partners, WWF, uh, Asma. Uh, she actually asked me to introduce WWF, but I let, I let uh, Henry do it because of the nature of the partnership. We hosted the first dialogue together with WWF and Hand in Hand. So this second dialogue, we are lucky to have even one extra partner uh, 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 who will introduce themselves after me. So you see, the house is growing bigger and bigger, so it's not just comrade. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Now we go to Boosts. Introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. Mm. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Eva Kemani, and I manage a project called Boost. And it's a partnership of four organizations. Um, so there is NITA, National Industrial Training Authority. There is MDF, which is where I work. And then there is Close the Gap Kenya, who hosts the project at Ratna Square. And then we have Crosswise Works. Um, we are in the circular economy space, but we support young people and organizations and companies to innovate, but also to build, the, to build skills and as well provide access to affordable ICT equipment and assets, but over and above that to ensure that there is awareness around circularity. So we have three components that we do. So the awareness creation uh, and the skill development, which is led then with NITA and MDF. So currently we have a, a curricula that is NITA accredited now and it's on repair and maintenance of ICT equipment. So to reduce and reuse, um, so that contributes the whole circular economy aspect. Then we incubate young businesses or startups that are within the green economy or around circularity. And so far we've been able to incubate around 254 businesses who then have created more um, employment for young people within the Mombasa ecosystem. And finally, we have a factory that is based in Jomvu, and that's the Close the Gap Hub, or Circular Economy Hub, where the refurbished computers that are brought in are repurposed and refurbished, and then they go back out into the market. So contributing that whole agenda. We are under the three SDGs, um, decent work, uh, uh, proper use and consumption, and finally, partnership engagement. And this is what brings us here. And I sit with the rest of the team. I think I'm the newest, or I don't want to say the youngest, but the newest within the, um, the dialogue. And it's a pleasure to be here and to be hosting, uh, but more so to create awareness and to contribute towards a smart and clean and green city and a circular city in Mombasa. Thank you, Lucy. So, uh, let me also uh, invite the Mombasa County team. Anybody from Mombasa County, from the different departments, kindly arise. We introduce ourselves. Mombasa County, anybody from Mombasa County, kindly arise. Yeah. So, we'll start with Jemima. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jemaima Maganga. I'm sure I've met uh, a couple of you in several other uh, dialogues we've had and uh, workshops in South Coast and here. Uh, I'm the one who sends you emails and I work under the Department of Environment, Waste Management and Energy in Waziri's office. Thank you, Jemaima. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Elijah Komora. I'm a public health officer under the Department of Health Services. Thanks so much. Okay. Good morning. My name is Araf Abdallah. I am the director in charge of natural resources, working in the Department of Water, Sanitation, and Natural Resources. Thank you. At the county. Thank you. And as I introduce myself, I'm Lucy Nyambura, also a public health officer. Uh, working in the Department of Health, but also the chair of the technical working group. 
Uh, now we'll go to the other members who have also joined us. So the, any other organization that we've not mentioned, not, not among the ones that we had already mentioned, kindly you can introduce yourself, I believe you are. Good morning. My name is Catherine Musioki, uh, I'm representing Mr. Green Africa. Mr. Green Africa is a company, is a recycling company. We are based in Nairobi, but uh, right now we've grown our wings. We are in uh, Mombasa. We have a hub for um, flaking, shredding uh, plastics. Our main agenda is to transform the waste pickers' journey. I look forward to interact more with all of us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amina Jaldesa. I'm from Kenya Fishery Service and uh, monitoring control and surveillance based at Liwatoni, Mombasa. Thank you. Abari Asubui. Good morning. My name is uh, Pat Sonchula Mwagona. I'm from Kodio East Africa. Uh, Kodio East Africa is a non profit making organization which mainly deals with research on the coral reefs. But currently I'm um, managing a program uh, which is in Lamu under uh, the project called Flip Floppy. We are one of the partners who are implementing the pro project in Lamu. And our role there is to conduct a baseline survey of the macro plastic along the Lamu archipelago. Thank you so much and looking forward for this productive uh, event. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dennis Okwara. I come from Double Roman Company Limited. We do flaking like Madame said. Uh, I'm looking forward for this very serious dialogue in Mombasa County. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Arun Budia from Jilinus Limited, Mombasa, a plastic recycler and uh, as well as manufacturer, uh, manufacturing water tanks from 100% recyclable material and looking for other opportunities in plastic recycling. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, my name is John Gitao Mungai from Japan International Cooperation Agency, Nairobi. Uh, I have a session later and it's a pleasure. This is my first time to be here and you are trying to explore ways in which we can come to Mombasa. So that's why I'm here, but I'll tell you more. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, pardon me, I have a cold. Eh? So I'm Susan Gitao, Regional Coordinator, Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Brian Chebor from the German Corporation GIZ under the comp other the component governance of mayors of Southern Africa. So we are supporting county governments in developing climate resilient projects. Uh, looking forward for the great part, uh, stakeholder discussion today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Beatrice Jerop from Kenya Wildlife Service, Mombasa Marine Park. Looking forward to interact with you more. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Albert Msando. I'm from Bamburi Cement. Um, I work for a unit of Bamburi Cement, which is the environmental arm of the company called Lafarge Ecosystems and uh, we rehabilitate and restore the quarries, Bamburi's quarries, and also manage the reserve lands. Uh, my particular role is uh, res restoration, education, and ecosystems manager. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Aidi Mohamed Eid. I'm the chairman from Likon West Recyclers Cooperative Societies Limited. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Gladys Sumjama. I'm from Jumia County, Zapwani, so I'm representing the six coastal counties. And um, I'll be um, holding a session later today to discuss um, the partnerships that we have and the different projects that we're doing in this initiative. And with me, I came um, with one of our partners from um, Equity Bank, who I'd want to introduce himself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gladys. Good morning, everyone. My name is Geoffrey Wanyonyi from Equity Bank. I'm so glad to be part of this discussion. We'll be sharing later the various interventions we have as a bank uh, on our way or on our road to having a circular city. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ali Sharif. Uh, I work with the county government of Mombasa, Department of Transport, Infrastructure, and Public Works. I'm the director in charge of transport operations. Thank you so much. We'll continue with the introductions later on. Uh, I'd like us to start our program. Uh, let me recognize Waziri, uh, Geoffrey Nato, he's already come. He's allowed us to continue the program and then he'll come later on uh, to do the opening remark and also to do his presentation. So I welcome uh, Madam Asma Award. I don't know if he was supposed to do a presentation. I don't know if there's a representative for Madam Asma. All right, thank you. So Karibu Sana, I do the uh, open remarks uh, for your organization. Good morning once again. Uh, my name is not Asma, but I'm um, representing her. Um, she's a bit committed somewhere else. So once again, my name is Henry Masai from uh, WWF, and I'll take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this dialogue. Um, I'll just briefly introduce WWF and the work we are doing at the coastal region. Um, we have different programs at the, within Kenya. WWF is a global organization, but for the Kenyan Charter, we have uh, a couple of programs ranging from um, uh, the Kenya Reflex landscapes to southern uh, Kenya and northern Tanzania uh, ecosystems. That's around the Mara protection area. Then we have a, the national program which is basically on governance and uh, legislation. Then we have our Coastal Kenya program, which uh, has several uh, spheres for conservation, from uh, marine, uh, terrestrial, and uh, of course, circular economy where we are in today. So um, our work in circular economy began because of the marine work that uh, initially was happening. And real we realized that a lot of uh, uh, species from the marine ecosystems are suffering because of our anthropogenic activities, especially human activity, uh, pollution, uh, especially from plastic. And then we saw it good for us to cut that kind of stream to the ecosystem by developing a program that will take care of, of that kind of uh, issue. So then the Circular Economy Initiative uh, was born, but this also was from the national or the global uh, program that WWF does on the No Plastics in Nature initiative. So, um, under the circular economy program, we have three different projects that uh, have an access or uh, that collaborate. And uh, the first project we had was the Danida Market Development Partnerships pro project which is a waste to value, where we are trying to improve and uh, create value out of waste. And so doing, we also improve the livelihoods of our communities. Because once they see the value of it, then 
it becomes easier for them to extract that uh, waste from the environment and make it in business. And in so doing directly, we cut the strain uh, to, the, to our protected ecosystems. Then uh, in the midst of impl implementing that project, we also got some funding from the Coca-Cola Foundation that was to enhance our initiatives uh, in the West Value project. So through that support, we've uh, also supported our CBOs, especially the waste management CBOs, to enhance their collection efficiency as well as transportation um, capabilities to their recycling sites as a way of value addition to the plastics. Um, then we also saw it important for us to, to bring an all-inclusive uh, project that is going to connect the source of these plastics and connect consumers as well as connect our waste managers or the people that deal with our waste. And that's where the Extended Producer Responsibility Project came in. So in this project, we are trying to, to talk to even companies, governments, and uh, waste managers to come into one sitting and draft what we are calling the EPR schemes which I'm very happy we already have uh, a, a few EPR schemes in Kenya. So that now we, we, we don't have waste in our ecosystems. There's that aspect of circularity because now people are committed, people are obliged by law to take responsibility post the consumer of the waste, especially for plastics and other packaging materials. So in a nutshell, that is what we are doing in the coastal region. We started with Mombasa, now we're expanding to Kilifi, Kwale, and Lamu counties. And um, we are happy to be part of this discussion, to deliberate more. I know we have recyclers in the house, we have policy makers, we have government agencies. So it's an opportunity for us to discuss and see whether what we're doing is actually bringing change that we anticipate. And then what more can we do? How is our collective responsibility bringing the synergy that we anticipate in this section? So thank you so much. I think we'll also have a session tomorrow to present what we have been doing at the ground. So thank you so much, Chair. Uh, let us appreciate uh, WDEV. So because of time, we will go straight to the first theme, that is the policy. So allow me to invite Eva to take up this uh, uh, from now on. So, Iva Karibu Sana. All right. Thank you, Lucy, um, our very able chair. Good morning once again. So, what brought us here? We had the theme around policy, practice, and partnership. But we can't do anything without um, harnessing ourselves under the law and to guide us through that process because there's many different laws that we and, and policies that support what it is that we are doing and within the Mombasa ecosystem then the county would be our first area that we would go to, into. So allow me to welcome our Ziri, uh, Dr. Neto, to then present on Mombasa County Government, the Solid Waste Management Act and to also tell us what it is that the county has actually been doing in regards uh, to this theme or around uh, solid waste management. And right after, we will then have uh, Nema. Is Calvin Rashid here? Okay, before he comes in, at least we have the Waziri. And I've had the benefit of working with Waziri now at least for the last one year and something, no actually two years and we must commend him for all the work that he's been able to do and especially building up in terms of partnership, um, supporting the different uh, initiatives that we are doing within Mombasa. Each one of us, I, I think we can attest from the working group but even as partners and people working within that sector I don't know how he splits his time. Um, we have managed to try and grab him at every moment and he's been able to come and support all the different initiatives. So as he presents, 
we also want to say a big thank you because we wouldn't manage to do all the work that we've done within the county hadn't it been from the support of um, the Waziri. So welcome and please enlighten us more. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Eva. You know, when Eva started saying, I want to thank him for the good uh, partnership we have had together. You know, I thought I'm in that forum where I'm being told uh, that you have done enough so you can... <laughs> Eva has just put me in that mode. Eh? Uh, so I think today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm a bit confused because uh, this morning I've been called by the Deputy Governor of Mombasa, Mr. Francis Thoyer, uh, with the effect that he was invited to come and uh, open this uh, dialogue. And uh, he said because he has some other very urgent engagements that uh, I come and do the honors of opening the dialogue on his behalf. And so he gave me one or two things to say to you. But then Eva has told me to move straight to agenda number one to make my presentation, eh? which I think is presentation number one, if I'm not wrong. So I want to announce that I'm ready for both functions. So if you allow me, I can start with the first one, which I've been delegated as they prepare for my presentation. Sasawa. Yeah, thank you very much. So I think the DJ was supposed to stand here, isn't it? So <laughs> I want to uh, recognize the leadership of uh, Hand in Hand Eastern Africa. I have seen the CEO, Albert, is around in the house. I want to recognize the presence of uh, WWF Kenya. They have been our key partners. I see the presence of Henry and others around. I want to recognize the presence of Comrade. I don't know. Comrade doesn't have things like Kenya or East Africa, uh, headed by the main director, uh, Dr. Innocent Wanyonyi. I want to recognize the presence of, um, uh, I think, Jumuiya uh, Yakaundi Sapuani. I know Mr. Emmanuel Nzai has been a good partner uh, with us, particularly on plastic dialogue. But uh, then uh, Gladys usually is very, very useful and instrumental. And I think later in the day, he's going to tell us what it is that uh, we have partnered with. I recognize the presence of other partners, WW, I mean, sorry, KWS, I think they're in the house, Bamburi Cement in the house, JIZ, these are our, our partners we entered into the covenant, I think sometimes this year. I've seen uh, the presence of Technical University of Mombasa in the house. Of course, Eva uh, Kimani, we have worked very, very well together under the Boost program. I see Susan uh, in the house and many others. I don't want to break that protocol, but all of you who are here, I know that I have noted that you are present and on behalf of the government of uh, Abul Swamad uh, Sharif Nasir and uh, the Deputy Governor Francis Toya, I want to say good morning. This is uh, the second plastic dialogue. It means then we had the first plastic dialogue uh, sometimes in the year. If I'm not wrong, it was in June uh, last year. And uh, in that uh, dialogue, uh, the forum committed to many, many items. If I'm not wrong, they were about 17. We are very, very ambitious. And if I can quote a few of them, I remember we say that we need to focus on awareness creation and education of the larger community because we had realized that attitude towards uh, waste management was one of the key challenges that we are experiencing. So we had a commitment, a call for action on that. 
we had a call for action on developing the capacity of uh, community-based organization and other waste managers to do their work accordingly. We had an action on research and development, and I'm happy to see researchers in the house. We had a call for action on segregation of waste at source. We had a call for action on the need to formalize the informalities and many, many others. So ladies and gentlemen, today and tomorrow, we are to take stock of what it is that we have done based on those uh, commitments that we have. So I think these two days are going to be very, very instrumental in uh, uh, showing us where we have reached, where are we of ambitious or who are we and ambitious in the commitments that we made uh, last year. I have been asked to point out three things by His Excellency the Deputy Governor, Francis Toya. Number one, he says that the county government is still committed to end the menace of plastic waste in the county. So count on that commitment. And he says that um, the governor himself has pronounced himself also on this aspect of waste management. And he has said that one of his topmost priority uh, in the county and in his government for the next five years will be the issue of waste management. So players in waste management, I think, feel uh, comfortable under this leadership because waste management is given priority. Number two, the deputy governor says that the current government of Mombasa enacted the Waste Management Act 2021. And that this act makes it clear that the first thing we need to do is to focus on segregation of waste at source. He indicates that he has uh, had some discussions with the most of you, if not a number of you, I remember I've seen some photos where he was in discussion with the, with the, with the Gerald, uh, and I don't know asthma or other than the rest. And I'm told that discussion centered around the need for our partners to help us to execute that uh, requirement of the act that we focus on segregation at source. And he thinks that this will be the game changer in waste management in Mombasa. Number three, he says that um, the current government of Mombasa cannot do this alone and requires the support of each and every partner who is willing to work with us. So he has asked me to ask you to upscale your support to the current government of Mombasa in awareness creation in setting up infrastructure for appropriate waste management, in supporting recycling activities, and more importantly, in enabling the county to improve its collection efficiency and its movement towards a circular economy. So ladies and gentlemen, with those uh, three very important remarks from his excellent deputy governor, on his behalf, I take this wondrous responsibility to declare the second plastic dialogue that is themed towards a circular economy officially open. Thank you very much. Sasa kwa sababu mmenipigia makofi, I'll move into making my first presentation. I'm told the cow has refused, eh?
as we wait for Waziri to come back, we have a technical issue with the presentation. I, I want to ask, please note down the areas or the policy areas that within your programs that you support. So from a national perspective, from a global perspective, and then bringing it down now to the county perspective. Just a quick, it's, it's a quick teaser. Just note it down, and then I'm going to ask you a question. So I'm giving you one minute to note down the policies that you think your program or your different initiatives are anchored upon. Some of us do know them offhand, but I'm just asking that you do write them down. In my main life, I, I'm also a facilitator, so I try to do it experiential. And one of the things that we say is that when you actually write, it helps to stick on. Okay, so based on, so I'm going to randomly ask, and because, please remind me your name. Catherine. Catherine. And you are from? Mr. Green Africa. Okay, please highlight to us which policies that you are under or that you, your project or initiatives are anchored upon. Thank you. Inonekana mna nionea sana leo. Really, thanks. Um, we're looking forward to supporting the segregation of waste. How do we do this? Uh, we are anchored on uh, transforming the waste pickers' uh, journeys through, that is through the CBOs, of course, the, the walk-ins into our, uh, our hubs, our trading points. So once they're segregated, it becomes easy for the, trans for the waste picker to bring what is on board for them and also to release what is not on board for them. So at the end of the day, it becomes easy for us and also for the waste picker when uh, the waste is segregated at source. Another thing that we're looking at, uh, of course, is the recycling of the plastics and also supporting the waste pickers, the recycling, any other thing that is coming on their end. We are having plastics. Uh, other than the plastics, we also have uh, the cartons, we also have uh, the chupas, the breakable ones. So I think I'm good to go there. I give space for the others. Okay, thanks. Um, now, one of the things as well we are saying here is that we need to build up on the partnership. So based on the different initiatives that are also running, I'm going to ask, um, allow me, the gentleman right here, um, please introduce yourself and then also tell us what organization you represent. And since we spoke about policy, but then now highlight a bit on, so what policies that you're looking to or are you're anchored around, and then what it is that brings you here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alexander Monguiro. I'm with the UNEP uh, Africa office. Um, regional coordinator for the chemicals waste and uh, air quality sub program so basically pollution issues uh, this is where we come in and we try to see our countries in the region can improve their infrastructures can improve their strategies so that at least in Africa we see that we have a lot of open burning open dumping and that comes with a lot of problems uh, on health impacts so we are here to try and see how we can learn from you guys so that we can also teach other countries what you are doing thank you all right thank you um so i'll go back to the exercise we just did we wrote down our policies which one do we think we haven't ad uh, has not been really addressed within the county so waziri spoke about the waste management act and then at the national level, there is one. I'm, I'm throwing out a quiz. Which is one of the policies? Albert, do you want to? One of the policies at the national government that we are anchored along within the plastic waste and the waste management.
saying there is the national waste management policy, and uh, of course uh, now the solid waste uh, management uh, act that we are was recently launched, like in Mombasa. Yes. Okay. yes. All right. Thank you. I, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Innocent. Um, he is a researcher and the uh, person who also helps us with a lot of the policy work. Um, what policy are we seeming not to mention? So we've mentioned the waste management, we've the, the National Environmental Act. What other acts are within our scope? Thanks, Thanks Eva. Um, we, we do have um, a lot of interests. So uh, p part of the policies that we would also want to influence in solid waste is uh, first of all the Mombasa climate change policy and strategy. Uh, that, that's one thing and then um, we have uh, partners from the private sector here who are in production. So the national government has come up with uh, new regulations on uh, extended producer responsibility it's something that we would want to set the pace in Mombasa. Let us be the first one to implement that policy in the county. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, now, I'll go into the next uh, area of our theme, which is in regards to partnerships. Now, we have different organizations that are represented here. And I do know, I mean, other than the ones that are highlighted under the banner, um, which other organization that have we not mentioned that within the room? I know we mentioned CAM. Um, yes. Please introduce yourself and the organization that you represent. Good morning, everyone. Apologies for my delay. My name is Gadoni Methu. And I work with Petco Kenya, so under CAM, um, but for industry. So I'll speak more about what we do. Or do you want me to say something? You look very expectant. So <laughs> I'm not too sure. Okay, I'm trying to draw you in into the conversation. Okay, all right. Anyone else in the room that we haven't? Yes, I do remember that. Please introduce yourself. Good morning. I'm Christine Mududa. I'm the head of legal services at the county assembly. And uh, I'm here wearing a hat of the county assembly, but more importantly, I am an environmental lawyer. So that made me call Dr. Nato and ask him, there's something about environmental that is going on, and that as an environmental lawyer working with the county, I'm interested in attending. Thank you. mentioned all the laws and policies around um, waste and uh, environmental aspects. Do you want to actually add in? That would be helpful. Because I came in late, I don't know what has been said, but I know from the program Dr. Nato was talking about the uh, Mombasa County Solid Waste Management uh, Act. But we also have many other acts that touch on, many other um, laws that touch on the environment. Uh, as, uh, is it Dr. Innocent, as I got his name? He spoke about climate change. And definitely plastics and climate change go hand in hand because they affect ecosystems. So um, then there's the generally, uh, we have an, a, an act that was enacted last year by the national government, though it has not been so active in, in, in its implementation. Even the Climate Change Act was enacted in 2016, and we still do not have the council. So we have the laws. We will talk about them later and policies, but now the issue is the implementation. I also see, Daktari, we have a, a draft policy at the county level, on solid waste management. Yes. All right, great. Uh, Waziri, we are ready? 
Okay. All right. So why was I bringing up all these different policies? So how do you cascade down or how do you make it implementable or executable within your different initiatives and programs? Um, I throw that challenge to you as I bring it back to Waziri. Thank you, Eva. Eva likes throwing challenges back to the, to the participants. Eh? Uh, if my presentation can be uploaded now. Thank you. So I think I was, uh, if you look at the program, I was asked to make a brief presentation on, uh, on uh, solid waste management in Mombasa. But um, yesterday when I was working on this presentation, usually I'm, uh, you know, that guy who works at the last minute, eh? <laughs> uh, I realized that I need to, to refresh the title a bit to look something like that. Uh, taking stock of solid waste management in Mombasa uh, towards a circular economy, which is the overall theme uh, of uh, this dialogue. And I think why I decided to frame it that way is because I had said earlier that uh, we made some commitments in our first dialogue, uh, about 17 or so calls for action. And so it's important that then we indicate where we are in terms of implementing what we had uh, committed ourselves to do uh, last year. So if we go to the second slide, please. The controller of business. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm not sure if uh, you can see very, very clearly. But um, in the presentation that I made uh, last year, this was the slide. And I indicated that this is the desired uh, waste flow uh, where we thought we should move as Mombasa. And if you look at it, um, it has about um, four key areas. Uh, the first key area was um, that we needed to focus on cell separation, environmental awareness, and education on matter solid waste management. And that came out of the realization that uh, we generate about 900 tons of solid waste, and uh, almost 50% of that actually leaks into the environment and creates environmental problems. And uh, the problem why it leaks is because the way the waste generators handle their waste gives the waste collectors and the county problems in terms of then collecting that waste and, and managing it. So we thought that awareness creation, training, uh, and sensitization is a key area that can unlock uh, proper waste management. Then uh, key area number two was collection and transportation capacity expansion uh, and the overall issue of uh, licensing of CBOs, what I say, the formalizing the, the informalities. And under that, if you see it, we identify two key players in waste collection and waste management overall. And one was uh, the county government uh, uh, of Mombasa that has a great responsibility in transportation of the waste. And also the community-based organizations who were not very well uh, formally organized, I would say, at that time. So I think one of the desired uh, journey we said we need to follow is to develop the capacity of the community-based organization and the private sector, uh, license them, uh, give them conducive environment to operate, and we thought that that way then they will improve uh, their, their capacity to collect and their capacity to manage waste. And then um, item number three was uh, around the infrastructure investment, uh, particularly in um, material recovery facilities, uh, uh, recycling potential, uh, aggregation of the waste that is retrieved from the waste stream, and generally the conversion of, of the waste to, 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 to energy and, and other products. And uh, what we thought we would focus on, one, was to develop uh, the material recovery uh, facilities in the county. I remember at that time we had commitments for six 
MRFs across the county. We said that um, we need to focus on working with the recycling companies to make sure that the materials that are retrieved from the waste stream are actually pre-processed and processed within the county. So I think one of the things was to bring on board as much as possible the, uh, the private companies that are involved in, in pre-processing, in processing, and generally uh, in, in recycling. And then uh, we say that uh, we had about uh, 65 or so organic waste that is generated in Mombasa, and uh, very little had been done in this area. And we said as one of the desired way forward was to develop the mechanism in which the 65% or so of organic waste can then become useful and uh, uh, one of the avenues we thought that we should focus on and encourage is uh, the generation of biogas uh, that then can be used for household cooking and the rest. And, and we thought that uh, quite a number of, if, if not all, of the organic waste should be able to be managed in that, in that direction. As you see, we did not envision uh, the movement towards the typical waste to energy where we convert our waste into electricity as it has been proposed elsewhere. And the reason why we didn't want to commit that way is because the investment in a typical waste to energy plant uh, that it converts waste into electricity is a very, very high investment. And I remember in the first dialogue I mentioned that one of the proposals we had on our table is that uh, we needed 16.7 billion uh, Kenya shillings to invest in that kind of plant. And that plant will be able then to convert about a thousand, uh, 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 a thousand tons of waste per day into electricity. But then you realize that um, we generate less. We have already uh, uh, entities doing recycling, which means that volume also goes far much, far much lower. And, and so it will be difficult for us to invest in the typical waste to energy into electricity because we may not be able to supply enough materials for that purpose. So that's why we thought that uh, we move in this direction, biogas for organic waste, and then the general recycling for the retrievables like plastics, uh, uh, paper, cardboards, uh, and the rest. And then um, one of the last points that we said we need to move in a better direction was the general disposal of, uh, of, of, of waste. Our operations are the disposal side. I think uh, this um, uh, there has been a problem uh, for Mombasa, and uh, not just for Mombasa, but for many, many other uh, counties, I will say, in Kenya. And uh, as we talk now, I don't think there is any county that has transited from open dams to sanitary landfills or engineering landfills. So we thought that we should move systematically from an open dump to a closed and controlled dump then to a sanitary landfill. We thought that that process allows us the leeway to increase our commitments to waste management in terms of resources uh, progressively instead of uh, boxing ourselves into committing maybe 2.7 billion shillings to do a, a, a sanitary landfill. And I think one of the key items we thought we should focus on uh, was one to purchase the dump side equipment uh, and then to uh, fence the, the, the dump side and then to encourage the partitioning of the dump side so that the dumping process is systematically done and covered along the process. I hope I will be able to uh, report where we have reached. Remind me if I don't uh, on that aspect as well. Uh, but I'm not sure if Nema is in the house because, uh, and uh, I saw a communication from the judiciary. I hope they are not in the house because at the moment they have been looking for me uh, because there is a standing order on, uh, on uh, Christina. I hope you are aware of this uh, on how we have managed our waste at Mwakirunge Dam I hope we are going to solve that. And then we have uh, the need to complete the plastic value chain within the county. I think what was happening at that time was that uh, people were retrieving the materials. Some companies were aggregating those materials. A few of them could then shred them, but the products, pre-processed products will be sent to Nairobi 
and other prices for the production of the final products. So we say that uh, then that sends away some money out of the county. So we say the best thing is to have a complete loop within the county that we have aggregators, but most importantly, that then we have also people who convert the retrieved materials, the shredded materials, into actual products that can be sold in the county. And that I think the policy and the act commits to establishing an infrastructure for marketing of those products in the county as well. And then finally, there was a, a component of, um, of uh, sending these materials to the cement uh, factories. I know Albert Msanda is in the house. Uh, uh, the picture that is there may not be, I think there is Bamburi cement. You, you, you realize your logo is there? It may not be clear, but also Mombasa cement, I think, is clear. So what we have always dreamed is that um, these materials could be sent to the cement uh, kilns and the waste can be burned and then we forget about uh, this problem. But then we were reminded that, um, that uh, there is a lot of engineering that ought to be done, that we don't just send waste to the factory and the waste gets burned. Uh, that I it has to be segregated in a way because different uh, items in our waste have different chemical and physical properties. And so every time you put the materials, you need to adjust some elements here and there. So they emphasize that for them to uptake those materials, our segregation must be superb so that we have elements of similar physical and chemical characteristics in one stream so that when they take to their factories, then it can be worked on based on particular settings. So I hope that we will reach there. If we do, uh, I think this will complete our desired uh, waste flow and waste management in Mombasa. So next slide. I hope this will be faster. So what has been achieved uh, so far? And um, I became a bit of a lecturer in this follow-up slide. Eh? So I didn't go in the order in which I have presented the, the, the flow because you will remind me that we have not done something. So I did it the other way around to, 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 to make sure that I touch on all of them. So next slide, please. Uh, number one, formalizing the informalities. I think uh, in the reports, I'm sure of WWF and the rest, you have reported that we have about 3,000 uh, so-called waste managers in the county. But as a county, we realize that uh, uh, we don't know them, they are not registered with us, and so they are not regulated. So I think one of the commitments we made is that we need to formalize them, make sure that they are registered, and then make sure that they are licensed according to the uh, Waste Management Act. So as it stands now, I want to report uh, that we have 37 organized groups that are involved in waste collection in Mombasa, and out of the 37, uh, 31 are actually licensed to do that work. So I think it is pretty good we, we have done well in terms of, uh, of licensing the, that one. So that means we know who they are, we know where they are operating from, and we know where they take the waste that they collect. Then number two is uh, private companies. We have uh, so far 33 that have registered with us. Uh, 32 of them are licensed one of them the license expired and they have not come to renew but but this is also good news because that means that within the organized groups and the companies at least we know him now and and we can they can play according to to our rules uh, this data is as of uh, i think march this year so i'm told that there are some people who have And the individual actors, 1,700, uh, quite a number, uh, that have, are in our record, in our inventory at the moment. Interestingly, only 109 are licensed to operate. So they came to us, they registered their details, but they didn't come back to get our operational license. So I want to, I have a feeling that maybe they lacked the the 3,000, you know, we ask small money there. 
<laughs> the 3,000 to pay for the annual license. And I know Hand in Hand has been very instrumental in helping these individuals to register uh, and the group. So I want to believe that um, if we update the list now, we may have an increase in the number uh, of those who are licensed. So in a nutshell, we are trying, I think, in formalizing the informalities, as you can see. At least we have them on our record, and so we are slowly encouraging them then to register with us so that we can give them the service uh, that we need to give them. Second slide. Next slide, sorry. Building synergies in waste management. Uh, I think uh, from the last dialogue we had, there has been quite a lot of activities uh, uh, between different organizations. And I want to indicate that they are more than what I have presented. I think the reason why I decided to focus on these three is because they have been the ones behind this second dialogue. So I didn't want to look uh, tangless. Uh, remember, even if I have not put uh, uh, your organization here, but the list is long. The list is long. So at tea break, I'll be able to get in touch in all of the organizations that have worked with us, but those who are not on this slide. Sasa. So number one is uh, coastal and marine resource development, uh, Comrade. I think uh, Comrade has been uh, very, very instrumental in hosting the secretariat of the Mombasa Smart City Forum. And this forum has been uh, what has put us all in the loop uh, of what is happening. So I think uh, uh, that has been very, very instrumental in organizing the synergies. Worldwide Fund for Nature Kenya. Henry, I hope I've gotten the the words right because eh? i used to think it is wildlife fund uh, for, for nature but it's worldwide fund for nature uh, i note that we have uh, three programs that we have uh, run with them and uh, why i'm putting this under the synergies because they don't do these programs on their own they work with the other partners that we have in Mombasa to execute most of these programs so we have the danida market development partnership the dmdp and I think uh, Henry will uh, discuss this, the Waste to Value project. Infrastructural support towards uh, recycling and MRF facilities. They have got any support from the Coca-Cola Foundation. And then uh, recently, I think NORAD has uh, given them some fund to help us with the APR uh, scheme and infrastructure. So I think this is the most recent project uh, from WWF. And then Hand in Hand Eastern Africa, uh, about four projects uh, running, a green enterprise uh, project. And that this is when we have done a lot of success in awareness creation. I think uh, they have been utilizing any opportunity under that program to make sure that people are aware of proper waste management and most importantly the community-based organizations do the work they are supposed to do in the, in the right way. Taka, I mean, Taka Afia project, uh, under this I think uh, a number of um, uh, what you call PPEs have been issued and first aid kits and I think lately we have been discussing on the need to vaccinate the waste managers uh, under that project. And then uh, we have a Taka Express project. Uh, this is a infrastructure support towards the, the, the waste collection and under this project uh, hand in hand is supposed to procure three wheeler automobiles. The reason why I have mentioned this, I'm not sure if they have been delivered yet but I thought by the mere fact that I mentioned here, you will be encouraged to accelerate the process <laughs> and make sure that the automobiles are delivered. And then finally, the recycling center support. Under that program, we have uh, developed a framework of cooperation between Hand in Hand, WWF, YWCA, and um, I think the uh, association in Likoni, uh, we have assigned framework of establishing the recycling centers in Likoni uh, and other places. So that synergy, I think, is important. Then, of course, we have uh, the, um, the hackathons that have been done by, 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 by Boost uh, uh, in trying to establish the, the, the prototypes and technologies that can help us uh, streamline waste management. Uh, that has been very, very instrumental. And of course, we have had other uh, players. Um, uh, I know Amadi also, I haven't put the slide uh, here, but uh, sustainable inclusive business have been very, very instrumental in working with us, particularly in Chuda. And uh, they have done um, a number of things, and I want to point them out. Number one, uh, the communities 
based organizations that are involved in waste collection in the Chuda have been very well capacitated to collect but also to develop sustainable businesses around waste management. Number two, they have given them the necessary capital injection. I remember we have given a number of checks to them uh, to support their operations. They have given them PPEs. Uh, I think on two, three occasions we have had uh, consignments of PPEs uh, that have been issued to them uh, to make sure that whatever they do, they do it in a sanitary uh, environment. And most recently, they have pioneered what we call the segregated bins. If, if you move around some essays in Twitter, you realize that we have bins that uh, have components uh, that allows in the estate people to put waste accordingly. So that, that has been very, very instrumental, I would say, in uh, streamlining uh, waste management in Chuda and making us move in the desired flow that I mentioned earlier. As I said, I was in a hurry. There are many players I will have listed. I will do this at tea time to make sure that uh, I capture all that, 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 that you have worked with us. Uh, next slide. Uh, capacity enhancement of waste managers. I think uh, I have said this uh, before. Next slide. Institutionalizing material recovery. I think this one also we, 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 we have done. I remember uh, the county itself pioneered with the first material recovery facility. Uh, the second one is up and running uh, in Likoni. And uh, what is left, I think, in the one from Vita is just uh, a few items, then we operationalize it. I thought that we will launch it today. Uh, but uh, I think we have had uh, procurement issues with the with the conveyor belt to be able then to activate that uh, material. My desire was that uh, when I retire, <laughs> when I retire, we should have operationalized it. So I don't know which one will come first, but uh, I think uh, this is now within the act I want to announce. And so government has a responsibility to establish material recovery facility in our own act. But also if you look at the National Sustainable Solid Waste Management uh, 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 Act that was, I think, also signed this year, it's also a requirement for counties to establish material recovery facility. So we have no choice but to develop this in infrastructure. And I want to ask uh, our partners uh, to join us in executing uh, that requirement. The next slide. Uh, partnership agreements that we have done so far, I think uh, we have signed to the covenant of mayors for sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, under this uh, covenant of mayors for sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we have, um, I think, two national supporters. I think there is um, AFD, if I'm not wrong, and GIZ. So for us, our signing to covenant of mayors is being supported by GIZ. And that's why you see Brian is in the house. And uh, they have been good enough to establish an office in Mombasa. And I can tell you that they are usually very selective in their location. So they made sure that their office is not in, in, in Likoni, it's not in Changamwe, it's not in Jomvu, but you can guess their office is in Nyali. So I think we'll have an opportunity to <laughs> interact with them in their affluent location. Uh, but we have met signatories, we are signatories to the Covenant of Mayors. In that, we are going to unlock a lot of support towards um, uh, what we call uh, sustainable energy and I think uh, climate action. Uh, it's under that. I think uh, Brian will talk about that later. Member of Plastic Smart Cities, and uh, this is uh, a project that's being pioneered by WWF. Uh, we signed that uh, also this year. And um, I also thought that before I retire, we will do a presser and announce to the world that we are part of the 1,000 cities that have finally entered the Plastic Smart City. So I'm hoping that this will happen uh, in very, very near future. Uh, Henry, if you execute that, I'll be happy. And then uh, the multi-stakeholder framework, of course, uh, that has made us execute uh, a framework of cooperation between the county government of Mombasa, WWF, Hand in Hand in South Africa, YWC, and the Association of uh, Waste Managers for Likoni. I hope that Nondo is in the house. Next slide. Way forward. 
This is what I think that we need to focus on and take stock in the third uh, plastic dialogue. Number one, that we create awareness on segregation at source, including enforcement to improve the quality of the recyclables. And remember, this has also been mentioned by the deputy governor in his opening remarks, that he thinks this is the area that will unlock uh, proper waste management. And uh, for those who have been uh, very keen on the, um, the political pronouncements in Mombasa, remember when uh, the governor was sworn in, he said that within 100 days, he's going to do A, B, C, D. You get the point? So this commitment is very real. And uh, work has started, and the deputy governor himself has been assigned that role of executing that declaration of 100 days. So a lot of things are going to happen. You are going to receive a lot of calls, either from myself or from the deputy governor, on aspects around the 100 days uh, commitment. Number two, promote investment in organic waste substream of the municipal waste. I think this is something that we have not done. And uh, considering that organic waste is the largest component of our waste stream, I think it's important that, that we invest in it. So any partners say uh, you, you hear who are willing to invest in this, I think we are ready. Uh, we have a big waste stream already from Kongoya market and other uh, markets that can supply volumes of up to 80 tons or 100 tons per day, uncontaminated organic waste. And so this is an area that uh, I think going forward we need to focus on. And then operas operationalizing the material recovery facility, I have mentioned, and then um, an act legislative framework to tap into the proposed uh, producer responsibility organizations. I think as uh, somebody mentioned earlier, this is uh, the way to go. Uh, in the act, the Sustainable Solid Waste Management Act, it establishes the, the PROs. And I think there are five of them at the moment, I'm not sure. Uh, Nani uh, Kadoni will, will mention this, I know. But uh, we have PROs for plastic waste, uh, for the other waste streams. But no county has developed the necessary legislative framework at the moment to tap into that infrastructure. So I'm impressing upon us as Mombasa to take the lead in uh, developing the necessary infrastructure. This may require uh, Christine uh, reviewing our act, and I think we have a one-year window to do that, to make sure that we anger APR scheme within it, and then we just tap into, into the, the, the framework. It, it carries a lot of good things. It will unlock some resources, I know, that then will help us to streamline uh, uh, waste management. So I think in a nutshell, this, I think, should be the focus going forward and when we meet next year around this time we should see how far we have gone next slide this slide is very very important because i think it's important to say thank you to all of you for listening to me and for being very very good partners thank you very much <laughs> Uh, Asante Waziri, and <clears throat> my takeout, my biggest takeout is that there are different opportunities that are there for us in terms of the execution. I will quickly highlight again, um, from an awareness creation, what are we, which organizations are here that are creating awareness? I will already say, um, as representing Boost, that's one of the things that we do um, in different capacities. And there's an aspect of the organizational development. How do we operationalize and organize these different waste collectors within the, um, uh, in Mwakirunge and different areas? So if your organization is within that area, already the county is asking for partners to, um, along that line. Infrastructure support, um, and then also creating business and the incubation, and that's what we do as well uh, from Boost. Um, so there are different opportunities and also hand in hand supports businesses that are, or startup businesses to, um, what do you call it, to propel the, the value chain within the plastic sector. And then there's a capacity enhancement. The county government, those at the waste um, collection area, 
there's many opportunities for each one of us from a policy perspective. What are we, how are we cascading down all these policies so that then they're implementable? So each of us has something to take out from that presentation, something that we can go and create programs around it. Um, our next presentation is from Calvin. I hope I'm saying that properly, who's from NEMA. Uh, Waziri, you did not want NEMA to be here, but they're actually here. They needed to be here. So they will <laughs> come for you over break. Um, and that will be Rashid, who will be presenting to us around the Sustainable Waste Management Act um, and highlight as well the extended producer responsibility that has been mentioned along the lines. Please help me welcome Calvin. that you do share your presentation with a gentleman at the back. Uh, please, Hussein, the name? Hillary. Please share the present, your presentation with Hillary so that then we save up on time. In the meanwhile, a hygienic perspective, we have a registration list that's going round. Please ensure that you do sign on both. There's one that's from San Africa, from the hotel, and then there's one from the organizing team. So if you do have that, ensure that it's going around and ensure that you do sign. We'll have a short panel discussion. So if you do have questions in regards to policy, I will take about three and we'll present them or ask um, Waziri and Calvin to um, respond to them. So please note down your questions and share them with me even as we have Calvin. Are we ready now? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, madam. And let me start by saying sorry for being late. And tell Waziri that when Waziri, 
we are looking for you. <laughs> we don't know why it is so hard to get you. <laughs> but we, we hope and pray, and all of us will agree that uh, Waziri has done very well as uh, in the docket where he is. And we hope, Waziri, and pray that the coming administration will find favor in you so that you retain the position, not just for the good work, but also that you have enough time to look for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Calvin. So I work with NEMA, Mombasa, and I'll make a short presentation on the legal framework. So you can move to the first slide. Uh, this, this body, known as the United Nations Environmental Programme, I'm sure most of us are conversant with it. It is the wing of the United Nations that coordinates all matters pertaining to the environment. Now that organization has identified five issues that it believes are of great importance as far as the environment is concerned. And one of them is the issue of waste disposal. And I want to emphasize from the beginning that the problem of waste is not just a Kenyan problem. Even the developed nations are struggling with waste. The Americans are in Arizona have a problem of waste. The Germans have a problem of waste. And so, are we, so we are in, in Mombasa. That's a picture of Mwakerunge. And what that basically implies is that all of us, we have a duty to play. We have a role to play. Right from the individual capacity to the family unit, to the community, to our counties, we all have a duty and a role to play to ensure that we achieve the objectives that are stipulated in the Sustainable Waste Management Act, as we'll see in the course of our presentation. Uh, next slide. Now, if you look at this data, this is uh, the data from the U UN Habitat 2019 report. And in Mombasa, of all the waste that we are producing as Mombasa County, about 9% are plastic. Now, of that 9%, only 42% or thereabout are recyclable, are being recycled. So it means we still have about 58% of our plastic waste in Mombasa that are either getting into the ocean or into the environment where they kill the animals, they litter the environment, and they also cause blockage of drains. In cases where burning is taking place, like in Mwakerunge, we all know that these plastics generate a lot of uh, greenhouse gases which all contribute to the global warming that we know. So this is basically what is happening in Mombasa and those of us who are in the recycling uh, sector with 58% of the waste not recyclable, not being recycled, it means there's a big opportunity for you to um, get into and to, to to do business, especially for those ones who are doing the cycling businesses. So let's move to the next slide. If we look at the hierarchy of waste management, then the most preferred method is the prevention. But as much as it's the most preferred method, it is practically impossible to prevent the generation of waste. Because as long as we are living, we are going to generate waste. So, as we'll see in the course of our um, presentation, we are now moving to what is known as the circular economy. We are moving away from the linear to circular economy. And the backbone of circular economy is the recycling, the recycling of the commodities that we have. So, even in the hierarchy of waste, then we realize that the recycling aspect is very important because the resources that we have are finite. They have a limit. So if we are going to be able to recycle, then that will go a long way in helping us not just to make good use of our resources, but also to manage the waste. Let's move on. Now, quickly to the policy framework. There's this Constitution of Kenya 2010. Most people have recalled and called it um, a green document because of the fact that it gives a lot of emphasis on environmental conservation. Article 42 of our constitution is something that all of us are familiar with, which says that everyone has a right to 
a clean and healthy environment. Now, this constitution has allowed it to make it possible, make, make it possible for our leaders to formulate policies that then outline how we are going to ensure that we have a clean and healthy environment. And one of, that, of those acts that was recently uh, signed into law by the outgoing president is what I'm going to talk about today, which is the Sustainable Waste Management Act. Now, this act was signed into law in July, and it actually provides the legal and the institutional framework for the management of waste. The operationalization of this uh, act is, is about six to two years. There are things that we will see in the next six months. There are things that we will see in the next uh, two years. For example, the formulation of the Waste Management Council, uh, we hope that now that we have uh, CS, hopefully after being vetted with par Parliament and being sworn in, we hope that the CS will then move with speed to formulate the council, because it's the work of that council that will oversee the implementation of this, of this act. Now, this act has various objectives. As I've said, it's actually formulated to provide the legal and institutional framework for the easy management of matters waste. So some of these objectives are stipulated there. It's improve health, reduce pollution, promote and ensure effective delivery of waste services, and also to instill responsible public behaviors. We'll see their behavior that this act allows and those which are not allowed, even from the public and even from the individual. So this act assigned duties. There are duties that have been assigned to public secretary. There are duties that have been assigned to institutions like NEMA. There are duties which have been assigned to individuals and their duties which have been assigned as well to various organizations like the county government so let's look at what has been tasked to NEMA for example let's move on so NEMA based on this act should develop standards and guidelines they should develop standards and guidelines on sustainable waste management that's one two the Act expects that NEMA will generate and disseminate waste management information to the public. Of course, all these duties have, must be done in collaboration with all stakeholders. Once the information has been generated to the public, then NEMA is also expected to enforce. So the aspect of setting the guidelines, enforcement of those legislations is um, according to that Act on NEMA. Then the county government, let's move to the next one. The county government, and I think uh, Aziri just talked about, about that recently, it is now in law that the county government will establish the waste recovery and recycling facility. So it is in law. And we hope that with the, the new dispensation coming in, some of these things we hope to start seeing them. For example, with regards to the enactment of the county sustainable waste management investigation, that one should come into action one year after, after this law has been uh, passed into, into law. So since this law was enacted in July, we hope probably that by next year in July, the county government of Mombasa, and by extension all counties, will be having a sustainable waste management legislation. Other duties of the counties, as we can see, is also to ensure there are insensitive incentives uh, for the collection and separation of waste at source in neighborhoods and informal sectors. The counties should ensure that the city's plan for waste management is in part. For example, Mombasa is growing. The population is increasing, and so are other cities in Kenya and uh, globally. So as a county government, you have a duty to ensure that the waste management plan that you have in, in place is in agreement with the expansion of city in terms of, of the population. And then the county government will also maintain data on waste management service provision by waste management, uh, waste management service providers. And as we've seen, what was really talked about, Mombasa already has a list of licensed waste 
management providers. And so that data has to be made available as we move forward. And then, next slide. The Act again assigned duties to individuals. So we've seen the duties to NEMA, we've seen the duties to the county government. Now, as an individual, and I, I, I said at the beginning, this is a collective responsibility. All of us have a role to play. Right now, as an individual, it will be illegal for you not to segregate the waste that you are generating from your home. And this is in law. And it is punishable by law. If you are producing waste and you fail to segregate it as either organic or inorganic, then you can be fined a non-compliance fee of 20,000 shillings for just failing to segregate the, the waste. And why is this important? It is important so that we have a better way of managing our waste. Now, in addition to the roles that the Act has signed to various individuals or organizations, the Act has also created what we call, just move to the next slide, the Act has created what we call the Extended Producer Responsibility. Currently, all producers, as, as things are, their responsibility ends at the consumer stage. For example, if you have um, a factory, let's use Superlow, for example, they produce their bread, they have the packaging. The moment the bread gets to the consumer, the relationship between the, the manufacturer and the goods ends there. They are no longer concerned about what happens to the waste that, was, that is being generated from that good. Now, with the current extended producer responsibility, then some responsibility is being put on the producers, the manufacturers, to be concerned about the end product of whatever product they're generating. If it is, for example, a bottle of water, then the, the responsibility does not end at the consumption stage. It goes beyond the consumption stage. So that we need to know what are they doing with the waste that is coming from their project. And with the extended producer responsibility, then the tech back scheme can, comes into action. Where these organizations, these manufacturers, are now compelled to have a tech back policy. Where whatever goods, uh, waste they are generating from their products, are taken back to them either for processing or, uh, or recycling. Let's, let's just move to the next one. And basically this is the whole concept of uh, the, the extended producer responsibility. Once the goods has been manufactured and it has gone through the project of distribution, retail and consumption, then they have a system of what we call the, 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 the callback, the collection the callback scheme, where the, the, the waste are collected and they are taken back to the factory, either for processing and finally for reusing. Now, this actually is the whole essence of what we call the circular economy. Because we have a, a process where the flow of the, the goods is circular, from the raw material and it ends in the recycling. So basically, we do not have anything going into waste. So other than having the normal processes of waste management, then the extended producer responsibility that's been created by the, the Act will go a long way in helping us to manage the waste in our counties and in our homes as well. And I think that is it. That is what I have for you today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Calvin. Um, in managing time, any burning question for Waziri and Calvin? But to leave to my name, I will ask Go on. It, has, it doesn't have to be burning. It can be watered down. Okay. <laughs> All right. There's a question right here. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much for those uh, very insightful uh, presentations. Uh, mine is just uh, one to Waziri. What is the process of registration uh, of the informals to formalize them? Uh, is there any monetary value? Uh, why, is, why are people resisting to be registered? What, what, I mean, is there any incentive? Uh, how, do, how are you doing it? Thank you. Can I request for a second microphone? Okay. Um, another question, I'll take two. I think I'd seen. Okay, it's. Okay, comment? All right. Question? Uh, thank you very much. Um, another question is in line with the National Sustainable Waste Management Policy. Uh, how can we improve waste management interventions in unplanned and illegal settlements, uh, given that um, the more effort goes into collecting the waste, the more the illegal settlements spread out and therefore the more the threat to sustainable development? Do I have permission? You have permission. Okay, thank <laughs> Just you. Just one. And meanwhile, Albert, your question did not arrive, so you should repeat it. And my question is for Calvin's. Um, he had a very articulate explanation of the individual responsibilities from the new Solid Waste Management Act. And uh, what I wanted is, what exactly can we do on the ground to to implement? For example, the waste segregation at household level, because uh, that is where the di disconnect s starts and then it accumulates into the ecosystem. Thank you. All right. One more from the gentleman here, and then I will have to cap it. Yes. Oh, thank you. So I have a question for each of the presenter. I'll begin with the Daktari because he represents the county government. And uh, it's a great opportunity for us to have him here and we are very, very grateful for your time. I want to ask on behalf of uh, the informal actors. Uh, I've heard several times that uh, there is, um, allow me to say, <coughs> There is that feeling of harassment from the, the county as carries. Um, uh, much as we have uh, uh, talked about compliance, and this question also should be shared with the, the NEMA representative, Mr. Calvins. Uh, would it not be easier for you guys, because now you are in charge, that you help us with uh, assisting our members to, com to get compliance? There were times when uh, a county government uh, uh, inspectorate uh, team would arrest somebody and take them. I've seen that in Nairobi. I don't know whether it's still happening. Then the, the, the culprit to be taken to, the, to wherever the incarceration is done. But uh, they are told, get your license and go home. Right? So I think it, it would be a better approach so that from our side, I represent the Association of Waste Recyclers, so that from our side, we don't run away from you people, but we embrace you. We get to know each other, so that the times you visit our premise, whether they are informal or not, we have a conversation with your people, so that you are able to say, you know, Mr. Kaineka, I've visited your premise for four times, and you have not been able to pay for your license. If I come the next time, now I'll take you to court. See, so um, my, that is my concern for this meeting because I know compliance is a serious issue, and uh, the other concern is about the, the our informal uh, actors who are like I, I would say like 
over 60 over 80 percent of the actors in the waste management space are in for, informal i think we need to adopt a strategy that uh, will enable them to get compliant and one of the areas that probably will uh, hamper this compliance and this is for the eia uh, side the environment impact assessment from nema is the fact that there is no lad like uh, i mean very few of the people who are doing waste management are having plot numbers in their premise how can we practically approach this issue knowing that nema will not give an eia to a project that is not based on a, a va that does not have a lease or a title deed uh, we know that there is an spl a uh, sub summary project report but we have tried to pursue that especially in nairobi but we haven't seen it working is it probably working here in mombasa and if it is not working is it possible for you to allow it to work here so that we can give space to the informal people thank you all right i will ask nema to respond to the queries and then i'll ask uh, then waziri please take the Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ari talked about what we need to do uh, so that people can do better segregation of waste. That's, that's easy. All we need to do is create more awareness. We need to have more awareness created so that people know, they understand, and then they do. So I think that is very clear. We need to create more awareness. And that has to come from all of us. Talk to your neighbor, those in position, talk to them. Have more of these meetings where we include so many people so that they get to know and understand. Uh, so I think that is that. My answer will be create more awareness so that people get to understand. Then on the issue of EIA, um, what I will say is that uh, there, there is no recycling facility that is existing on, on air. And what we ask with regards to land ownership, it doesn't have to be a title deed. Even a lease agreement is acceptable. So if you have a facility, then just show that you are owning it either through buying it or leasing it. So that we also know the exact place we are, we are, we are licensing. And with regards to Mombasa, we are now allowing for people to do the SPR for the waste management projects. All the scrap, uh, we had a time when the, the president uh, banned the scrap and then later on they were allowed to operate. All of them, we gave them the SPR. It's a very just a summary project report. Within five days, five days you have your approval. So with regards to the EIA, there must be a proof of land ownership. It doesn't have to be a title deed, even a lease agreement is acceptable. Yeah, thank you, Emma. I think I have um, three questions, if I'm not wrong. One was, but all of them centered around uh, the our partners uh, who are in, in the practice of collection and, and, and management of waste. And um, the, the, the first question was on um, why are they not coming to, to register? I think that was the question. Uh, I will explain it in probably two or three ways. One is that... Um, when we started uh, formalizing it, we said by registration it has no financial implication. So you just come, you register, and then we give you uh, a card to show that you are a collector, for example. But then we moved to a higher scale by then uh, when we established an annual license. And uh, the license, if you are an individual waste collector, you pay uh, 3,000 shillings. I think it's in, in, in our bill. If you are a CBO, you pay, I think, 10,000 shillings. So that fee has been one of uh, the, uh, collectors, particularly in Likoni, they have cited that fee as a problem for them uh, coming to us. 
And uh, one of the reasons why they are not comfortable in paying the, the fee, they have been saying, one, it's high, uh, based on how much they collect themselves. Uh, number two is that they don't see what we are doing for them. <laughs> and so they don't see the need for to, 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 to get the license from us. Uh, and others don't seem to be aware that they actually need to get a license. Uh, to operate. So we are grappling with all that. Uh, we are trying to make sure that we are visible on the ground so that they don't give a reason of uh, not seeing why they should pay. Uh, then uh, we are working with some partners to support them in, in paying these licenses and we are embracing upon them that um, uh, the, 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 the best way in which we can work with them in which we can allow support go to them through us is by them being formally registered with us and having a license. And, and I think, I'm hoping that uh, we are going to have some good positive uh, results on that. And then the issue of um, harassment uh, by the inspectorate, I know this has been there. Uh, uh, Kainika, I think uh, there are people in this uh, dialogue that have been harassed, and I know <laughs> uh, by the by 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 the county enforcement uh, team, and I keep on telling them that the inspectorate or the enforcement team, when it comes to your facility, they want to see a license. You know, them is enforcement. So if they don't see a license, they will do what they are required to do. Uh, on occasions where I have had those encounters, I have asked the people who have been visited to come to our office because most of them don't seem to be aware of the license in the first place. So I will tell the enforcement team to allow them uh, uh, a month, come to the office, they are explained what licenses they are supposed to, to have and for what purpose. And I, and I think we have had a lot of progress uh, on that line. So in, in most cases, the operators don't know the license they need to have, and so they don't have. Enforcement team wants to enforce what is enforceable, and, and, and so you can't blame either of them. And so we strike a dialogue and make sure that we reach an agreement. In some places, we have had to allow the operators to scatter the, the payment. Like uh, the individuals, if they can't pay 3,000, we'll allow them to pay maybe 500 shillings per month until they complete. And then we, kept, we give them operating a license for, for, for that period. I know that um, uh, uh, particularly the individual ones, uh, uh, when they take the waste to the transfer point, uh, even if they have a license, they have to pay because in the bill there is also a tipping fee at the transfer point, which is, I think is 100 uh, shillings per delivery. And uh, that has also been a complaint uh, we have received, and I think uh, uh, his Excellency the Governor, in his recent uh, statement, mentioned that he's removing uh, the, the, the tipping fee, both at the transfer point and, and at, the, at the dump site. So, so I want to believe that...
naitwa mwanajuma mfaki kutoka kikundi cha zaonana shikadabu na sisi kwetu taka ni mali kwa majina kamili naitwa Id Mohamed Id ama maarufu naitwa Fuad na mimi ndiye chairman wa Likon West Recyclers Cooperative Society Limited ambayo ni cooperative society ambayo imejumuisha vikundi kutoka Likoni sub county na cooperative society yenyewe tulianzisha 2021 mwezi wa kumi na kufikia mwezi wa pili 2022 tukafu registers tukapata certificates kwa member lazima kwanza uwe umetoka kwa registers group kwa ground alafu pili uwe umepitia mafunzo ya hand in hand na katika group wenyewe lazima katika shughuli zake katika silsili ya kuhusiana na mambo atakataka ama waste management miongoni mwa shughuli za kadi group ambazo zinafanya on the ground hand in hand mara ya kwanza kupata nao ilikuwa tuna tuko na clean up activities kwa community ndio tukapata kujuana na hand in hand kaja kujintroduce na wao na wakatuelezea kwa kuna mafunzo fulani wanafundisha wanachama ndani ya miezi tisa tuka register na hand in hand kwa wanachama kama washirika wa hand in hand tukapitia kwa hiyo mafunzo ndio baada ya hiyo mafunzo tukaja na idea kama vikundi vyote vya likoni ambavyo vimepitia kwa mafunzo ya hand in hand kuja na association na kwa kuwa sote tunahusika na mambo ya west ama ya takataka na vile tulipata mafunzo ya kuboresha takataka ama ku add value kwenye takataka kona ni uzuri kama utakuwa na association ama cooperative ambayo itahusika na mambo ya takataka ndio tukaja na hiyo idea tukashikamana tukaunda hiyo cooperative society kwa mambo ambayo tumefaidika katika haya mambo ya hand in hand tumefaidika mambo ya ku... kwanza kujempower sisi kina mama na kina vijana kwa ujumla tumefundishwa jinsi ya kujitegemea kibiashara mafunzo tofauti tofauti tumepata kama kutengeza vifaa fulani kama ni yogurt kama ni nini tumefundishwa ili tupate biashara ndogo ndogo kama vijana wetu ambao wanaka bure bure mitaani at least wao na kitu cha kujisaidia na kina sisi kina mama pia kuna single parents kuna widowers pia wanajisaidia kwa sababu ya mambo kama haya ambayo kwa tumefundishwa na hand in hand kitu changine ni kuhusu hizi takataka takataka sisi tulikuwa tukiona ni uchafu tunachukua vitu tunachoma hatukujua kama tunachokichoma ni mali ambayo inaweza kusaidia jamii. Vitu kama plastic si kwa tukichoma, makaratasi twachoma. Lakini kwa sasa tangu tupate mafunzo, tulikuwa hatuchomi tena. Tunakuwa sasa tunachagua taka tunazihifadhi, kuna zile tunazotengenezea nazo vitu, kuna kama hizo plastic ambazo tunazipeleka kwa mitambo zinasagwa zinatengenezwa na plastic nyingine. Yaani sasa tumeona hizi taka si uchafu, tumeona ni kitu ambacho kina tufaidi sisi wenyewe. Na baada kwa tumepata huo mafunzo ya kuongeza thamani kwenye takataka. Tukaona kweli kuna haja ya kuwa tupate mahali ambayo itakusaidia ku, kusaidia kuweka hiyo thamani kwenye takataka. Na pale kwa shauriana kama tunaweza kupata recycling plants. Kwa shauri kuna takataka nyingine ambayo tunaweza ku add value bila kupitia kwa recycling plant kama vile mbolea. Tunaweza kuchukua matakataka ambayo ni organic waste tukaiweka tukapata mbolea. Lakini kuna matakataka mengine kama vile plastiki makaton ambapo paka lazima tupate mashine fulani ambayo itatusaidia ku add value katika hizo takataka hizo ndio katika ile mashauriyo tukapata kwamba tunaweza kupata msaada wa kuleta hizo mashine ambayo ni shredding na bailing machine changamoto kubwa ikawa ni kimimali ya ardhi kama vile tunasema vikundi zetu ni bado ni vidogo havina uwezo wa kupata ardhi na ardhi ni swala sugu katika upande wa likoni kwa hiyo tukakaa chini na Mombasa county tukawaomba kama anaweza kutusaidia na ardhi kuandikia mabarua na kutujibu akatukubali kwamba tutawatupatia umiliki wa area ambayo ni Shona Dumping Side ambayo ndio ile area ambayo tuko sahi ambayo iko chini ya umiliki wa Mombasa County. Wakatupatia makatasi kwamba wameturuhusu kufanya shughuli zetu za recycling hapa. Na kama vile mnavyoona area yetu vile iko ni kwamba kuko na quarry activities kwa zinaendelea hapa. Watu walikuwa na katakata mai, kwa ni matimbo na kwa ni ardhi ambayo iko tambarare. 
Kwa hiyo kama kuna mjengo unaweza kuendelea. Ikabidi tuje na fikra kama vikundi kupitia kwa nguvu zetu wenyewe tuweze kuweka tambarare hiyo sehemu iko ndio mjengo uweze kuendelea. Ndio hiyo shule ambayo inaendelea sasa hii na shule yenyewe imechukua takriban miezi miwili. E, kwa sasa hii ile land ambayo tumekuwa located na Mombasa County ni 50 by 200 feet recycling plant ambayo tunataka kwa ujumla iwe na shughulikia na mambo atakataka yote. Na kama kutakuwa na uwezekano basi kuwa hakuna takataka ambayo itakuwa inatupwa yote itakuwa tumeitafutia njia ya kuiongezea mm -hmm. thamani yake ama kuitengezea bidhaa nyingine ambayo itakuwa inafaa kwa jamii. Mfano kama plastic. Sasa hivi tunataka kuanza plastic zile plastic ngumu. Hello. Tuo tunazikata. Hello. You have exactly one minute to gobble down the tea and the mandazi so that then we can come back. We have an interesting session after this. So I like the conversation but speed up the Meal eating. And then kindly requesting that you ensure that you register the registration list the registration li list is somewhere. I just need to figure out. kama cooperative society tungeomba pia kama utapata msaada kutoka kwa shirika yetu ambao watatusaidia tufanye marketing ya cooperative yetu kwa hiyo mitandao ya kijamii na tupate pia mafunzo ya vipi tutatumia kuboresha biashara yetu Ningependa kuwashukuru Ali na Nani kwa ujio wao katika area yetu Alikoni kwa shauri wameweza kutupanua mawazo yetu kuhusu mambo atakataka na pia wametupatia ufahamu mwingi kuhusiana na utendaji biashara ufanyaji biashara pia katika ule ufadhili wametusaidia nao kwa sasa hivi watu wezi kusema ni wafadhili tunaita ni washirika kwa sababu si wakati tunafadhiliwa sana sana wa kutamini kile kitu wa si rahisi wa value kile kitu kwa shauri unasema ni chafu land walituletea lakini wakati tunashirikiana na wao yeye anafanya hivi na yeye anafanya hili lakini msaada ule ametupa ni msaada mkubwa ambao sisi wenyewe pekee yetu singeweza kuanzia kufomu hiyo cooperative paka kuja na hizo recycling eh, plant pia hiyo ni msaada mkubwa sana tunataka kuwashukuru hand in hand na nataka kujenga udugu hand in hand wapo watakuwa Mombasa ama itakuwa pengine shughuli zao za Mombasa zinaisha na kule ambako watakuwa wameenda bado tutakuwa tunashirikiana nao vile vile Naitwa Mwanajuma Mfaki kutoka kikundi cha Zaonana Shikadabu na sisi kwetu Taka ni mali. kwa majina kamili naitwa Id Mohamed Id ama maarufu naitwa Fuad na mimi ndiye chairman wa Likon West Recyclers Cooperative Society Limited ambayo ni cooperative society ambayo imejumuisha vikundi kutoka Likoni sub county na cooperative society yenyewe tulianzisha 2021 mwezi wa kumi na kufikia mwezi wa pili 2022 tukafu registers tukapata certificates kwa member lazima kwanza uwe umetoka kwa registers group kwa ground alafu pili uwe umepitia mafunzo ya hand in hand na katika group wenyewe lazima katika shughuli zake katika silsili ya kuhusiana na mambo atakataka ama waste management miongoni mwa shughuli za katika group ambazo zinafanya on the ground hand in hand mara ya kwanza kupata nao ilikuwa tuna tuko na clean up activities kwa community ndio tukapata kujuana na hand in hand kaja kujintroduce na wao 
na wakatuelezea kwa kuna mafunzo fulani wanafundisha wanachama ndani ya miezi tisa tuko register na Andinand kwa wanachama kama washirika wa Andinand tukapitia kwa hiyo mafunzo ndio baada ya hiyo mafunzo tukaja na idea kama vikundi vyote vya likoni ambavyo vimepitia kwa mafunzo ya Andinand kuja na association na kwa kuwa sote tunahusika na mambo ya west ama ya takataka na vile tulipata mafunzo ya kuboresha takataka ama ku add value kwenye takataka kona ni uzuri kama utakuwa na association ama cooperative ambayo itahusika na mambo ya takataka ndio tukaja na hiyo idea tukashikamana tukaunda hiyo cooperative society kwa mambo ambayo tumefaidika katika haya mambo ya hand in hand tumefaidika mambo ya ku... kwanza ku empower sisi kina mama na kina vijana kwa ujumla tumefundishwa jinsi ya kujitegemea kibiashara mafunzo tofauti tofauti tumepata kama kutengeza vifaa fulani kama ni yogurt kama ni nini tumefundishwa ili tupate biashara ndogo ndogo kama vijana wetu ambao wanakamu bure bure mitaani at least wao na kitu cha kujisaidia na kina sisi kina mama pia kuna single parents kuna widowers pia wanajisaidia kwa sababu ya mambo kama haya ambayo kwa tumefundishwa na hand in hand kitu changine ni kuhusu hizi takataka takataka sisi tulikuwa tukiona ni uchafu tunachukua vitu tunachoma hatukujua kama tunachokichoma ni mali ambayo inaweza kusaidia jamii. Vitu kama plastic si kwa tukichoma, makaratasi twachoma. Lakini kwa sasa tangu tupate mafunzo, tulikuwa hatuchomi tena. Tunakuwa sasa tunachagua taka tunazihifadhi, kuna zile tunazotengenezea nazo vitu, kuna kama hizo plastic ambazo tunazipeleka kwa mitambo zinasagwa zinatengenezwa na plastic nyingine. Yaani sasa tumeona hizi taka si uchafu, tumeona ni kitu ambacho kina tufaidi sisi wenyewe. Na baada kwa tumepata huo mafunzo ya kuongeza thamani kwenye takataka. Tukiona kweli kuna haja ya kuwa tupate mahali ambayo itakusaidia ku, kusaidia kuweka hiyo thamani kwenye takataka. Na pale kwa shauriana kama tunaweza kupata recycling plants. Kwa shauri kuna takataka nyingine ambayo tunaweza ku add value bila kupitia kwa recycling plant kama vile mbolea. Tunaweza kuchukua matakataka ambayo ni organic kwa sababu kwa kupata mbolea. Ladies and gentlemen we are doing badly on time kindly let's go back makaton ambapo paka lazima tupate mashine fulani ambayo itasaidia kuadvance We need to continue katika hizo ndio katika ile mashauri ya tukapala kwamba tunaweza kupata msaada Can let's go back to our seats and continue Changamoto kubwa ikawa ni mali ya ardhi kama vile tunasema kundi zetu ni bado ni vidogo havina uwezo kupata ardhi na ardhi ni swala sugu katika upande wa likoni kwa hiyo tukakaa chini na Mombasa county tukawaomba kama anaweza kusaidia na ardhi kuandikia mabarua na kutujibu wakatukubali kwa mba tutawa tupatia umiliki wa so area ambo ni shona dambi saidi ambo ndo hiyo area ambo tuko saidi ambo hiko chini ya umiliki wa Mubasa County kwa tupatia makatasi kwa mba wameturusu kufanya shuli zetu za recycling hapa na kama vile mnaviona area yetu vile start now those who are still taking tea kindly come and take it here we're actually running out of time we already, already eight minutes past 
Uh, the first presentation is coming up shortly. So av having been introduced to the policies, now we are going into partnership. We have a number of partners who will be presenting, especially on the areas that they are partnering in on the plastic uh, area and waste management. So the first one to come up will be the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. We have about five presentations. Thereafter, we'll be having a panel discussion where you can share your question. But in the meantime, you can write down your question, pass it to me, and then I'll pass it to the panel once the presentations are done. So first presenter is Susan Kitau from uh, Kenya Association of Manufacturers. All right, thank you. Let's welcome Susan to take us through our presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Susan Yetau, Regional Coordinator, Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Uh, I'm here on behalf of KM. I'm not really an expert on matters plastic waste management. I have a colleague of mine called Sharon who deals with this directly. You know, the regional coordinator, you are like the governor. And then you have Dr. Nato, specializing in environment issues. And then you have Lucy, head of department. So I'm telling you so that you don't ask me those detailed questions. I'm just giving a disclaimer. <laughs> I'm just giving a disclaimer. Okay. Yeah, but I, I've walked this journey. I've come to love sometimes I've been, Dr. I've not called you, so just know that if you come back this second time, I won't be calling you. I can see whatever we've been asking since last year now is happening. I'm, I'm a happy person. Maybe later on is when I'll ask, I think all of us are concerned about the way you're supposed to segregate waste from our homes. Yes, indeed, we segregate. Then there's this lorry that comes and it piles everything together. Then you wonder what for. Maybe that's a discussion for lunch break. Okay. Here we are. So... Uh oh. Yeah, so this is who we are. Cam has been there for long. I think some of us, even before independence, we are that old. So I may not need to go into the nitty gritty, but we are an association of manufacturers with over 1,400 industries. But I want, I always put, uh, I want you to take note. It's not all manufacturers in Kenya who are members of KM. One. It's, they are not, it's not law, it's not mandatory, that if you are in the industry, you have to be a member of KM. So, but the ones who are a member, we are over 1,400 industries because you're growing, and then we are put in different. My friend, you are playing the ping pick up bong, bong with me. <laughs> eh? What's happening? <laughs> okay, fine. Uh-oh. Back, okay. So we have around uh, 14 sectors. Textile and apparel, plastics, uh, leather, and leather footworks. Oh. Okay. So, okay, fine. So, this is, then we have something that we call Ukamilifu. This is where now we really talk about environmental, social, and governance. Okay, so 
Sometimes there's something loose somewhere. Maybe he still wants to do the same thing he did to Daktari. So. I've been given another role. In case you've not filled the registration form, there are two of them. Okay, so. Give me another role. Can I start collecting their IDs? <laughs> Jemima, lunch vouchers, are they ready? So that we finish everything together. <laughs> Okay, fine. So we have uh, 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 something that we call Ukamilifu, which uh, integrates environmental, social, and governance factors in the association because this becomes the leading voice of the manufacturer and value add industry in Kenya. Uh, that is who basically are. So we, as the association, acknowledge that the role of manufacturing sector is very key in promoting a circular economy because we've come, we are no longer talking about linear economy. My brother from Nema was here. And uh, we have really embraced the extended producer responsibility because I know when the issue of plastic menace came, everyone was looking at manufacturers. And then the whole government was looking at KM. Then they came to realize not all manufacturers are members of KM. So we've been working with the ones who are our members, but at the same time we have those ones who are not even CAM members, but they have joined CAM under KEPRO, where now we're doing the extended producer responsibility. So I'm just going in summary because I've been told there are three of us in that slot to take five minutes. And I think I've already taken three. Gathonia, I can see you're still eating. So it's not in my head, please. So Here we are. So I've mentioned about uh, uh, the promotion. We, we, are, we participate in promoting a circular economy. The majority of manufacturers are farming that the commitment. We are really committed, come members. We are really committed to mitigate the environmental impacts because we know the effects that it has had in our society and be a part and parcel of the society that gets affected by this. So the most crucial aspect in circular economy for us is adoption is the need for more rationale and sustainable management of natural resources which are increasingly under pressure due to the ever-growing. NEMA has told us what those plastics do to the marine life. So let's go to the next slide. So on that part, we say that the, whatever we are doing requires a two-pronged approach. The upstream that is ma managing resource more efficiently, increasing productivity in production and consumption, uh, reducing waste while ensuring the value of products sustained, but that is upstream, but downstream, we make it necessary that items of residual utility are not disposed of into landfill, but recovered and introduced back into the economic system. 
uh, we are aware that plastic have become a big wash part of our daily life owing to their versatility. However, since litter plastic has become pervasive in the environment, great concerns and discussion about multiple negative impacts of improper plastic waste management have risen globally. So we are doing now a shifting towards a circular economy. It's ongoing. We know we have come from very far. So we can't just change immediately. Some have yet not yet embraced, some have accepted, and they're working. And I want to mention it that our former national chairman was very key. In fact, he was the chairperson for KEPRO, uh, Mushai Kunyiha. He was very key in implementing. Actually, that is one of the key roles he played as our national chairman to make sure that we go through this whole process. So the private sector in Kenya, through come, we have embraced the initiative to come up with a sustainable solution to cut plastic waste and to tackle waste management. And I also want to mention that we've worked with Dr. Nato when they were coming up with the, the Solid Waste Management Act, my, team, my colleagues from Nairobi were really, every time they'd come to Mombasa and work, because we have also, we don't do it just regional. From national level, even in areas where we have different, different uh, CAM offices, we've made sure that we've worked them. So from 2019, when the plastic action was developed, it was, I mean, a private sector driven initiative which has really now involved in policy making. I love what we do in Kenya. The policy makers, we have reached to a point where they don't come up with a policy without involving the private sector. We work together so that when the policy comes, it is part and parcel of the private sector and the government. Initially, we used to have policies that would come, you don't even know, you're being told this is the one follow it, but now we've worked together. So it makes it much easier. Because again, we're in the, the people who are working with, our, I mean, the people in the industry. Next slide, please. So, so, we can, so we can say that's why we have an enhanced collaborative framework. We don't work alone. We also work with KEPSA. We work uh, with other organizations. We've also now gone Ukochini, Mashinani. There are so many young, uh, young people who are working, and uh, like the ones who are doing the words collection, we are working with them, creating awareness, assisting them on how to be able to do it better. That's why we have that uh, Ukamilifu uh, initiative. So uh, additionally, we continue to partner with like-minded stakeholders and our members to support initiatives that promote sustainable practice in Kenya manufacturing sector. So some of the initiatives that CAM has taken up to promote sustainability include the framework of cooperation that is between the government of Kenya through the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, the National Environment, that's NEMA, and the private sector through CAM to reduce plastic waste in the environment through collection and recycling. We also have a partnership with Petco. Radon is here. She'll talk more. This is the first voluntary producer responsible organization in Kenya to reduce pet waste in the environment. We also were leading and participating in environmental policy formulation with the government. That is both at national and county level. That's why I mentioned how we've worked with Dr. Nato in the Solid Waste Management Act. We also, we also launched the Kenya Extended Producer Responsibility Organization in 2021. That's what we call KEPRO. And I want to mention here, so far, KEPRO has over 350 members who now are doing the, uh, the extended produce, producer responsibility, and they're also practicing the take back system. So we are still working with them. We also go about creating awareness to drive the sustainable waste management solution agenda. The agenda not only looks at addressing behavior change, but the economic inequality which lies at the heart of our waste problem. We know there's, there are young people who say, Taka ni Mali. So we are working with quite a number of young people uh, in Nairobi and also in the region, like Nakuru, Eldoret, and Kisumu. So there is much I don't want to talk much about that. Let's move to the next slide. We'll, this presentation will be shared so you can read in detail. So that's it for me. Thank you. Gadoni, over to you. I'm saving Brian work, so please wear your shoes, come here. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Gadoni, as has been mentioned. I am the Project Officer and Partnerships um, Coordinator at Petco Kenya. And I think today as we're talking about policy, partnerships and best practices, Petco is really an embodiment of all of that brought together. So like she said, we started out as a voluntary producer responsibility organization. Now in as much as you will see Petco Kenya and then it says Kenya PET recycling company, 
we really are not recyclers. Our name just sort of represents that recycling is something we uphold. So when you see Kenya PT Recycling Company, don't think we are a manufacturing company. So many people ask us, okay, what are you making with your products? We have no products. And so as I continue the presentation, um, I hope some of the things uh, when you hear EPR, you'll sort of understand what that means. It's something so new that many times people still don't understand. But in a nutshell, EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, is where manufacturers are, as the word says, extending their responsibility of the products that they are making. So you seated here right now, regardless of what institutions you've come from, you're a consumer because you need water, you need blue band, you need soap, you need to live. And all those things are packaged in something. And the producers are here to ensure that once you're done with it, once you've consumed the products, they take responsibility for it and extend its life cycle. Okay, so we may continue. Um, when we were formed in 20, 17, 2018, it was under a framework of cooperation between CAM, NEMA, Ministry of Environment and Forestry. It was around the time, if you remember, the plastic bags ban. And sort of what Richard was saying, this violent, um, it looked violent on your side, but there had been engagement in the industry for the plastic bags. So by the time government was saying we're eradicating it, PET sector players said we need to show that we can take responsibility for our packaging and actually prove to government. So the framework of cooperation actually was there under the Kenya Plastics Action Plan that was developed. And so if you need resource material, please look that up. Where we were sort of modeling what it would look like to actually have a legal framework where it would be mandatory. So about six companies came together and put in their resources so that we can actually start the process of EPR. And what initially we had said we needed to do was one, create, as has been said, consumer and industry awareness. Ensure that industry players understand what role they have to play and what co financial, you know, we just say contribution, but what financial contributions they must make. And then two, for the consumers, you seated, what does it mean for you to dispose of your material? So many times we say, the producers, the producers, the producers, but we, after we've consumed our material, we have a responsibility as to what to do with them. And so it's for us to provide avenues for them to dispose their material properly. Then now collection and recycling. And so here it's supporting existing and encouraging new PET collection and recycling networks. So there's nothing that Petco has done that is new. All we do is promote and encourage and have whatever was existing become more organized or make it bigger that people know that there's a few people doing it. Because all along you've been seeing people collecting things, you don't know what is in there, but you always see a sack being carried along. So I never knew what that was about till one time in campus someone told me, oh, we actually buy bottles. It blew my mind. But they'd been in existence for tens and 20, 30, 50 years. But the value chain was so low. So what does promoting that mean? It means putting more money into this so that directly, if this bottle was being sold for two bob and now it's being sold for 10 bob, I'm just going to obviously want to buy more of it. So that was one of the easiest ways to sort of just promote and improve collection across the country. And then lastly, partnerships. And that's why I say we're sort of a conglomeration of everything. So finding the strategic partnerships will help us get there. And as much as EPR is private sector saying we're taking responsibility, mm, you really can't sort of make a strong fist on your own. You need industry, you need private, other private sector players, you need the civil society, you need all county governments and other partners. The next slide. So um, Nema sort of touched on what EPR looks like through a cyclic diagram, but this breaks it down even more. And you can see there's three major arrows, starting with the green one, and then the light blue one, and the dark blue one. And 
if you've heard of reuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, please tell your neighbor, reduce, come on guys, reduce, <laughs> reuse, and recycle. And this is so important, but I think people, if wh when I break this down, I could potentially end this conversation here because it's the heart of EPR. And EPR, everyone thinks is just recycling. The first thing is reduce. And when we say reduce, and I'm happy to see some manufacturing companies, because EPR is not just for packaging. Petco represents packaging, and I'll just pause and highlight what the EPR regulations say, is there'll be five categories. There are so many, but we must start somewhere. So the five categories will be non-hazardous packaging manufacturers. That's anything that's possibly consumable. Um, and a bit of cosmetics. Then you have hazardous packaging material. That's your agrochemicals, your pharmaceuticals, your fuel, so when your lubricants, your paint, all of that. And now you start to think, oh, these all these things I use, me. So I go and buy paint for my house. And so that's non-hazardous. Then there'll be non-hazardous non-packaging, so that's your furniture, that's your buckets, that's your chairs, that's your table. So that's still stuff that you need. So remember, at the heart of all this is the human being. And then there'll be electronic. And so that's your cables, your laptops. And all of this, each producer will have a responsibility to figure out how to take it back. And then now the last one is, um, old motor vehicles and end use and tires and that category. So there's so many things in this process for the legislation. Last year in 2020, we spent a lot of time with ministry sort of figuring out what's the best way to start. And so we're hoping as this goes into action, um, three, four, five years from now, we'll revise it again and expand what we're doing. So under reducing, here you have production and purchasing. So it's that every product that they send out into the community has in mind that it needs to come back to the owner. So if you're making tires, we as the PRO, and that's Producer Responsibility Organization, are doing research with you to sort of advise you on what are the global standards. If you're making that tire and it has to erode, I mean, eventually the treads wear out. If you're making that bottle, eventually it's going to get disposed. So how many times can it be? I mean, what are the s different things that are going into it that make it profitable for us to put it back into the loop and make another bottle? So your labels, your bottle tops. Many times if you look at your Elianto, do you know it has like four types of plastic in just that one plastic container? So that makes the recycling process so complicated. And so that's the feedback we're getting from recyclers and from just design companies in terms, in terms of having that conversation with the production. Then now reducing process waste. So it'll get to a point where we are auditing or working or getting reports from our manufacturer saying, how efficient are you in your product cycle in the factory? So that's how high this EPR cost is going to be on the producers, that they'll have to ensure that their product design, the waste they're producing, are they re-injecting it, right? And then now, optimizing the life cycle through alternative consumption. So the life cycle is from extraction up to the time when it comes back to you. And so whenever you think of life cycle, it's not just extraction, it's who is affected. And so it's like EIA on steroids. It's a whole entire meshwork. And so to have companies shift that focus, I want us to appreciate the magnitude of what EPR means so that we are not there saying, oh, you guys are not doing this, or oh, you guys are moving slowly. It really involves changing an entire business, an entire model of operation, and shifting the gears from what we've been doing for 50 years to now something that we'll be doing for the next hundreds of years. So that's just what reducing means. And that's at the industry level. So at the point where even for consumers, we're trying to say, how can this, how can this single use be the least single use you have? And many times, what research has shown is that even for like a bread bag, it is when you're designing something, you know that they'll probably use it for something else before they discard it. And if you're using that bread bag to store sausage in your fridge before you or put meat in your fridge, 
it continues to lower its quality the more times you wash it. It's just the way things happen. So as that happens, then you want to be thinking of, by the time it's getting to recycling stage, you have got to make sure your product is really, really high quality so that by the time it's coming back to recycling, it's still recyclable and we can then make the bottle all over again. So that's that. Then reusing, improving collection. And that's now where, as some people have mentioned, what are the conversations we're having with informal collectors, with garbage collection companies, with CBOs, and figuring out how to optimize what they're already doing and not necessarily shift an entire generation of people. And then now encouraging recycling and investing in infrastructure. At this point, our conversations with government are how can we have incentives for re investors? So right now we're thinking of bottle-to-bottle -bottle conversion. And I'll speak mostly on PET because when we were formed, it was the PET subsector that came together and formed. But now the law says you need to put all your packaging together. So that's sort of what's happening in terms of the dialogue that's happening behind the scenes. So we constantly have engagements with the PS and the CS to discuss what is the most lucrative environment, even for business owners, because they're already paying so many other taxes. So that's sort of what the PRO, most of the times we spend our time in dialogue and you think these guys are just taking their time. So that's really the entirety of what EPR means. So after this, we can slide on and these are the members. Whenever we say a EPR, producer responsibility, the law, the EPR regulations have broken down who they are. So if you're a brand owner, a converter, so you're importing material, if you're a blower, I mean a bottler, so you blow the material, um, a retailer, and for us retailers are so significant because when we started, we would get EPR fees, so that's for every ton. And this is a simple way of paying, but it gets a bit more complicated. So for every ton of packaging they produce, they, we charge them an amount. And remember, these are voluntary members. There is no law saying they have to do it. And then some companies like brand owners or retailers with 3.5 million sort of turnover, then they'd give us grants because then we still have other operational expenses. So all the EPR fees, so if you're producing 50 tons, that 50 tons money you've given us, let's say it's 500 shillings, it's not, but let's say it's 500 shillings. So 500 times 50, all of that goes to recyclers. And so for every ton, every kilogram that a recycler buys from the collector, we give them an amount of money. And so that's where all that money goes. And then now we can continue. And these are just sort of now you'll see the members. So these are private sector members. Next slide, you'll see the private sector alliances and associations that we've partnered with. The next slide, you'll see the ministries and different counties we've been able to do projects with and sort of have different community initiatives. Because we are a country office, but we will only come as a voluntary organization we'll sort of land where the county is ready. So when Mombasa County says come, we'll come, um, because they already have their act and they are moving in that direction. The next slide, um, I've sort of broken down how that happens in terms of recycling, auditing, um, and this becomes even more vigorous once the regulations are enacted, because then we will still take all our reports to NEMA. And when we started for three years, Petco was operating, handing out monthly reports to NEMA and CAM, because after the three years, that's when we actually had the drafted regulations, because the successes of Petco had us say that, yes, we can actually form a PRO, and that's how now Kepro was birthed. And next slide, um, sort of what's been happening in the country in terms of end-use conversion. Most of our PET is exported, but as you have conversations with recyclers for circularity, the aim is to have us here, use the material internally. And then um, you can continue. This is sort of our trajectory of what we've been able to recycle. And then the next slide. Um, you can just, these are now just pictures. So you can just scroll, seeing what we've been doing. Um, the bins we've been putting, the community initiatives we've done in ordering relief, the donation of PPE, 
um, putting up bins, um, and then some of our challenges. So thank you so much for listening. I hope that's broken down a bit of the mystery of EPR, and we can continue the discussions afterwards. Thank you so much, uh, KM and Petco team. Maybe you can give them another round of appreciation. Uh, uh, from your presentation, actually, we've come to learn a lot about the circular economy, circularity of the same, the three R's, recycle, reuse, and reduce. And then, among other things, like uka, uka Milivu program that you do have, um, all in line to circular economy. And then now our next presentation um, will be from the uh, JICA team, uh, that is John Mungai. Uh, due to the interest of time, we still have four more to go. Our presentation will end a few minutes to one. There will be also a panel discussion, so you can list down your question for that particular session. Um, So we can continue listing the questions. And then uh, next, uh, Jaika. So Karibu sana, Buana John. Good afternoon, members, Waziri, and all the stakeholders. I appreciate this opportunity to be in Mombasa. And I felt that since this is our first time, I'll make an introduction of who Jaika is and why we are attending this uh, stakeholders forum. Maybe you can go to my... Jaika, Jaika. Jaika. Uh, apart from, uh, I can just go on. Uh, just to give a brief introduction of who JICA is. JICA is the technical arm of the government of Japan. And uh, we, the official, uh, official assistance, development assistance uh, of the Japanese government. So we are bilateral donors and uh, we are in almost 192 countries worldwide. So, uh, in Kenya, we, are, we have three types of schemes. We are in technical cooperation, we have yen, loan, and then we have, um, we have ODA loan and grant aid, technical cooperation. So if I can give an example of, our, of how we support Kenya, we engage with the government, we look at the Vision 2030 uh, and the MTPs, and the sector policies, leg legislation, strategies, and plans of the national government. And then we can work with the county governments. So we engage a lot, especially with the, mi the main ministry. And then uh, these are the areas JICA supports Kenya. We have economic infrastructure. And in Mombasa, we've done a lot in the port. We've done uh, birth. 20 and 22, these are ODA loan. And then we have uh, Dongokundu Road, which has been done by Japanese government. And there are some sections which are grants, but mostly in Mombasa it has been ODA loan. And then uh, in Nairobi infrastructure, we talk of Ngong Road, but we are very careful to say Ngong Road from National Library to to Nakumat Junction, because there have been a lot of complaints from uh, Nakumat Junction to the Southern Bypass. <laughs> <laughs> so we are very careful when we talk about Ngong Road. And that was a grant. And also the Nairobi missing links, which were done by the Japanese government to the, Japanese, to the government of Kenya. And then we, have, we also support agriculture development, uh, Moya, we are in Moya. Uh, there is a lot of uh, the, the recently launched dam, the Dimpa Dam in uh, Kerogoya. And then we have human resource development. We support a lot of training 
I've invited a lot of uh, uh, trainees from county governments to go and do some short courses in Japan and in third country uh, countries around 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 Kenya. And then we have health. We support a lot in uh, universal healthcare coverage. And even in Mombasa, we work a lot with Mombasa uh, County uh, on this area. And then the main area is what, uh, why I'm here is water and sanitation and environment. And uh, among the areas that we support is solid waste management. We've not done anything in Mombasa. Like our entry point is, is here. It's now. Yeah. So just our basic policy. We support integrated solid waste management from the basic to, to disposal, to the final disposal. And uh, we had a project in, uh, this, these are the areas we supported, the seven areas, from legal up to culture. We consider all these areas when we are uh, formulating a project on solid waste management, from legal to cultural. And uh, when, when I started doing this survey in Mombasa two months ago, uh, I'm not just focused to the county government, I'm focused to all levels, all the key players in the, in the solid waste management. And I had the pleasure to meet uh, home hand in hand, comrade, actually comrades are the ones who invited us and told us that we usually have a dialogue, you should come and meet the stakeholders, and since you are, you are planning to be part of you, and that's why uh, we are here. And then um, our assistance, next slide. We've, we've had not a major uh, project in solid waste management, but we helped Nairobi County to design the Nairobi Master Plan on solid waste management. And that was back in 1998. And then they were asked again to revise the master plan in 2012. When we revised, the, the master plan, we were asked to implement some of the projects that had been proposed in the, in, the, in, the, in the master plan. So we had two projects. Project number one was capacity building, and uh, we emphasized on transportation and collection. And then uh, the second project, the second capacity building, was supposed to involve uh, the commissioning of Dandora uh, lamp site and construction of Roy uh, sanitary landfill. But again, in 2017, the county government, the Nairobi City County government changed focus from landfill to waste to energy. It has not taken it off. And uh, we already have a proposal from the new governor that they want to revisit. So maybe we are going to revisit that area. So another project that we have, uh, we call it African Clean Cities Platform. Uh, Kiambu, Nairobi, and Ministry of Environment are members. At the moment, uh, uh, the project is just collecting data, and we have 24 cities in Africa uh, where this project is being implemented. Uh, I would want to see how we can link our African Clean Cities platform with the smart cities in, in Mombasa in the, in the near future. And then uh, our current ongoing uh, intervention, we are supporting Kiambu County government to set up a landfill sanitary uh, at Kangoki Dam site. So we just have a pilot where we have, we have our expert. Um, not much progress is being done, but within this current intervention, uh, one of the components of this project is to identify as area uh, where we can support in solid waste management. And uh, there is this proposal that is coming from the Ministry of Environment and Forestry to support material recovery society. And the ministry has suggested to us that Mombasa and Kwale are potential and good sites. And that's why we are here. So that uh, proposal has already been received by the government of Japan. It's under consideration, and we expect maybe from next year to do a detailed formulation survey for Mombasa and Kwale, and then we can see how we can support the county government of Mombasa. JICA uh, support is government to government, so it will be between the government of Japan and the government 
of, of, uh, of Kenya through Mombasa County and Kwale County. But we work with all stakeholders in the chain, all the way from community-based organizations to the government. And uh, if you have time to study our project, our capacity building project that we did in Nairobi in 2014 to 2016, we realized that all players were included uh, in our project. And then, uh, last but not least, this is just a repetition. Um, we are working with the Ministry of Environment, as I've said. They have submitted an application, which we hope will be uh, accepted. Uh, we've added a lot of information into it, and the proposed uh, project site is Mombasa and Kuala County. So we hope to be working with these two counties. We hope to be working with you as stakeholders, and it was a pleasure to come here and meet my fellow stakeholders in the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Maybe you can give another last clap. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, so the next presenter will be Jumuya for yeah, JKP. And then uh, for John, thank you. I think we also on a similar mission some few months ago, actually, then uh, here in Mombasa, and welcome back. Now we have more partners in Mombasa for the same uh, aspiration of supporting the county government of Mombasa and the people of Mombasa and all other stakeholders. So now let's welcome Gladys Karibu. Um, thank you and good morning everyone. Um, my name is Gladys Sumjama. I'm from the Jumia County Zapwani um, Secretariat. And um, for me, um, <clears throat> my key role, I'm a sector lead in financial services and investment. And we deal a lot with partnerships cross-cutting throughout the region. Um, as I begin my presentation, you've seen our caption for Jumia County Zapwani, which is changing the story. And for us, we are very, very key that every project and initiative that we do is transformative for the region. And so that is why we want to change the narrative, change the status quo, and change the story of our coastal people. Uh, next slide. And so for us as JKP, um, we operate with the triple helix model, so we work with the academia, um, and our three partner universities are Taita Taveta University, Pwani University, and Technical University of Mombasa, which is where I met my good friend Waziri, uh, Dr. Nato, um, where I was previously working as a lecturer. So our friendship has come a very long way um, in that. Um, and so we operate also, of course, with our six county um, governments and the industry and private sector players. Next slide. Um, for us, our core mandates are four, which is in policy harmonization, um, which is, I, I loved the discussion that we had earlier in terms of um, how policy impacts um, waste management, and um, these are things that for us, we want um, policies that can be replicated across the six coastal counties. And so for us, we always key in terms of policy harmonization so that as a region, we are moving in one direction. Um, we have as well coordination, and so we work in coordinating especially key cross-cutting projects that affect um, all the coastal counties, sometimes it's four or three, but that's what we do, um, as well as promotion. We do a lot in promoting our regional assets, and so at this moment we are very, very key in promoting especially uh, tourism so that people are aware of what we have as a region, and so we, don't, we promote our tourism initiatives in that area. And the last one is investments, and which is one of the reasons why I'm also here, because we're really keen to understand where are the areas that we can plug in, that we can have synergies and work together. Um, next slide. Um, for Jumia, this is, um, we have our Jumia 2030, which mirrors the Vision 2013, which we identified 10 key areas in which we work in. And you can see there that natural resource and environment is one of our key pillars as well as the blue economy and all these other areas that we feel um, are, are enablers to assist us in moving forward. Um, so for us, next slide, one of the key, I'm moving very quickly because I've been told I have 10 minutes. <laughs> so that is why I'm kind of rushing through. 
Um, so for us, one of the major projects that we are doing is called Go Blue, um, in which we launched in 20, uh, last year, 2021, in March, which has, um, which has five implementing partners, and it's a 25 million euro fund, which is about 3.5 uh, billion Kenya shillings, um, in which we identified um, key areas that we want to work in. So the first area um, was in identifying um, fisheries, um, and so we're, we were enhancing the fisheries value chain, and so we have our GIZ partners, as well as Italy in terms of um, of the fisheries management. And so from Italy, they've been financing boats, um, fishing equipment, gover um, governance to the beach management units, and GIZ has been very key in the aquaculture um, area. Um, our other partners are in UN Habitat UNEP, which is one of the key um, aspects that I want to highlight um, because they are in promoting the development and mainstreaming um, of integrated approach to sea land planning and the whole idea is to close the gap between sea land planning, management and environmental protection. And then lastly we also have France who are dealing with um, maritime security. And so the whole idea of Go Blue was looking at um, a catalytic um, project that looks at all the dimensions of, um, of the blue economy. Next slide. And so when we dive into what we are doing in partnership with UN Habitat and UNEP, the whole idea is connecting people, cities, and the ocean um, to have innovative land sea planning management for sustainable and resilient Kenyan coast. So how does that, what are we looking at? So the whole idea is, is that we want to have reduced land-based human impacts in the coast natural capital. Because for us, we have realized that there's a lot that we as human beings, the impact that it has on the ocean, it has on forestry. And so the whole idea is what can we do to have resilient coral reefs, sustainable fisheries, marine protected areas. So the whole approach to what we're doing with UN Habitat UNEP is in those kind of um, areas. So to dive into it specifically, um, we are doing different activities, and one of the major things is to create pilot projects to, de to demonstrate land sea plans. And so some of the activities that we've done um, is demonstrated projects in Blue Carbon, waste management, and fish blending. is that we want knowledge sharing, best practices, and innovations. And so we want to create a hub which will sit in Mombasa in which many of these projects that we are doing, we can have that data inputted in our knowledge innovation um, data space um, so that we can have a whole integrated approach in how data management is handled in Mombasa. And so that's one of our key things so that we are not replicating but we have a whole knowledge portal that people can access and you can know exactly what has been done and the data that is available. So to dive in specifically to what we're doing in Mombasa, we have two initiatives that we're looking at. Number one is in Shelly Beach, which is in um, design and develop and enhance the functionality of the coastal public space. And so we are assisting in designing it, making it sustainable, um, training the community there in terms of best practices um, and to manage that, um, that Shelly Beach. And the next one, which is um, in partnership with Kemfri, is in Mikindani. Um, which we are at, which we are identifying a wastewater um, initi wastewater management system, which will um, inventorize existing techniques, technologies, and develop a constructed um, wetland. Um, so for each of the counties, we identified key priority areas. And so for Mombasa, this was what we did. For Taita, um, because they felt they wanted to really dive deep, um, they, we are supporting the municipality of Mwata to develop a solid waste management strategy. We are assisting them in update, upgrading the solid waste recycling and aggregation facility at the Chakareli dump site. And we're also carrying out a waste audit and developing a resource inventory in that county. 
Um, and the idea why we are doing these pilots is because we are in the process of also developing the Go Blue 2.0 because this project is, is ending in 2024 and we want to see how these pilots that we are doing can be replicated um, or even expanded in a larger scale to other counties. One of the other projects that we're doing in partnership with Mombasa County is called the Blue Skies um, Initiative, um, which is a carbon emission um, project, um, but it is on moving vehicles. Um, so we did, uh, we did a pre-feasibility study, I think it was in June uh, last year, um, and um, the whole idea was to see who are the culprits in terms of emissions. Um, and so it was, very, it was a very interesting study in which we found that some of the major carbon emissions emanate from the tuk-tuks and the, um, and the border borders, which was contrary to what we had thought. We had thought probably the trucks coming into Mombasa are the biggest culprits, but however, it is actually the border borders and the tuk-tuks. So currently what we are doing, it's in partnership with an American company as well as IFC is coming on board. Um, we want to be able to, we've coined it blue skies, so we want to improve um, our coastal city of Mombasa in that area in terms of, of creating um, a vehicle emission testing system which we want to try a pilot in putting them in um, different petrol stations so that people can come and check how are the emissions that are taking place in their vehicles, in their trucks, um, in their border borders, which can also help reduce the impact of what is happening in our, in our, um, in our city. Um, so one of the things that are in process, when we were um, working with Dr. Nato, we looked at the climate change policy, but it, it didn't fully capture the areas of carbon emission to an extent. And so we were now in a process to see how can we develop a policy that actually also captures that. So that is still in process, and Dr. Nato is looking into that, and we're hoping even with the, as the new incoming um, government is coming through, we can look into those areas as well. Um, in another partnership that we are also working with, I came with my um, team member here who is um, from Equity Bank. Um, so I want him to share just a few initiatives that they are doing as well um, so that we can have a holistic approach. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gladys. Uh, allow me in like just five minutes to share with you the initiatives we are doing as far as um, waste management is concerned. So I'll stand here because I don't have a presentation. My name is Geoffrey Wanyonyi. I work with Equity Bank. I'm here to make a commercial case, a business case for waste management. As a bank, we, we have what we call a, a Marshall Plan to create 100 million jobs in the next five years. For us to be able to do that, we've picked five key pillars where we're going to create those jobs. And pillar number one is on food and agriculture. I'm just going to rush through them. Pillar number two is on manufacturing. Pillar number three is on trade and investment. Pillar number four is on MSME. And pillar number five is on environment and social protection. I'm mentioning that because there are both three key pillars that are very, very relevant to this forum. The first pillar is on manufacturing. The second one, which you see also, is on um, MSME and the environment is at the center of it. There are various initiatives we are doing as a bank as far as the environment is concerned. And some of these initiatives include clean energy. In clean energy, what we are doing is we having intervention where we're transitioning institutions, households from um, from, from using wood to renewable energy like LPG. We're talking about reuse. We're talking, uh, and in that case, we 
having intervention around water harvesting, where we're having intervention on um, financing people around water collection um, initiatives, where we're working with manufacturers like of tanks, and, and we support people to, to store water uh, through what we call Magellan. And we're also very big in um, tree planting, uh, where, for example, in Junda, around Mombasa, we've done uh, over 100,000 mangrove trees, and we're waiting for this season to do more. We're seeing uh, plastic waste management as an opportunity for businesses. Businesses that are doing recycling, but also small businesses that are involved in, um, that are in, involved in the collection of those words. So if we're able to work with the people that are in that sector from end to end, from the collectors to the recyclers, then we're seeing business opportunities. So we, we're here to say that uh, as a bank, we are at the center of it. And also what we are doing, other than all that, we're also doing carrying out a lot of training. We're involved in a lot of um, community initiatives where we train people uh, not only on uh, financial issues, but we also train them on environment. So today I'm here to tell you that uh, as a bank, we don't just talk about money from end to end, but we are very, very much involved in environment. And probably those initiatives that you're working on, uh, the intervention you, you're working with your community, be it on uh, recycling, be it in tree planting, whatever it is, probably we're working on that. The Marshall Plan I told you about, the bank has set aside six billion US dollars to do that in the next three years or so. That's over 720 billion Kenya shillings. That money is there to support all of these projects, all of these programs that you're talking about. So I'm here to tell you that we are here as partners. Whatever projects you're thinking about, whatever initiatives you're thinking about doing, we are here. And we have the finances to do that. And we have the capacity to do that. So I'm offering my support in all those interventions so that we can be able to, to work together. So I'm, I'm very, very glad and proud to be part of this conversation. And I believe that uh, we have everything that it takes. We have the experts here, we have the money, we have the people, so we can only make it happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wanyoni and Cladis, for that clear elaboration, especially on the equity area, on areas that you're focusing on, on clean energy initiatives, training on people on financial and financial environment, and Cladis on the your your mission across all the three counties yeah then uh, our next uh, presenter is from kenya private sector alliance um ebenezer hamadi for those who have their questions ready they can forward it to me in the meantime anyone who has is ready and then also, we have also online attendees. In the event that they have questions, they can share with us during that particular time. So, Karibu Sana Bana Ebenes. Asante, thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is uh, Ebenezer Amadi. I work for the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. Uh, so, just to avoid the confusion, uh, what we're seeing is the Kenya Plastics Pact. Uh, so, I manage a program called Sustainable Inclusive Business. Um, and it looks focuses on four areas mainly. That's circular economy, uh, climate change, people power, and redefining business values. So under CAPSA we have, uh, oh, who is handling the presentation? No, I didn't say you got. Um, no, no, so this is my cue to the next presentation. This is my cue, okay. Um, so yesterday I was in a, in a conference where there was some sign language and I think I learned a few things. Uh, I think this, is, this actually means nice. Uh, yes. 
and and then the other thing I think uh, was uh, or lady, and then gentleman. Those are the three things. <laughs> Those are the three things I learned. So free education for you. Uh, I think they were trying to become inclusive. So <laughs> there was there was quite. Uh, uh, it was a bit interesting, so I was, uh, I, was, I was observing the guy with the signs and as they were talking, so I got to learn the three signs. Um, yeah, okay. So I, ideally, so as I mentioned, we focus on uh, four, four thematic areas, um, and, and then we have programs. So the Kenya Private Sector Alliance is an apex body of the private sector. Um, good. This is my cue to next, okay? <laughs> um, so the, the, the Kenya private sector is an ap apex body of the private sector and we, we do have um, what we call the public-private dialogue. So it's a conversation between the private sector and government, that's a public sector. And we have uh, 18, 18 sector boards that then mirror every ministry that we have in the country. So we then champion uh, for the changes or advocacy on policy matters uh, to create an enabling environment for the private sector. Then we also have the social economic arm. So we have programs and projects, and one of the programs there is sustainable inclusive business. Uh, the other is AJIRA. Probably you've heard of AJIRA because it uh, very works together with the Ministry of uh, ICT and other uh, projects. Uh, but as sustainable inclusive business, we then established the Kenya Plastics Pact, which I'm talking about today, uh, started off as a project, but uh, we aim at, as the name suggests, sustainability, becoming sustainable. So we bring together uh, different partners. Uh, so it's a multi-stakeholder forum. Brings together um, supporting partners, so including the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, uh, Petco, uh, Kepro, uh, WWF is also uh, supporting partner of the Kenya Plastics Pact. Uh, and then we have other brands. So the brands, uh, we will look at the logos. Uh, so the main aim of the pact is uh, to, one, as you look, at, we have four target areas. So one is to eliminate problematic plastic. And when you talk about problematic plastic, I would ideally refer to single-use plastics, right? And the second is to ensure that the packaging is recyclable and reusable. The third one is to ensure that, uh, so that's 100% of the packaging is recyclable and reusable. The third one, uh, we're looking at 40% uh, uh, of the packaging being recycled. There's a difference between you having a product that could be recycled and actually recycling that, that particular product. So that's the difference between the two uh, target areas. And the last one, of course, you're looking at 15% uh, recyclability across the polymers, an average. Right, so uh, it's an average across the polymer. So if you're looking at HDP, LDP, PVC, all those polymers, at least 15% across all those polymers are recycled. And I forgot to mention, uh, the Kenya Association of Worst Recyclers, headed by Mr. Kainika, is also a supporter of the, of the, of the uh, Kenya Plastics Pact. Um, great, so the four targets, of course, are then linked to four working groups. Four working groups meaning that um, the members then meet and deliberate. Uh, for example, under target to group one is to look at a list of problematic um, plastics that could be eliminated, right? So we have working groups meeting in the four target areas. Uh, and then we do then develop uh, tools, uh, guides to support our members to be able to integrate uh, sustainability or circularity within their uh, value chain or rather packa packaging. Um, and then on an annual basis we'll be having a report, so we'll be collecting data from all our members, especially the brands, uh, to look at how they are then contributing to meeting the four target areas that we have. It's actually uh, a voluntary uh, platform where we try to bring in the best practices and one of our partners uh, in this is Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So we're basically relying also on the principles on circular economy built over the years uh, by Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Uh, one, um, our partners also include uh, RAP, that is a Waste Resource Action Program, uh, MAVA Foundation, 
um, and uh, UKRI. Uh, we also got some funding, a little bit of funding from FCDO at some point just to help us to uh, increase on the visibility uh, of the pact. So the pact actually in Kenya, which is called the Kenya Plastics Pact, is the second to be established in Africa after the South African uh, uh, Plastics Pact. Uh, but we have different pacts in, 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 in the world. We have the UK Plastic Pact, we have uh, the Indian Plastic Pact, we have the US Plastic Pact, uh, we have one uh, in Chile, um, so there are quite a number uh, in, in, in the world. Um, so on, based on the four target areas, we then developed a roadmap. So the roadmap basically shows you what, how we want to achieve the four targets by 2030. So under this uh, uh, targets, for example, in target one, uh, we then have uh, a schedule of activities that we have, if you look at the gun chart, it's not so visible, so not so important for, uh, for us today, but it's just for the purpose of, uh, of sharing. Um, now, these are basically examples, for example, uh, from other parks uh, that uh, we aim also to be achieving within the Kenya Plastics Pact. Uh, if you look at uh, the UK Plastics Pact, um, uh, switched away from a problematic polymers, e.g. Uh, PVC, and also the undetected uh, black plastics. Um, in Portugal, they also did uh, um, something there uh, by looking at um, a PET uh, that was being used uh, in packaging uh, some of the food stuff. Uh, an example again in South Africa, uh, clicks uh, eliminating PVC uh, because Ideally, it then reduces your ability to recycle uh, PET because it has some similar kind of qualities. So people tend to uh, um, uh, they tend to put them together instead of separating them. So, which is a problem. Awareness creation is also very important. Uh, uh, Pick and pay also uh, did put together a collection uh, uh, points. So, quite some best practices you are seeing from. Uh, different plastics packed in, in, in the world. Uh, so under target two, again, uh, same thing uh, that you're seeing. Um, for example, here, you're looking at the Kenya Plastics Pact, um, Haynes uh, did eliminate uh, silicon that was there in the uh, bottles um, uh, that was packaging the um, ketchup because again, it was a bit difficult uh, for you to recycle once you have uh, that within the packaging. Um, an example, of course, with PepsiCo, uh, moving from green to clear bottle uh, with the 7-Up, same thing with uh, Coke as it did with uh, Sprite, from green uh, to clear. I was almost saying uh, uh, blue. You know, men are colorblind. <laughs> um, but anyway, just use that as an excuse. It's not that we are colorblind, we see the colors, but we, we confuse them. But unless you're going into the deeper colors, like uh, I had there several um, varieties of pink, right? So who knows about that? Just the ladies. Um, the South African Plastic Pact also did um, um, remove elements of adhesive on, on their labels um, and they were held by a company that is recycling called x -Trupet. and x also wants to come into Kenya. The other day we had a conversation with, with Petco and Coca-Cola so they want to do bottle to bottle kind of recycling especially uh, with food grade uh, packaging which has always been a problem due to the levels of hygiene you're supposed to uh, ensure you adhere to. Um, okay, let's just go next. These are just examples, uh, target three. Uh, let's move on. Let's move on. Good. So, uh, some of the benefits that, um, just go back one, oh, good. So, one of the benefits that the companies do get to benefit um, 
while, while they join the Kenya Plastic Park. One is they are part of a global network within the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So you're able to learn from different companies, uh, especially now the companies are looking out to grow to different uh, countries. Uh, so it's easy uh, to get a sense of some of the best practices you're seeing in different nations and adopt that. So we also support them to adopt those best practices. And uh, having a standardized kind of um, uh, move in the sector also helps them because if you're ideally uh, moving from colored bottle to clear and everyone is doing that, it's easy for you. Uh, because with marketing, uh, I think they, it, it's, it's a thing. I mean, with color, it's appealing to the eye. That's the first thing you see. So if it's green, uh, if you look at other bottles, you might skip them and go to the green one, right? Um, here nowadays, people, I mean, they, they refer to a specific green as Safaricom green or the Coke red. That's what the marketers. So it's because it's, it's, it's something that catches your eye. Um, so we have also collaborative uh, uh, working groups. So that's the other thing within the four working groups. So a company can decide to join any of the working groups. Uh, resource mobilization, of course, if you're looking at projects uh, that you can implement uh, together. Uh, so that's an opportunity again for, for the members. Uh, the other thing is also on policy influencing. Under the steering committee, uh, we have the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, which is part of the steering committee. Um, we have the supporting members, which is the BMOs uh, or the sector organizations uh, that then champion for some of the policies that we have. Uh, Next, next. Um, good. So, if you look at uh, the funding mechanism of the of the park, we have different um, uh, portfolios that we get some level of of resources. One, because it's a membership organization, then the brands do pay an annual fee. It's just to help to. Uh, cover some of the costs, for example, in data collection, supporting the members to uh, collect the data, do the reports, develop the guidelines, uh, the tools that they could use, um, and also facilitating their working groups uh, within uh, the annual calendar. Uh, so if you look at the indicative split, that's it. We got initial funding from Marvel Foundation, FCDO, um, as well as different partners uh, from 2020 because it was launched in, in 2020, but we aim also to become sustainable. Uh, so our supporting partners uh, are also contributing towards that. Uh, so it's an initiative then that aims to reduce uh, the disposal of plastic to the environment by increasing uh, uh, our recyclability rate. Um, great, and we're done. So the I didn't want to go deeper into the presentation because it was a bit long. And once we are close to lunch, uh, some of our, I mean, it's, it's, it's basic sense that we, we, we are, our energy levels are going down. You know, when I was doing physics, I used to love physics, and I dropped CRE to do physics. Funny thing. <laughs> it's, it's because, not because that I hate CRE, it's because my physics teacher was more interesting than the CRE uh, teacher. Because a CRE teacher used to give us, I mean, you could write a five-page notes with three points, right? So you'll read 10 pages. When you get to the exam, they ask you, give us 15 reasons why the Egyptians, I don't know, moved or didn't adopt Christianity. Yet you read seven points, right? So out of the seven, be sure you're not going to remember the seven. You'll remember at least four, right? So meaning... Four out of 15, you're a D student, right? So, I, oh <laughs> so I, and, and the other class, imagine they give, um, they, they give them pointers. So it's one page with 15 points. So meaning if you're able to read 15 and they ask for 10, at least you can remember eight, right? Then you're an A student. So I opted for physics. And you know the other thing that our physics teacher told us is that once you are going to... Um, uh, you, you have a theory, you have to test it and prove it. And I want to test one today. How many of us have ever read that, uh, no, have ever dreamt that they are falling from the sky? Ideally, everyone, right? At some point, when, when you are a kid. But how many of you have ever hit the ground? 
none of us have hit the ground, right? You never get there. You kind of kick and then you wake up, right? So the assumption there is that you are growing. And when you, <laughs> you are growing, and so uh, you are getting taller. And to prove that theory is that today, today, none of you have ever dreamt that uh, you are falling from the sky. True or true? So meaning you pass the stage of growth. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you so much, Buana Ibenes. <laughs> I think that was a lively one, actually. Uh, so we still have two more presentations to go, and then we'll break for lunch. Uh, the next on stage will be um, Kenya Association of West Recyclers by Richard Kainika. Um, so, and then the last, uh, but not least, will be Likoni West Recyclers Cooperative Limited. Uh, so, yeah, we, or do we stand up and stretch a bit? I know it's been a very long uh, presentation. Yeah, we can stand a bit and stretch. Uh, who is a great psych uh, master here? Maybe Ebenezer, he can lead us on that as <laughs> well. Ebenezer, yeah, a stretch, psych up. Okay, so you, got, you caught me off guard. Um, so meaning I'll have to send you an invoice. <laughs> oh, so let's, let's just do a simple one. Um, okay, I'm thinking on my feet. Let's do the coconut one. So uh, when they say a C, you stretch from the side on this side. An O, a C on the other side. Uh, N. Bend, sorry. No, no. Is is C O C O, N U? Oh, sorry, I skipped the O. Okay, so it's it's C O C O N U T N F. Right. Okay, so let's try that again. Um, so let's do, let's do the C. Any side? <laughs> uh, give me a no. It stretch a little bit. I need an, a higher O. Give me a C. Give me a full C, <laughs> not a half C. <laughs> give me an O. And to your toes, to your toes. <laughs> to your toes. Let's take like uh, three seconds. One, two, three. <laughs> um, and a T. Oh, sorry, U. And a T with one foot. <laughs> and an S with the other foot. Thank you, might sit down. Thank you so much, Ebenezer. Now, Richard, it's now your floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ebenezer, you have really helped. I was really wondering whether what I'm going to present is going to really make any impact because I had already seen the, the, the mood on the ground. Thank you very much, Ebenezer. I learned something also from Ebenezer besides the, the many good things he said about the gentleman. And also the, the tooth extraction, he said it means nice, right? I don't remember what he said by... He said that this is going to be his cue for the next ride, isn't it? Yeah, but he ended up doing like this. I don't know whether you noticed. <laughs> he forgot the cue. Great. So th this is Richard. And uh, I, I always talk about recycling. So this is for your sake. Um, uh, Kenya Association of Waste Recyclers is the association that uh, I represent. And this is our second time to be invited here. And uh, we are very, very happy and grateful all protocols observed. Thank you very much, Mombasa County and the other stakeholders. I bring the message of uh, 
from the recyclers. I was just updating them on what is happening. We have a, a national WhatsApp platform where we keep ourselves up to date with what is happening. So, so what do we do? Like this, the Ebenezer Q. Skip to the next one. So this is an introduction of uh, the Association of Waste Recyclers. We are just a, we are a BMO, a business membership organization. We registered immediately after the, the polythene ban, if you are here, that those times when the industry was literally um, under pressure from the government. The recyclers also are trying to put their act together. And we met together with one MOU with KAM uh, on uh, PET bottles collection. And we had a very huge coverage from media, including KBC. Those times, things were very bad. Uh, everybody was there. We signed an MOU. And uh, from then on, we have worked together with KAM. And uh, it has been very, very helpful to us because we, we are just, uh, I think this is our fifth year, while Cam, is, uh, Cam was there before independence. I don't know whether we noticed when she said that. Cam was here before the Republic. Whoever started Cam must be a very unique uh, kind of a person. Uh, let, let's move on to the other slide. So this is just a definition of our membership, the people that we register in the association. Um, KAWL covers the, the value chain. You'll notice that we have all the actors within the six categories. Maybe I should go through them. The biggest of these six categories is the, the lowest, which is the waste pickers. And I want to say something about waste pickers because there is a conversation that started with the, the UNEA 5.2 uh, because uh, it was decided that this time they are going to give a lot of emphasis on the waste pickers because one, they are informal, secondly, they are sort of uh, um, should I say discriminated or it's obvious that they don't get the the gist of the trade, right? So there is the feeling that they somehow they get exploited. So I know when we talk about waste pickers, people think about the people who walk around in gunny bags in their back, but that could be wrong. KAWL, we categorize waste pickers uh, in three categories. We have the, the guys with the bags on their back, the gunias. We have people who do garbage services. This could be, the, f the second category could be the groups that I think we discussed here a lot. The groups, the CBO, those are waste pickers. And then we also have the garbage service companies. These are companies, corporate entities that collect garbage from residential areas or from industrial establishments and transport it to the dump site. Those are waste pickers. And that is how we categorize them. So we also have aggregators. Aggregators are micro enterprises most times who buy waste, all kind of waste for a profit. What they do for us is they segregate the waste. They buy from firewood to old gumboots to bones and to food waste. Then they segregate and sell to individual our processors. Then we have transporters. We have, especially in the area of uh, PET, as uh, Gadoni talked about here, um, uh, PET, we have specialized transporters. There are people who just buy trucks. They buy PET from aggregators and they transport it to, to processors. Then we have collectors. These guys, they'll buy bulk material. They don't mix. They just buy bulk material, they keep it in huge quantities, and then they transport it to the processors. Most times you find these people in paper and scrap metal. Then we have value adders. Value adders are people who have invested in equipment, processing equipment. And they are not just one category, you have two. If you come to a registration uh, platform, you find that they, we have value addition category one and category two. Particularly in plastics, we have people who just buy plastics, sort, and grind, but they don't go beyond that point. So that is category one, value addition.
Category 2 in plastics, you'll find that they buy the ground plastics, the flakes. They wash it dry. They pelletize into granules. Sometimes they also sell it now to converters, people who produce finished products. And then finally we have converters. These are the people who make or who manufacture finished goods from waste. This could be wholly, 100% or partly, because that happens. There are people who would use uh, some fractions of uh, uh, virgin material, and there are those who will use all of it. So I still don't know who is uh, doing the flip, so I'm trying to look for him so that we... Perfect. Sorry. Okay. So some of the things that the association do, does beyond the, what I just explained, is um, our core objectives are public um, impact activities revolving around... Uh, Recycling awareness and recycling education. The reason why we, we begin with that is because not everybody knows that waste is value. We have a serious problem with the unemployment in Kenya. Very serious problem. I think people who are unemployed, unemployed are everywhere. I mean, if you take 200 meters on either side, wherever you are, you find some people who are not employed. As recyclers, we believe that we have jobs for these people. But then some of them, you'll find that they don't know. There are those people who know that plastic, uh, I mean, metals can be recycled, but they don't know even how to convert it to money. There are a few of them who know that plastic, some plastics like jerry cans, can uh, be recycled, or they have some value, but they also don't know where to sell. So the association provides the link. So the other uh, way that we engage with people is through meetings. We do demos. We encourage people to visit our operating facilities, and we are very open at that. We, are, and, um, we also have group trainings where we bring people together and uh, train them. Then uh, we have online workshops and social media streaming. Uh, other things that we do now in uh, consideration of the what is happening today in Kenya, I would say that we are in a very good time. I think for the recyclers, things will never be the same again. Uh, for those of us who are, have invested in recycling, we are really happy. We are really happy. This is a very good time for us because the government has been very supportive of our sector. And now we have the extended producer responsibility just about to come. We have the Sustainable Waste Management uh, Act now. Yeah, we, we are always hesitating to say act because we've got grown so used to saying the bill until recently when it was published, now it came uh, an act. So every time we want to say a bill, but it's now an act. And we are very happy because, I mean, it's been a long time struggling, but now we'll be having all the likes of Gitao coming on board and uh, working together with us. You can imagine KAM and the recyclers sitting on the same table talking about how difficult it is to collect some packaging materials and uh, also working to it together towards facilitating the same. So one of the things that we found ourselves doing in collaboration with uh, the industry uh, is uh, providing a testation service. We found that the association, because we register businesses that are in this uh, space, we found that we, we have the capacity to do due diligence on the recyclers because we find that um, recycling is one of those industries that have the real juakari, you know, the meaning of juakari. I mean, the, the, the most of them are businesses that are started by people. Um, in the yellowest ways of starting businesses. So, in so doing, when you imagine that uh, EPL has been allowed, by the way, let me say this, uh, because I, my, my uh, Kadoni said, talked about the same, we have already started enjoying the, the benefits of EPL, even before the, the enactment of the law, and the CAM has been very active, and I want to say this on record, that uh, the recyclers have already begun eating from the, the EPL, uh, I think to date we have uh, received more than 20 million. 
Yeah. So the spirit, the spirit is very real. But the reason why I'm, uh, that came to my mind is because uh, those people who receive this money are the recyclers. And you know Kenyans, eh? We know we are, we are crafty. And uh, I mean, you know the briefcase. You know the briefcase, eh? So when the EPL fund is being dispersed to the recyclers, there has to be some way of uh, checking whether these people are genuine. Are they doing what exactly this fund is meant to, to benefit? So this is what the association is doing because then we have networks. You cannot just say that you are doing cartons and uh, we have not felt your presence in the market. So we don't know where you collect from. We don't know where you sell to. And we, it is very easy for us to know because we have, like I said, we register the value chain. So even those who are not registered as members, it is easy for us to tell whether they are really collecting and from whom and they are selling and to whom. So this due diligence revolves around location and uh, the capacity for which a, the particular recycler would process, the ownership of the, the entity, proprietorship, then there is the materials and types processed. When you come to plastic, there is a lot of uh, um, jargon about types. Eh? Yeah, so we have HDP, PP, PET, LD, LD, I know many of you don't understand even what I'm saying. Eh? But um, when a briefcase person comes and says that there is a, P, there is a subsidy for LD, PE, then he changes his tune and says that he does that. So unless you are professional, you will not know whether he really recycles that particular kind of material. So those are some of the technical things that we are able to provide. And then there is the, the other thing that we do is also helping to incorporate the, the informal through compliance assistance. Like I said earlier here, we have a lot of charge uh, in terms of compliance. The statutory burden that is placed on the, the recyclers is very high. I want to say here and on record and without bias that it is very complicated to get compliant as a recycler in Kenya. And we thank the Lord for the Sustainable Waste Management uh, Act because some of these things we were able, we got the opportunity to contribute and uh, we know that some of them will have to be dropped down. We have four licenses that answers to, to the same, to two names, but they are equal. You know, every government requires you to have a license. For instance, if you, you transport waste in Kenya, you need to have two licenses. One from the county government and another one from the national government. Yeah, And uh, if you don't have one, you might not operate that day if you come across uh, these people. So we, we try to encourage our members to, to try to see the literal good in being compliant. And how we do that is working together with the regulators for instance, we currently have a, 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 an agreement with a, a partnership with a, with a lead expert company that now has signed an MOU to provide this for um, the expert services for our members, wherever they are in Kenya. Of course, it's a company that is able to send experts wherever our members are. So our current understanding is that if they come, you'll pay 15000 for the EIA service. And then now we, we channel all the businesses from the members to this company. Of course, we did not see GoSource. We had a, a lot of uh, companies applying. So this is towards enabling our members to get themselves compliant with EIA. Then there is the issue of, uh, that is just an example of one uh, issue, that is sensitizing members on the benefits of adapting structures and record keeping through business training. You realize that the Juakari way of doing business is really lack structures. So we invite experts, they train our members sometimes, but and we thank, uh, we, 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 we grateful also to the COVID uh, uh, pandemic somehow, because we were able to exploit the, the online platforms whereby somebody can speak to a number of um, um, uh, attendants virtually. Then there is the partnerships with regulators to ease the enhanced membership compliance. That I think is what I had uh, discussed. Is that the last one? 
Great. So we have provision of public awareness and education on identification, handling, and processing of recyclable waste. That is uh, what I was talking about, being able to identify what is uh, uh, exactly recyclers are doing, then initiate and facilitate mop up of particular type of waste uh, from post consumer waste ecosystem. Now, these are some of the requirements that now will be coming with the, the EPR obligations where a PLO will come to. Um, to champion collection of specific uh, type of materials. We have currently a conversation that is ongoing with uh, the hazardous waste packaging. And that's a PRO that is coming. And you find that now, when you discuss about hazardous waste, you're talking about very specific type of packaging. So when such an initi initiative kicks off, um, we have now to enhance members on what particular materials are hazardous. We realize, like for instance, um, paint packaging like the paint that we use in construction and lubricants, motor oil lubricants are hazardous. But when you go to the normal recycling that we do in terms of collection of plastic, you find oil lubricants are considered as normal packaging and they are processed same as other non-hazardous materials. So th those are some of the situations where, uh, circumstances where now this issue would come on board. Then lastly, I, we have the opportunities that recycling would provide, um, uh, provide job opportunities, healthy and cleaner environment, dependence on virgin um, imports. Uh, we, uh, direct, Dr. Ali talked about MLFs already beginning to take shape, you know, and um, uh, um, dump site. Um, dependence on fertilizer import. I, Dr. Ari also talked about, uh, he was calling out for people who are doing composting. We also calling on people to begin composting. Now in Nairobi we have like three who are um, coming up. Then of course challenges begin with the awareness. Like I said, very few people know about this. Negative health implications and consequent financial burden on public and and the government, the financial issue here, I want to emphasize that just like I said about the motor oil and, and, and the paint packaging, these things are being recycled normally as other materials today. And I'm saying even here in Mombasa, it's highly likely that people are not separating the hazardous waste from non-hazardous waste. Some of the products that are made from these plastics are the, the same, same things that we are using to store water in our homes. That's a huge health risk. Although we don't seem to realize that, but it's a huge health risk. People are poisoning themselves gradually. So we need to wake up and try to see what we can do about these things. Because, uh, you know, we are buying very dangerous chemicals every day in our homes, isn't it? But you don't know where to throw away that packaging. So when you throw it in the dump site, the same way you do with the, the vegetable oil, don't forget that it is going to be processed using the same, same channels. And then, the products that are going to emanate from that process are going to come back to our homes. So, the issue of health and uh, financial implications is very real. So, that is it from uh, KAWR. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Richard. Uh, so, so, we have the last... Uh, not the last but not the least before we break for lunch and then after lunch we'll be having two more sessions each lasting for 10 minutes 10 minutes and then we go into a panel discussion where all our presenters will be here and then we can share or ask them the questions so kindly let's proceed writing down our questions for two to that session so i will now welcome mr hidi mohammed from the Likoni West Recyclers Cooperative Limited to give us his presentation. So like I've said, the program, once it's done, we can break for lunch and then be back by two. Yeah. Karibu, Bwana Mohamed. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Idi Mohamed Id. I'm the chairman of Likoni West Recyclers Cooperative Society Limited. I humbly request you to allow me to use Lugia Taifa for the benefit of my members 
back at Likoni who are following this discussion. Likoni US Recyclers Cooperative Society Limited ni muungano wa vikundi ambazo ni CBOs, youth groups na self help groups ambazo zinatokea katika gatuzi dogo la Likoni ambayo iko ndani ya Mombasa County. Vikundi hivi ni vile vikundi ambavyo katika shughuli zao ndani yake mna shughuli ya uzoaji taka ama uhifadhi wa mazingira. Cooperative yenye iliundwa mwaka jana 2021 mwezi wa kumi, ikuwa ni muungano wa vikundi takriban 25 na vikundi hivi vilikuja pamoja baada ya kupitia mafunzo ya hand in hand na WWF. Mafunzo yenye ilikuwa ni ya kujua thamani inayopatikana ndani ya taka na mambo ya ujasiri ya mali yani entrepreneurship. Ndio tukaona kuna haja ya kuwa tutakuja pamoja to form cooperative. And I stand corrected. Nadhani cooperative wino ndio cooperative ya kwanza ndani ya Kenya ambayo ni cooperative ya waste managers. Na tunashukuru sana washirika wetu ambao ni Mombasa County, Hand in Hand Eastern Africa, WWF, YWCA. Hao ndio washirika wakubwa ambao tumeshirikiana nao na tukaweka mkataba wa utendakazi yani framework of cooperation mwezi wa tatu. vipi tutashirikiana katika utendakazi huu na tunashukuru kazi tulioanza nayo kubwa kama cooperative ilikuwa ni awareness kwa jamii yetu ya Likoni ambayo ilikuwa tunalenga kubadilisha mienendo na tabia za jamii yetu kuhusu mambo ya usafi wa mji na usafi wa mazingira kwa jumla. Kwa sherehe ile messaging ambayo ilikuwa awali ya kwa nini tunasaili kuweka miji yetu ama mazingira yetu safi ilikuwa haikufika kwa jamii vilivyo. Nikitoa mfano ni wakati tupokuwa tunataka kufunga dam set iliyokuwa kibarani. Ujumbe mkubwa ambao ulipelekwa kwa jamii ni kwamba ile dam set kuwa pale ilikuwa ni chukizo kwa watalii wanaokuja Mombasa. Sasa jamii ilibeba vile kwamba ile dump site haina madhara kwa jamii, ina madhara kwa watalii wanaoingia. Vile vile sehemu za likoni yale majaa ama ule uchafu unaokaa barabarani, tuliambiwa ile ni chukizo kwa watalii wanaoenda ukunda. Kwa hiyo jamii ilibeba kwamba haina madhara kwa jamii. Kwa hiyo kazi yetu ya kwanza ilikuwa ni hiyo awareness kwa jamii kueleza kwamba usafi wa mazingira una athari kubwa kwenye jamii kuanzia kwenye afya zetu mpaka katika hali ya uchumi wetu na kama vile ninavyojua kitega uchumi kikubwa cha watu walikoni ni uchumi wa baharini wengi wao ni wavuvi na wao wamekubali kwa sahihi kwamba kazi yao za uvuvi zimerudi chini lakini pia vile vile kunapouliza tatizo ni nini kwa shauri ile messenger wanaoipata na ujumbe wanaofikishiwa tatizo alisia wa kuambiwa ni nini wengi wanakuambia ni shughuli inaoendea upanuzi wa bandari lakini walisahau kwamba pia wao kama jamii wanachangia katika uchafuzi wa mazingira ya baharini tukajaribu kuzungumza nao wengi wao wametuelewa na tabia zao kidogo na mienendo imeenda kubadilika na ndio maana paka saa hii tunao ushirikiano na jamii na ile sorting from the source kidogo imeanza kwa shauri kuona athari ni gani wanapata wakati mazingira yanakuwa machafu na pia vile vile kuelezea kwamba ndani ya zile taka kunayo thamani inayopatikana kwa hiyo wanaona hawatapeana ile uchafu wa mazingira taka zote kwa pamoja na hali ya kuwa kuna thamani pale ndani yake ndio pale imesaidia pia kufanya ile sorting from the source ya kwamba ile mali ambayo inaona ni bidhaa yenye thamani kwamba wanaiweka kando wanauzia likono wesi recyclers katika awareness sino pia imetusaidia kubeba baadhi ya vikundi ambavyo ilikuwa malengo wa mashuli zao wazusikani moja kwa moja na mambo ya usafi wa mji ama ukusanyaji wa takataka. Kwa shauri kama vile unavyojua jukumu hili ni collective responsibility ya kila mtu. Hatuwezi kulifanya peke yetu mpaka jamii mzima ikubali na ishikamane na sisi. 
Kwa mfano tuliweza kujumuisha kikundi ambacho ni cha Macarpenters, shughuli zao ni carpenters, carpentry. Ambao katika ile shughuli yao kuna taka ama uchafu ambao unatoka katika shughuli zao ni mfano wa sawdust. Lakini baada ya kuojana nao na kuwapatia awareness, walituambia ile sawdust ambayo wanaipata wanaiuza. Lakini katika wanunuza hii uzi yote. Ile nyenge tulipoulizwa anaipeleka wapi? Mkao anaitupa ambao kuchafua mazingira. Tukuonyesha kwamba ile ni mali ya kwamba utafuta njia na tukatafuta soko kama cooperative wapi tunaweza kupata wanunuzi wa ile sodas. Kwa hiyo wale tukawabeba kama washirika wetu ama members wetu kwenye cooperative na pia kwa tuweza kusaidia kupunguza uchafuzi wa mazingira. Vile vile katika awareness hii imetuwezesha kupata vikundi vya kina mama ambao ni wajane ambao shughuli zao nyingi ilikuwa ni hizi vikundi za shughuli za kawaida kama vile merry go round na nini tukaonyesha kwamba tunaposhirikiana tunaweza kuweka mji wetu alikoni ukawa usafi na kwa kuwa kwenye taka kuna thamani basi tukawawezesha kuhamasisha kwamba wajiingize katika eneo shughuli ya ukusanyaji taka na kuangalia zenye thamani ni zipi ili tushiriane kama alikoni west circular cooperative kuweza kupata kipato na tuliweza kupata baadhi ya baadhi ya vikundi kama hivyo ambao asili yake ilikuwa vishuliki kwenye uzioaji taka ama uhifadhi wa mazingira tukaweka kwenye cooperative katika eno cooperative imesaidia kuenua uchumi wa wakazi wa likoni kwa kuwa hata watu binafsi sahi wanashulika katika ile zoezi la kutafuta zile taka ambazo wana ziko na thamani ambazo zinapunguza kiwango cha taka ambazo zote zinaenda kwa dump site kwa hiyo ile tumeweza kuliafiki kama watu walikoni na tumeachieve na tuwashukuru na nadhani pia wawakilishi wa county government ambao wako hapa nadhani wataungana na mimi kwa sahi especially tanguno mwaka uanze kwa sahi kidogo sura ya likoni ni tofauti na sehemu nyingine za county ya Mombasa na malengo tuliko nayo sahi ambayo tunaangalia kwa na mbele kwa ushirikiano wa washirika wetu ambao ni Mombasa County WWF na YWC na Handi na East Africa tunapania kuanzisha ujenzi wa kiwanda cha recycling ambao kitakuwa kinawekea thamani kwenye hizi bidhaa ama taka za plastiki ambao uwezo uno tumesaidiwa na washirika wetu kama nilivyosema Mombasa County wamesaidia na ardhi Handi na East Africa wanasaidia na mashine za shredding na pamoja na WWF pia wamesaidia katika ujenzi wa hicho kiwanda hicho kwa hiyo wakati tutakuwa na kiwanda kama hicho kitakuwa kimesaidia kupunguza ule mzigo wa taka ambao utakuwa unaenda kwenye dump site na ambapo ulikuwa na thamani ndani yake ambayo itakuwa imeinua uchumi wa watu walikoni pia vile kutatokea ajira kwenye viwanda kama vile na pia itapandisha ari na mori wa watu walikoni kujihusisha katika mambo ya hifadhi ya mazingira kwa hayo machache hayo ndio kuhusu likoni West Circle Cooperative Society Sentence. Asante sana bwana Mohamed maybe we can give him another clap and then and then another clap for yourself yeah i know it's been a long mid morning all the way to this afternoon the presentations after presentations I believe you've written down your questions where we will ask our panel at two that. So maybe now we'll be breaking for lunch and then we'll resume at two o'clock. Kindly let's keep time. Then we'll have two presentations, one from the United Nations Environmental Program and then one, another one on partnership and data management by Alex Manguiro and Dr. Innocent. Then thereafter, we'll go to the panel discussion, which will take about uh, half an hour.
alikuwa anakatakata mai kwa ni matimbo alikuwa ni ardhi ambayo iko tambarare kwa hiyo kwa kuna mjengo unaweza kuendelea ikabidi tuje na fikra kama vikundi kupitia kwa nguvu zetu wenyewe tuweze kuweka tambarare hiyo Naitwa Mwanajuma Mfaki kutoka kikundi cha Zaonana Shikadabu na sisi kwetu taka ni mali. kwa majina kamili naitwa Idi Mohamed Eid ama maarufu naitwa Fuad na mimi ndiye chairman wa Likon West Recyclers Cooperative Society Limited ambayo ni cooperative society ambayo imejumuisha vikundi kutoka Likoni sub county na cooperative society yenyewe tulianzisha 2021 mwezi wa kumi na kufikia mwezi wa pili 2022 tukafuru registers tukapata certificates kwa memba lazima kwanza uwe umetoka kwa registers group kwa ground alafu pili uwe umepitia mafunzo ya hand in hand na katika group wenyewe lazima katika shughuli zake katika silsili ya kuhusiana na mambo ya takataka ama waste management miongoni mwa shughuli za kadi group ambazo zinafanya on the ground hand in hand mara kwanza kupata nao kwa tuna tuko na clean up activities kwa community ndio tukapata kujuana na hand in hand kwaja kujintroduce na wao na wakatuelezea kwa kuna mafunzo fulani wanafundisha wanachama ndani ya miezi tisa tuka register na hand in hand kwa wanachama kama washirika wa hand in hand tukapitia kwa hiyo mafunzo ndio baada ya mafunzo tukaja na idea kama vikundi vyote vya likoni ambavyo vimepitia kwa mafunzo ya hand in hand kuja na association na kwa kuwa sote tunahusika na mambo ya waste ama ya takataka na vile tulipata mafunzo ya kuboresha takataka ama ku add value kwenye takataka kona ni uzuri kama utakuwa na association ama cooperative ambayo itahusika na mambo ya takataka ndio tukaja na hiyo idea tukashikamana tukaunda hiyo cooperative societies kwa mambo ambayo tumefaidika katika haya mambo ya hand in hand tumefaidika mambo ya ku, kwanza kujiempower sisi kina mama na kina vijana kwa ujumla tumefundishwa jinsi ya kujitegemea kibiashara mafunzo tofauti tofauti tumepata kama kutengeza vifaa fulani kama ni yogurt kama ni nini tumefundishwa ili tupate biashara ndogo ndogo kama vijana wetu ambao wanakam bure bure mitaani at least wao na kitu cha kujisaidia na, na sisi kina mama pia kuna single parents kuna widowers pia wanajisaidia kwa sababu ya mambo kama yale ambayo kwa tumefundishwa na hand in hand kitu changine ni kuhusu hizi takataka takataka sisi tulikuwa tukiona ni uchafu tunachukua vitu tunachoma hatukujua kama tunachokichoma ni mali ambayo inaweza kusaidia jamii. Vitu kama plastic si kwa tukichoma, makaratasi twachoma. Lakini kwa sasa tangu tupate mafunzo, tulikuwa hatuchomi tena. Tunakuwa sasa tunachagua taka tunazihifadhi, kuna zile tunazotengenezea nazo vitu, kuna kama hizo plastic ambazo tunazi tunazipeleka kwa mitambo zinasagwa zinatengenezwa tena plastic nyingine. Yaani sasa tumeona hizi taka si uchafu, tumeona ni kitu ambacho kina tufaidi sisi wenyewe. Na baada kwa tumepata huo mafunzo ya kuongeza tamani kwenye takataka. Tukaona kweli kuna haja ya kuwa tupate mahali ambayo itakusaidia ku, kusaidia kuweka hiyo tamani kwenye takataka. Na pale tukashauriana kama tunaweza kupata recycling plants. Kwa shauri kuna takataka nyingine ambayo tunaweza ku add value bila kupitia kwa recycling plant kama vile mbolea. Tunaweza kuchukua matakataka ambayo ni organic waste tukaiweka tukapata mbolea. Lakini kuna matakataka mengine kama vile plastiki makaton ambapo mpaka lazima tupate mashine fulani ambayo itatusaidia ku add value katika hizo takataka hizo ndio katika ile mashauri yetu tukapata kwamba tunaweza kupata msaada wa kuletoa hizo mashine ambayo ni shredding na bailing machine changamoto kubwa ikawa ni kimali ya ardhi kama vile tunasema vikundi vyetu ni bado ni vidogo havina uwezo wa kupata ardhi na ardhi ni swala sugu katika upande wa likoni kwa hiyo tukakaa chini na Mombasa county tukawaomba kama anaweza kutusaidia na ardhi kuandikia mabarua na kutujibu akatukubali kwamba tutawatupatia umiliki wa area ambayo ni shona dumping side ambayo ndio ile area ambayo tuko sahihi ambayo iko chini ya umiliki wa Mombasa County 
wakatupatia makatasi kwamba wameturuhusu kufanya shughuli zetu za recycling hapa. Na kama vile mnavyoona area yetu vile iko ni kwamba kulikuwa na quarry activities kwa zinaendelea hapa. Watu walikuwa nakata kata mai, kwa ni matimbo walikuwa ni ardhi ambayo iko tambarare. Kwa hiyo kwa kuna mjengo unaweza kuendelea. Ikabidi tuje na fikra kama vikundi kupitia kwa nguvu zetu wenyewe tuweze kuweka tambarare hiyo sehemu iko ndio mjengo uweze kuendelea. Ndio shule ambayo inaendelea sasa hii na shule yenyewe imechukua takriban miezi miwili. E, kwa sasa hii ile land ambayo tumekuwa allocated na Mombasa County ni 50 by 200 feet. Recycling plant ambayo tunataka kwa ujumla iwe na shughulikia na mambo atakataka yote. Na kama kutakuwa na uwezekano basi kuwa hakuna takataka ambayo itakuwa inatupwa yote itakuwa tumeitafutia njia ya kuiongezea thamani yake ama kuitengezea bidhaa nyingine ambayo itakuwa inafaa kwa jamii. Mfano kama plastic. Sasa hivi tunataka kuanza plastic zile plastic ngumu ngumu tu tunazikata ndogo ndogo alafu tunaziuza kwa wale wenye viwanja vya kuchemsha plastiki na kutengeneza kama vile mabeseni, matank na hizi chupa ndogo ndogo za maji pia tunakuwa tunafanya bailing na tu tunaozia na hizi carton. Lakini malengo yetu makubwa ni kwamba hizo shughuli zote zote tu tunaweza kuzifanya kwenye kiwanda chetu. Lakini kama tutakuwa sisi wengine ndio tunasaga. Alafu sisi wenyewe pengine Mwenyezi Mungu atujalie tuweze kutengeneza hapa hapa hizo plastic zetu. Hapo tutakuwa tunapata benefits nyingi zaidi ya kuile kuuza. Kila group itakuwa na sehemu yake ya ku display zile shughuli ama products ambao amefanya kule mashinani. Kwa shauri shughuli zote atakuwa tuzifanyia hapa. Kuna shughuli nyingine ambazo zitakuwa zinaendelea mashinani. Kama kutengeneza vitu vya samani kama vile artifacts. kama cooperative society tungeomba pia kama utapata msaada kutoka kwa shirika wetu ambao watatusaidia tufanye marketing ya cooperative yetu kwa hiyo mitandao ya kijamii na tupate pia mafunzo ya vipi tutatumia kuboresha biashara yetu Ningependa kuwashukuru Ali na Ani kwa ujio wao katika area yetu Alikoni kwa shauri wameweza kutupanua mawazo yetu kuhusu mambo ya takataka na pia wametupatia ufahamu mwingi kuhusiana na utendaji biashara, ufanyaji biashara. Pia katika ule ufadhili wametusaidia nao. Kwa sasa hivi watu wetu kuseme ni wafadhili tunaita ni washirika. Kwa sababu si wakati tunafadhiliwa sana sana wa kuthamini kile kitu wa si rais. Eh, au value kile kitu kwa shauri tunasema ni cha fulani ndo alituletea. Lakini wakati tunashirikiana na yeye anafanya hivi na yeye anafanya hili, lakini msaada ule ametupa ni msaada mkubwa ambao sisi wenyewe peke yetu singeweza. Kuanzia kuform hiyo cooperative paka kuja na hizo recycling e, plant pia hiyo ni msaada mkubwa sana tunataka kuwashukuru hadi ni hadi na tunataka kujenga udugu hadi nani iwapo watakuwa Mombasa ama itakuwa pengine shughuli zao za Mombasa zinaisha na kule ambao kwa watakuwa wameenda bado tutakuwa tunashirikiana nao vile vile
Hello, I believe we are now set. We, we are full on e of energy now. So the first presentation will be from Alex Mwanguiro from the United Nations Environmental Program. Thereafter, it will be followed by Partnership and Data Management by Dr. Innocent from Comrade. Then we go into the panel discussion. I'm still in receipt of all the questions. You can send it to me. I already have one here, so it's, um, I'm actually highly welcoming them. So you can still note it down across board. Every speaker that spoke since uh, around 11 up to now. Okay. So um, maybe we can text our friends who are not here yet. Otherwise, we can begin. I'm in your hands. <laughs> yeah. You can start with the introduction. <laughs> so maybe we can give them one minute or two, and then Alex can begin. And then also I can steal this opportunity to tell you something about also what GIZ is doing in Mombasa under the component of a covenant of mayors of Saharan Africa. I know Dr. Tari mentioned that they already assigned to an agreement uh, between GIZ and the county government of Mombasa. So normally for we work with counties. So, so far we are working with six counties in Kenya and six countries in Africa. And we support county government on climate resilience, climate action, and energy-related projects. We have three projects that we are actually pushing here in Mombasa with the county government of Mombasa. So one is called uh, Urban Smart Energy, which is more on the renewable energy and energy efficiency services. We are also doing the Carbon Lab, which is a co-creation space which enables stakeholders here in Mombasa to identify issues, resolve, give them solution, and link them to a financing option. So far, we've been in Mombasa now for about, this is after the agreement was signed, it was signed in May. So this is our fourth month. And GIZ has one focal person here in Mombasa who will be resuming full time soon. And that person is myself. Uh, so I'll be here with the team. And happy to be here today to get to know the topics that are affecting Mombasa. Actually, it's also a good learning program for me. I know a team member from JICA also is still working on assessing issues here in Mombasa. So I think we can begin now. Thank you so much for that time I've taken to give you a brief about GIZ. I can still give more when we meet after the, 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 the dialogue. Now I'm welcoming Alex to take over. Karibu Alex, uh, his presentation is just getting loaded. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Next one. Okay, I'm just going to give you a brief about the UNEA resolution, uh, which catapulted the issue of uh, ending towards, I mean, ending plastic pollution in the world, and how countries want to come together and probably have a treaty or a convention to make sure that at least globally this issue can be looked at and agreed upon and resolved. So, next slide please. But before we go to the INC process, which is the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee process, I'll just give you a little bit of background. I mean, on average, uh, like everyone else has been saying, 57% of the solid waste management uh, is biodegradable, organic, and which is just dumped indiscriminately all over the place. Next slide, please. 
-hmm. And our collection rates are not that good. If we could improve our collection rates, maybe our cities, our environments would look much better and less of a nuisances, but that is not the case. Uh, next slide, please. And 90% of the waste generated is just thrown all over the place. I mean, this is not a good picture at all. Next slide, please. When we talk of recyclables, 4% of what is generated can only be recycled. Uh, not only because it cannot, but the capacity, the capabilities, institu institutional arrangements, and even the design of the plastic, some of the plastic cannot be recycled because it has not been decide, designed for recycling. And our consumption patterns are, in, are going up and up, and weak collection systems, and as a result, pollution is with us till forever. Next slide, please. Indiscriminate dumping in urban areas, disease, flooding, environmental pollution, uh, open burning, impacts on health. I mean, I've been hearing over lunch that uh, in Mombasa, you actually have an increase of uh, respiratory uh, infections. And all this is because probably indiscriminate dumping, open, dump, uh, open burning, because when that burns, uh, you have a lot of things that are mixed in the dump sites. There's plastic, dioxins and furans are carcinogenic, they are emitted. You have e-waste, where you have lead, mercury, and other uh, elements that also impact negatively, especially for children. They retard their learning capacities. They are neurotoxins. So you have all these uh, pollution aspects from simple burning and dumping. And I think we need to change the mindset because usually people think the best way of getting rid of a problem is just to burn it. I think those days are gone. We cannot solve problems by burning. Next slide, please. And I think in most other countries, they still live in corona times where COVID is still there. Fortunately, I think there's somebody up there who looked at Africa. Yes, we have lost people to, we, no, we have lost people. I, I even have family that have lost to Corona, but it's nothing like what the Western world has seen. Yeah? It's just a drop in the ocean. So you have a lot of waste generation coming, single use coming from uh, pandemics. And this doesn't make the situation easier at all. Next slide, please. So what can we do? I mean, there's need for viable resources. Uh, this is an economy that can be tapped into. Money can be made. People can earn jobs. I mean, we've had some very good case studies about the informal sector, but there are ways that they can be, it can be done. Uh, just a few case studies of uh, some best practices in other countries where they are finding ways of dealing with, uh, it, yeah, with issues of plastic, reusing um, school bags and whatever. And it's a cycle. Uh, we need to bring waste under control. But how do we do that? We need to harness the opportunities of waste as a resource. There is money. When you talk of money, people listen. Next slide, please. So harnessing opportunities of waste is an economic resource. We need to integrate secularity, uh, which is why we are here in talking about the secular economy. And we need to national development plans and budgets that are uh, in tandem with this transitioning uh, to a secular economy. Next slide, please. Policy frameworks. I mean, we need to the small, medium enterprises 
to be empowered. There's transparency in, cons in, in consumer information. EPR policies that are, and deposit schemes that are conducive, and not this carrot and uh, stick approach where you don't do this, you get penalized, assist people to do it. Campaigns for consumers, changing of mindsets, all this, and even economic instruments. I mean, we had the bank with us here today, and I think that is one of the best information that I received, that they are saying, you don't have money, we have the money, talk to us. And I think you all should be having bilaterals with this guy, because he has the money, he can actually make your programs implementable. Actually, I am going to use him because Kenyans have been asking me for waste management and whatever. UNEP doesn't, is not a donor. We don't have the funds. So we will direct him to this guy. Yeah. Go talk to him and see if he can get funds to do A, B, C, D. Next slide, please. So I think we also hit quite a lot. There's also organizations hand in hand and um, not NORAD and others that the issue of retooling, reskilling, awareness raising, and knowledge sharing. We need, people need to relearn or learn how to do things properly. The informal sector, just getting them, I think WWF also does it, train them how best they can improve the quality of their resource. Not just take it dirty and they want to earn money from it. No, improve it. Make it quality so that at least it feeds back and into the system and it's a good resource from which money can be earned. How to access financing uh, for the secular economy? We just said that. Next slide, please. So now, we have this intergovernmental negotiating committee process where the resolution was passed and the governments came together, agreed, and in Dakar was the first meeting of the open-ended working group where they set out rules of procedure and a schedule of what was going to happen when. Uh, and there were also a lot of multi-stakeholder dialogues uh, no one entity can deal with the issue of pollution alone. We have to act together. Next slide, please. So, according to the ANC process, uh, end of November, there's going to be the first meeting of the INC, which is going to be in Uruguay. And uh, the second meeting is scheduled for some time in 2023. Then you have a third meeting. Well, at least by 2024, they are hoping that at least there will be a treaty uh, or some form of framework that part, um, member states, countries have agreed upon. Next slide, please. And what are going to be the elements of this global treaty? I mean, all the issues we are discussing here, I think... Negotiation is not a process that starts at the meeting. It's a process that starts maybe two years before in counties, looking at what, is, what are the priorities, so that you give information, you give fodder to your negotiators, to your ambassadors, so that now, when there is this global treaty um, INC process, they know how to negotiate, where to give in, where not to give in, and what to target. So these are just some of the elements that they need to be cognizant of when they go negotiating. Next slide, please. And I think the need for capacity building, uh, technical, financial, and both, I mean, I know people only talk of uh, binding uh, instruments. Does it really have to be binding? It can also be voluntary. I mean. You, people in countries do things differently. In some countries, you, you use the stick approach. In some countries, you know, you cajole. <laughs> yeah? You play together, and maybe that is what works. So each country will find a way of what works for them. Next slide, please. 
well, I could go on and on and on. And I think while, I'm st while I still have the mic, I just want to address an issue that uh, I think our colleague, are you from WWF? No, 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 you. You are from? Petco, okay. You talked about the issue of uh, uh, not, not, of not using, of, of minimizing uh, usage. That can be very tricky. I think uh, Waziri, when we were in Afri cities, there was a question from Somalia saying, okay, we have all these recycling companies. When you talk reduce, 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 what are we going to do with all these companies? Where are we going to get the fodder? Where are we going to get the substance? Because when it comes to recycling, there is the issue of quantity. And when you have the material recycling facilities, they produce quantities uh, that feed into the recycling processes. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Alex, for that elaborate presentation on the whole aspect. Then uh, next we'll be having our, I would say, almost final present presenter, that is Dr. Innocent. But before then, we, I'm just making an announcement. Actually, this event is online, or it's live on Facebook and Twitter. And it's at Comrade, at Comrade, at Comrade, C-O-M-R-E-E-D. So you can actually go there and then follow, like, and also share with your team members or friends so that we, they get, we get the traffic needed. So now the next is actually Dr. Innocent. Uh, and then thereafter, we'll go for the panel discussion. So keep, keep writing your questions. I've already received one, just keep drafting them. After this, we'll be having uh, a forum to ask them all the questions that we need. Thank you. Uh, for some reason, I, I think the, the managers decided that I present after lunch. <laughs> From the size of the plate that some of us had, I don't know if we shall follow, but uh, we shall try. Maybe I'll ask for energizer from uh, when now is here again. Yeah, so my name is Innocent Wanyonyi uh, from Comrade. Uh, uh, Comrade is Coastal and Marine Resources Development. It, it's not Comrade. And um, I, I'm here to present some work that we've been doing. I'm in charge of uh, 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 sustainable cities and uh, port initiative that we are having in Comrade, where we are trying to get cities to go towards uh, uh, um, uh, smart cities and live in harmony with the marine environment. So the, the work I'm going to present is actually a partnership between Comrade and so many other institutions, including, of course, the county government of Mombasa and the city authorities of uh, Ithikwini in South Africa. Uh, we, uh, we worked on an initiative called the Smart and Sustainable Transitioning for Coastal Cities in the Face of Global Environmental Change. And uh, in the process of doing that, we also looked at uh, prototyping transformative change through action research approach. The idea here is that um, the costs are facing immense pressures from, from different sources. And uh, if we continue doing stuff the way we are doing right now, these changes are going to overtake us. And uh, it's even more worse that uh, some drivers of change, like um, uh, population and um, uh, 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 sea level rise, become more intense when we have climate change. So 
We also have other drivers that we are more concerned with today, uh, like uh, solid waste management. It's a problem for everyone. Any city has this problem. So that, that doesn't make Mombasa any worse than anybody else. It's just that Mombasa city, the government has acknowledged and it has prioritized solid waste as an issue. So in the course of thinking about that, we, we together with the, all the partners there, conceptualized what we are calling Mijibora. So Mijibora is just the name of those many uh, terminologies in, in a snapshot, okay? Uh, what is the cue? Yeah. So what we, we are looking at here is that uh, we thought, since it's an action research, we had to first look at what are the causes of problems in cities. And uh, the causes of uh, problems were identified as uh, waste management, among others. Now, we, when we went to look at the problem of waste, we looked at the status of waste, what infrastructure is there, and who are the players in the waste sector, and what are their key concerns, and how is then the waste affecting our marine environment because of uh, the approach we are taking. Then. Uh, we wanted to learn from the best, so we arranged for the county authorities to learn from the city of Durban on how they are managing their waste. So we've had three interactions so far, one to Durban and one to here, and then when COVID hit, we did uh, an online interaction. Then uh, we also wanted to look at uh, how the placement of things are in the landscape because of the spatial uh, con context. And uh, we did a map of all the green spaces in Mombasa and vis-a-vis -vis what is expected to be seen. And finally, we went to a session with the stakeholders in each of those problem areas to vision what they want to see in future. So today I will only present what we did in the solid waste management sector. And then finally, from that vision, because it's an action research, we started implementing some of the recommendations that uh, were coming up in the research. It has been a three-year project, and uh, it's ending now, so this is just one of the results. Next. So during the revisioning process, we asked our participants, and I think 70% are here, what the situation is. And the biggest problem we were having is uh, pollution. Pollution, solid waste is a big deal, uh, sea level rise, and um, most importantly is that we were all working on these problems, but as if nobody else exists. So the issue we identified in Mijibora is the silo mentality approach uh, of operation. So we wanted to see where we want to be, and everyone there agreed that they want to see a green city where everything works in a smart manner and in an interactive way. Politicians are interacting with everybody, and policies are in place, and, um, and uh, there is a connection rather than disconnect between people. And we want to see spaces where there is proper waste management and spaces where there is uh, uh, proper transport movement. So at that point, we decided to implement uh, an initiative which uh, I can as well call for all the uh, waste uh, problems that we have identified. We've been trying to go in with solutions like putting infrastructure, uh, collecting waste, cleaning the cities. That is not enough. The, uh, the initiative we have done is like the software of everything that uh, has been happening in Mombasa. So the uh, actors, first of all, uh, had a session where we had uh, a dialogue like this today. And it's a very important turning point, that meeting that we held together with Hand in Hand and WWF, because that was the day we decided that every year, we are going to have a dialogue to discuss the issue of waste in Mombasa. 
That dialogue that we held in February was an eye opener in that we saw the graphic status of uh, Mombasa, how serious the West is and how we are not able to manage it with the way we are doing things at the moment. We saw the magnitude of waste. I think it's around 900, uh, 900 tons uh, per day production and barely 30% is being reutilized. And uh, we, we, we were sitting with the recyclers there and they were quite amazed that if the, all this waste is available, why is it not getting to us? So you see there's a problem, but still the solution is right in the house, just like the session we had in the morning. So that was the eye opener we had in the dialogue in, the, in, in February. And at the end of the dialogue, a decision was made to establish what we call the Mombasa Smart City Forum. Then um, later on in the year, we got into another partnership with uh, Boost, a program of Close the Gap, and uh, we called what we are calling the techies to try and find solutions to three of these problems. And they were taken through an incubation project with, um, with Boost, and uh, they were able to learn how to then turn their grand ideas into solutions. I think one of the guests at that session was the ICT director for the county government of, Depart of Mombasa, and he decided to take, I think, two initiatives that he would want to be incorporated into the county system. Then uh, finally, towards uh, the mid of this year, we went into the session for activating the technical working group of concern. Next. So how did we do this? We, we, we looked at the real structure of the Smart City Forum, and you can see that in the blue section, in the forum assembly section, we have representation from the national government entities and all the key departments from the county government and civil society organizations and the private sector and also community members. But most importantly, on this structure, we have identified the themes that are important to address and solid waste is one of them. So we set up a technical working group on solid waste management right on the bottom area. So next. If we can see what the technical working group on solid waste did is that they identified the kind of things they want to see happening in Mombasa. For the number one priority, they wanted to see a circular economy uh, where there is improved waste management infrastructure. So then we had facilitation from Cordio. Uh, this section we did it in partnership with Cordio. And um, we looked at where does this fall? And uh, it was equivalent to uh, SDG number 11. So the next important thing they wanted to see was behavioral change. Behavioral change in terms of how we manage waste. And uh, when we ask NEMA today, what should we do? We do more awareness. When awareness is just to address behavioral change. So then SDG number four becomes an important focus for the solid waste management group in Mombasa. And the third one that uh, I can point at is maybe SDG number um, 8, 15, and uh, 12. So each of these are linked to an initiative that uh, the technical working group is trying to focus. So just that activity alone gave us relevance on a global scale because we are working locally, but these things are understandable on a global scale. So let's see what the technical working group did in the next slide. Uh, the, the next one. Next. So the technical working group went and assessed what the problem issues are in Mombasa, and they were articulated very well. Is it, is it over? 
yeah, I knew it was not over. <laughs> so, currently in Mombasa, and when I say currently, it means from the time we began until 2021. As at 2021, the position of Mombasa is that the infrastructure for waste management was wanting. The, there was unharmonized uh, legislations and uh, legal instruments in terms of waste management. There was a lot of uh, haphazard efforts in addressing waste and uh, there was also limited collection especially in Nyali and, uh, and, and Mvita area. And then there was very little utilization of technology in addressing waste, as well as there was no centralized actual data on waste in Mombasa. That was the position as at 2021 when we were doing this. So the technical working group uh, that prepared this wanted to see a Mombasa in future where there's recycling centers in place, where there's effective circular economy, and uh, the, where there's positive uh, behavior and attitude among the public, and uh, an economy which is thriving. At the end of the day, it's about the economy. They also want to see uh, Mombasa where the solid waste management system is sustainable and available data and good political goodwill and also a smart and green city of Mombasa where there is technology and innovation as the basis for managing waste. So that is the perfect future for Mombasa and that is the f status for Mombasa. So what did they decide to do to get to the perfect future? This is the action plan that the Solid Waste Management Group has and uh, the first one is that uh, they are focusing on research and data collection as a priority. They are also focusing on developing the infrastructure for waste management, uh, supporting material recovery facilities, supporting waste collection, waste handling, and so on, along the waste value chain. Then they are also focusing on uh, enabling uh, legislation and uh, technology and innovation as well as uh, uh, putting in appropriate policies. For example, at that time, Mombasa was already thinking about EPR. I think the national government has just brought it up last year. Then they're also focusing on regulations to ban uh, hazardous uh, manufacturing processes. So those are the actions that are planned by the team, the technical working group in Mombasa. And I'll just show one of the highlights of these activities that focuses on the use of, um, of, of, of uh, technology. So together with, uh, with Blue Economy Innovation Hub and Boost, we hosted this hackathon for solid waste management where we provided a framework through which innovators can get access to the proper networks to test their prototypes. So we provided an opportunity whereby they got incubation at Close the Gap to, they stayed for almost six weeks being mentored and trained on how to develop business ideas that can then market them and uh, uh, bring back income to them. And uh, finally, it was also an opportunity for them to, to get networked with, with similar initiatives by other innovators that uh, were existing. So that is just an example of uh, how uh, the networks have been utilized in Mombasa in solid waste management. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Innocent, for the elaborate mission with uh, Mijibor. So next phase now is on the panel discussion. So I've received uh, uh, a number of questions. Anyone who still have, and then I can, be, I can pick it. 
So we'll be having a panel of seven so far. Then you can, we can ask them the question and then they'll respond. We may also want to take maybe three or more extra from here and also one from the online team members. So any questions written? Okay. Okay. Anyone else with the written? Okay. Uh, so maybe we can begin with the first ones, which already been shared. And now let me welcome the first panelist, because most of the questions goes to him, uh, Dr. Karibu, Dr. Net. <laughs> Then also we are welcoming uh, the other panel, John Mungai from JICA. Then we have Jumuya uh, County Zapwani, uh, Gladys, and then Kenya Plastic Park, Ebenezer Hamadi. Then. Kenya Association of Waste Recyclers, Karibu, Buana Richard, and then we have Likoni Cooperative Waste Recyclers Cooperative Limited, Buana Hidi Mohammed, Karibu. Uh, we have also Alex Manguiro, Karibu. So the first question actually uh, is from one Mr. Arafat. Uh, Actually, he's asking about how many people are currently employed along the entire value chain of waste management from generation to disposal. This will be a multi-panel answer. So I know it cuts across the county government. It also cuts across the waste, waste recyclers. So maybe I can start. We can start with. A team member is ready. Yeah, question. Oh. So the question is, how many people are currently employed along the entire value chain of waste management from generation to disposal? So how many people are currently engaged in the whole value chain cycle of waste management, right from uh, generation all the way to disposal? We can start with Dr. I think that's a very difficult uh, question. But then it raises some issues that I think we have overlooked. And uh, one of them is that uh, we haven't been very good with the, the issues of data management. So you cannot quickly say that we have this number of people across the, the entire value chain. It is, it's a difficult question to, to, to answer, I would say. And, uh, but then there lies the opportunity for us to streamline our data management system. But uh, just to give you an indication, I think um, I pointed earlier that um, uh, the ones who are involved in collection that we have in our record is about 1,700. But we have a feeling that probably about 1,000 are not in our record. Those are the ones who are involved in the collection alone. Then um, the pyramid, of course, goes and uh, the, the numbers who are involved in processing and the rest reduces. But we don't have a figure that we can say this is, this is the figure. So I can't tell you it is 10,000, 11,000. It's, it's difficult. But I feel challenged that uh, we need to document that and see this sector is engaging and has employed how many people. Or 
right, thank you. Uh, Alex? Yeah, Ebenez? Uh, you almost baptized me by, with a different name. Uh, but that's fine. Uh, uh, just to add on to what Dr. Harry mentioned, uh, and, and I think that's, that's a good question that should be answered once a research is conducted so that we can be able to know how many people have been employed through uh, the value chain. Because as, as you rightfully mentioned, it begins from uh, the, the disposal, uh, the collection, uh, treatment, and finally, what we recommend as a 5% to go to the, to the landfill. And of course, the landfill, should, I mean, the, the recommendation is, should be that it should be um, uh, an engineered uh, landfill. Uh, but I think I also saw a study that showed that uh, while adopting circularity uh, in the world, uh, there is a potential of about two trillion US dollars uh, to be generated. Um, uh, so that's a good potential to create jobs. Uh, there's also another study that was being conducted by RTI. Uh, just last week I went to a stakeholders uh, meeting that was looking at green jobs. Uh, but green jobs specifically within the renewable energy space. Uh, so they were looking at um, uh, wind, uh, hydro, and all, and all that, including solar PV. So in, in this context, I think it will be a, a good question to pose. And, and I think one of the presenters today talked about the triple helix uh, model, which is a very good one that puts together the academia, uh, government, and industry. And, and I think it was a question for Mombasa or uh, Kenya? So if it's for Mombasa, then I think that will be a good starting point to kickstart that discu discussion. I would say it's more Mombasa, I believe. It's more, because this is a sec sector dialogue for Mombasa County. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I was trying to look uh, to my right where the um, lady from uh, Jumuiya, you know, the, the, the name Jumia <laughs> just messes off my mind because it goes to <laughs> Jumia Africa Mashariki. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So that would be a great point to start. I uh, think that other panelists can also contribute. Kulengana na swali lolizu wa kusu, you know, sekte meajiri watu wangapi. Nikizumzia upande wa cooperative wa mboi kobezi likoni, Nia, kama vile bwana wazira amesema hakuna complete data ambayo inapatikana lakini sisi kama Likon West tunaweza kusema tuko na ile data ambayo inaeleza membership ambayo ni ajira tayari amepata hiyo inaitwa self employment ambayo anafanya shughuli ni ajira kwa hiyo kwa sahi kama Likon West wale ambao wamepata ajira katika hiyo sekta hiyo sahi tuko na 500 ambayo ni wanatoka katika hizo groups CBOs and self help groups Na kama vile nivueleza kwanza pia kuna wale jamii ambu wameweza kubaliana kwa kuambatia na mfumo wa sorting from the source ambu tayari hiyo pia ni ajira. Kwa shauri wakufanya yo sorting, the recyclable materials wanapo tuuzia. Nizu wamepata kipato. Data kama hiyo ndo badu watuna, lakini data hili ambu tunawona ni members zetu ambu na washirikana na wawo ni yo 500 kufikia sahi. Okay, mimi pia na, nafikiria nita, nita sema zile vitu ambazo najua. Kitu ya kwanza najua, UN Habitat 2019 wamesema tuna generate waste per capita ya, is it JICA ama ni UN, ya 4 point something, close to half a kilo, isn't it? So if we are 48 million in Kenya, then we are generating like 24 million kilograms of waste every day. Then we are told that we collect like uh, 60 and recycle 30. 
But uh, having said that, it's a fact that we don't have data and a serious deficiency because now when, I, when we look at uh, the representation that we have here and the capacity that we have to do those kind of things like learn a national data, I don't think it's a big problem. I just think we, we, we lack focus where that is concerned. What I want to say also because I got the opportunity to speak is to commend what the, the county government of Mombasa has done. Because based on what we got here today, and uh, I am among the people who took photo of that uh, particular slide, is that uh, the county government at least has an idea of what is happening and the people who are involved. So when the question was asked, because this is a very difficult question, frankly, I was imagining how about if each county had the same data? You know, automatically we are able to get the answer. Yeah, so I think that is my answer. Thank you, our panelists. Uh, the next one actually is more of a follow-up on the first question. <laughs> it's more of a projection of the jobs that will be created in the next four to four years, in the maybe year 2023 to year 27. So the, actual, uh, the question is coming in this way. Uh, on, the, on the West, on the investment, actually with the investment in improved collection, recycling, and disposal of waste, how many more jobs will be created over the next four years? I think this can be all a cross-board uh, answer. And then the next question also is about the size in dollars of the waste management sector of Mombasa, Mombasa, and then which or which organization makes the most money? Is it clear? So, uh, so the the question it's asking who in quotes eh, which organization makes the most money? Yeah. yeah. Most money. I guess it's profits. Yeah. So let me also go to the third question. And then we can have the first round of response. And then the next one is more on the gender diversity and inclusivity. It's more general, no specific sector targeted. So how do you ensure gender inclusivity and integration in the waste management sector? So how do we ensure that we include uh, this uh, gender and in inter inclusivity in waste management across? This would be upstream or downstream. So, so far we have three questions uh, shared. Uh, let's get response to that and then we go. We still have one, two, three, five more to go. Let's start with uh, Alex. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, uh, wonderful questions. They are so difficult, but they are all inter I think they are all interlinked. Because I think when there is uh, the provision or the establishment of national plans on waste management by the county, uh, it will include an inventory of the waste streams that are in the, in, the, in the county, and an inventory of who is doing what with respect to which waste stream. So as a result, you would have um, a database on the companies or those that have registered or those that need to register uh, in the secularity, in the management of waste. And we are not only talking about plastic, Let's talk about all the waste streams that can be, um, that come out in the, that are in the county. Paper, metals, uh, glass, plastic, e-waste, um, and organic. So all the waste streams, I think probably at the county level, they should have a database of who is involved in the dealing with which type of waste, which industries, and as a result, this will actually help to, uh, to answer most of the questions, even also gender-based, because you will have a gender-based um, 
database as to the people that are involved in each of these sector industries. And you also uh, see the size of the, of the industry and even who is making a lot of money. You will see from there because uh, you will have an insight into the inflows, into their business, uh, depending on the licensing structures and everything else. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think um, <laughs> which organization is making the most money? Uh, since we have uh, two companies here, <laughs> uh, I think we have Jill Industries and Double Roman. Uh, maybe this question will have been asked to them so that we have an indication. Because these are very private questions that uh, government wouldn't want to to go into asking the companies because they think we will be asking them for the purpose of taxing. So I think it's very difficult to answer this question. And I'm also suspecting that the one who is asking either is a player in the field or wants to know who will be the biggest competitor. <laughs> so I don't want to go in that direction. In terms of uh, how many jobs uh, the sector will create for the next four years, this still responds to uh, the data problem. I don't think we know. Uh, but what we can give is an indication of what are the areas. For me, I think uh, the biggest uh, uh, section of the value chain that will employ more people is in the collection. Because I think this is the most manual, most uh, 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 expensive uh, uh, process in, in the waste management value chain. So if we look at the numbers who will be employed across the value chain, I would say that waste collection alone should actually get the biggest uh, percentage of the proportion of, 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 of the jobs created. And uh, since the trend now, not only in Mombasa, but I believe in other counties, is for the counties to relinquish the role of collection to private companies, individuals, community-based organizations, and the rest. So I'm projecting that in the next four years, we'll have a steady increase of those who are um, earning meaningfully from from collection. And then of course, in Mombasa now, the companies are coming up, uh, uh, those ones who are aggregating and uh, processing or pre-processing. Uh, right now, we, they may not be big, but I think um, they could be employing maybe around 20 to 40 people, I'm not sure, uh, per company. If you, we have about seven or so, so you can get an indication of what uh, uh, the numbers we are dealing with. But uh, most of these ones, uh, companies are probably managing about four to five tons of, of, of plastics per day. So considering that um, uh, we are looking at about 80 tons per day being managed in the next one or so years, it can give you an indication of how many people this industry will engage. So uh, that, that is, is a place where um, uh, money is and jobs are. When it comes to what, uh, the name, what uh, Nani Richard mentioned about the converters, the ones who are making products, I think right now we probably have one or two, I think one only in the county, so we can't say that it has employed many. But then we have a new market that will come, um, I mean a new sector that will come marketing the products that have been made from, from recycling. So we are likely to have a few people also employed in that sector. So that's the trend, but I think collection will still be employing more people. In terms of uh, gender diversity and inclusivity, uh, just, just look at the room, because all these are stakeholders <laughs> in waste management. And you get a very fair representation of both gender. This, I can assure you, is replicated in uh, other sectors. I remember in 2018 or 2019, if I'm not wrong, we had a whole dialogue just for women. Uh, encourage them because they are, when you look at how waste is generated, they are probably the first managers of waste because most of our waste is household, it's generated in the kitchen. So we know that uh, gender, uh, you may look at it from the top, uh, managers, that's why it may not be fair representation, but if you cut across, I can tell you that the sector has fairly good representation of both gender across the value chain. 
if you look at Mr. Green alone, I was discussing this at tea break. The company may sound like it is a men company, but every member they send to Mombasa is always a lady. So you, the, the ladies are in play in, in, in West Management, I will say. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to confine myself to two issues. Uh, first is uh, the projection of uh, growth in the industry in the next four years, and I will agree with Waziri that uh, taking advantage of the Sustainable uh, Solid Waste Management Act, which requires that m county governments must establish material recovery uh, facilities, then we envisage that companies that will be aggressive in the near future uh, will be able to make a lot of profits and employ uh, a lot of people. So there will be a steady rise of employment in the sector. On the issue of gender inclusivity, uh, as, as donor uh, uh, organization, when we formulate projects that touch on community at the grassroots level, we ha must have a component of gender mainstreaming. So sometimes it's a matter of uh, policy within the organization. I think I wanted to confine myself to those two issues. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the three gentlemen have already answered the question, but let me attempt just to add a little bit of cherry on the on the on the on, uh, on the cake. Um, to begin, you talked about the growth of jobs in the next four years, uh, and to be able to answer that, I also asked my question, uh, a question to myself: What would be the level of investment? Because jobs will go hand in hand with the level of investment. So I see with the uh, National Sustainable Waste Management Act, uh, as well as now the draft EPR, because you're anticipating that uh, producer responsibility organizations will be uh, formed, though they are voluntary uh, PROs, they will be mandatory PROs. So, and, and so the level of investment will not happen uh, within the first two uh, or three years. So I, I think we'll be able to bear the fruit in, uh, let's say, four to the next five years. But I see an increase in investment in uh, plastics, uh, and then um, organic waste. Uh, another big one is also uh, electronics, uh, because that's where we have, we have a shift to clean or green energy where we have mostly use of uh, uh, photovoltaic uh, kind of solar PV and th the moment those panels stop working then we'll anticipate to have an increase in uh, level of waste. Um, but looking at the level of investment, if I'm to look at uh, a similar company, let's say that um, uh, does f fish farming, uh, with an annual turnover of about uh, ten million dollars, uh, so it means that the level of investment needs to be higher than that. So um, each company probably will be investing between one million to about ten million dollars um, in 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 that sense because there's requirement for heavy machinery, uh, requirement for a dis I mean collection. So that's your, probably your distribution channel. Um, uh, in a study that we did in Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Malawi, of course, we saw that organic waste is the highest of uh, between 50 to 60 percent in terms of uh, uh, quantity. Uh, so I, th I think using this, the same kind of metrics, we also know that in, in if you do the characterization of waste, that should be similar in what we are seeing in, in Kenya. So it will not vary between 50 to 60 percent. Uh, the next one, of course, is plastics, uh, which comes in between uh, 10 to about 17 percent. Uh, so that's, that's more or less like an, um, a range uh, that we're seeing. So that's why I was saying in those particular streams, that's where we'll see uh, heavy kind of investments. Um, who makes more 
uh, money uh, in the value chain. I think it's a person who creates value or does value addition. That's a person who gets the most. Uh, I see Kainika is right here and he has always been having this conversation of uh, what is a fair value to pay to the waste pickers, right? And uh, I was in another, uh, Kainika was also there, and the researchers were talking about uh, that particular question that the waste pickers are not paid uh, according to the market rate. And the question I asked them, what is the market rate? They hadn't, I, I didn't see in their research mentioning that this will be the fair price for them to pay. And you see that plays in again uh, within, if you look at economics, that's demand and supply. So, so that's the, the, the factor uh, on price. So I think there are s s a number of issues that we need to, to address as we, as we go forward uh, to be able to, one, again, when you talk about jobs, the other th question that I have in mind is, is it a decent job, right? And what is the definition of a decent job? Uh, because if you're not able to put food on the table, uh, the level of hygiene in terms of your equipments uh, and even the peace of mind for you waking up to say, I'm going to work, um, those are also key, key factors. So we might create jobs, yes, but again, the other question that might hit us, are they decent jobs? So. Uh, but slowly, Kenya is moving to the right direction in terms of uh, shifting from a linear to a circular economy. And you are seeing an increase in uh, the number of jobs. Uh, in terms of gender inclusivity, uh, same thing. I think we also, that particular research also showed in Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi. In Kenya, we did one, but for electronic waste, uh, but for large household appliances. So we see uh, so many women are... Um, within this waste sector, but uh, they're mostly um, within what we call uh, the waste pickers, uh, but not higher up in the organizational chain. Uh, then if you look at the other thing where we talk about women-led businesses versus women-owned businesses, then you find the women-led businesses are more than the women-owned businesses because those are two different things. A women-led organization basically means it's a woman at the peak or the apex leading the organization. But a wo woman-owned means that the major shareholder is a woman. And, um, but it's progressive. Uh, gender inclusivity... <laughs> In fact, nowadays, I normally have this conversation and say it's the boy child who has been left behind in, in <laughs> certain areas uh, because uh, there has been the conversation on um, uh, the gender parity and, and trying to bridge the gap. Uh, but of course, we have not yet uh, reached the, the um, scale to which the Constitution uh, basically says, um, but the, the Constitution again puts it very clearly and, and I like the way it puts it, it says that either of the gender should uh, at least have um, a third. So it means both, uh, both ways. Uh, that's my contribution. I think I'll just proceed, and uh, I'm not. Uh, I'll not dispute any of what Benessa has said because I think uh, I aligned with what he said. I only want to the, the question about the investment in uh, collection and recycling in four years in Mombasa. I don't know whether that is whether I got it. I, I want to look at that. Maybe number one. I want to say that. Um, uh, in four years from today, that is uh, 2026, I'm almost certain people will be separating their waste at source, I can bet. 
So one thing uh, that is going to happen is that the waste picker that I was describing earlier during my presentation, the guy who works with a gunny bag, uh, will be stuffed of the materials that they find on the roadsides and on trenches. Meaning, socially, um, the waste picker of four years to come will then be the garbage, the, the legular garbage service provider. Is most likely will be a person who has registered their operations with the county government. And there will be people who will most likely be compliant. And uh, lastly, they will also be have accessed what perhaps could be described as a decent undertaking because of the fact that uh, by 2026, the recyclers will be getting more money from what they are getting today. And I have very good reason to say that because I'm also very confident that uh, the EPR obligation will have uh, uh, taken uh, effect. And uh, consequently, waste pickers will uh, either be regular, corporate, or groups that are very well standardized. I'm trying to look at Mombasa of today, four years to come. And... Um, uh, yes, and uh, then the issue of gender. Uh, I don't know what data we are having, but uh, based on what I think and what I have seen, we have a, a gender bias of one is to three uh, on the women's side. We have more women. There is no balance. Women are many. In fact, the boy child is suffering in a big way because uh, other than the ones that we see in groups, uh, anything to do with sorting of waste, which is uh, very manual. You know, we, we don't, especially with plastics, you cannot process plastic until it is sorted one piece from the other. That is done by women. So a big chunk of this is in the, um, about one is to three. So that is like 75%, again is 25% women are, are, are engaged. So I think I've answered two questions. Uh, I don't remember the the other one. Ah, which in the value chain, which which category is making the most? Am I paraphrasing that question? Is that the way it was? So, uh, I want to answer that question in a very indirect way. And uh, this is something that I think will be taken very well and very kindly that there has been a conversation which is uh, not right, that there is segregation and discrimination and also exploitation by some categories of, uh, within the value chain. And I've also heard that uh, there are some brokers and middlemen. Uh, according to what I think, with all due respect, um, there is no much discrimination to some particular kind of people. On the contrary, and this is my own opinion, when I look at the value chain, you require more investment as you go up, and you require almost no investment when you go down. When I look at the waste picker, uh, the current value of plastics today, if you went outside here and collected some two kilograms of plastic, you are supposed to have 60 shillings with you. That is the, the current market that late today. So if I was to consider that level of investment, if I may call it, and then I look at the person who probably would be referred to as a broker, and that would be the person now who is giving the 30 shillings for each kilo, I find like um, uh, there, is a mis uh, there is a misunderstanding. The waste pickers per capita, per kilo, to me, seem to be making a lot of money per unit economics, per un one unit. The value addition and the converter, the guys up there seem to be making money out of the volumes they are processing because they invest a lot of money. Uh, we are talking about licenses and a lot of things, processing and power cost, ETC. So they must collect a lot of material in order for them to, to make sense of what they are doing. So when I was, if I was to look at it in a balanced way, because for us we look at the whole value chain, I don't think there is as much exploitation. 
But then there is the issue of poverty. You find that there is one person who is correcting barely only 30 kilograms. You see, sometimes he's correcting 15 kilograms in a day. So that person seems like he is disadvantaged. Yeah. So I, I, I think in terms of who is making more, maybe those who invest more will make more, just like the way we, we read in the, in the Bible, yeah? not the, the parable of the talents. Eh? And, and those who just want to correct, just pick from the ground, of course they cannot make more money, more, more money than those people who have invested and have the, 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 uh, the, uh, the equipment in place, ETC. So I think that is uh, my perspective. Thank you. All right, thank you, panel, team. Uh, actually, if I can just say summary, high-level summary, especially on the entire aspect, I think what came out is more that maybe a database needs to be there on the team involving the West Collection uh, lineup, upstream all the way to the downstream. On the participation on West Collection, uh, it's more of uh, on the West collection point, but also dependent on the investment, investment, how much you've invested in that aspect. Um, and then also on the idea of uh, inclusivity on the agenda, it seems like it cuts across. I think everyone plays a role across board. Um, so that's just a summary. So we still have a few questions to go. We have specific ones to specific entities, and then we have the general one. So just to, go you know also time is moving fast. The first one, which is more directed to JICA, JICA, John. So they would like to know, so they would like to know, just a minute. Uh, they, will, they, they would like to know more or elaboration on your engagement on the CBOs and the private sector. Your actual engagement with the CBOs and the private sector. Uh, I see Calvin just stepped out, that is on NEMA. Then uh, we have also for the Kenya Association of West Managers or Recyclers. So according to your presentation, it came out that waste, ma waste managers are classified into six categories. That is waste pickers, aggregators, transporters, collectors, value, ad value adders, and converters. So the question is, is this the standard way of categorizing these players, or is it just specific to your uh, association. And then the next question is, is it possible to standardize this categorization? So that is for the Kenya Association of Waste Managers or Recyclers. I see Calvin Nema, how are you? He's back. Um, there's one question for you. <laughs> okay. Um, then maybe before I ask one for Calvin's, so there is also one question which is actually more general, so all the panel can give an opinion. So it's actually asked, a lot of solid waste collected within Mombasa is transported to other cities, Nairobi in this case which is being done to ensure that the value generated from West does not benefit, I'm actually reading what is written, does not benefit communities outside our city. So there is this belief that West here is transported elsewhere, another city, so that it doesn't benefit the communities in this city. Uh, I think this is more of a county government, yeah, though it's more of a, a cross board. And then um, another one which is also more general is actually what are some areas for innovation within the value chain of waste collection? So the, 
the question is, uh, what are some of the areas of innovation within the value chain of waste collection? So that's more general. So we have two general questions. We have one to the Kenya waste managers. Then we had another one for JICA. And then now I have one for NEMA. And then we can go for uh, responses. So Calvin, uh, I'll bring the mic to you, don't worry. So they're asking, how do you plan to implement enforcement of the Solid Waste Management Act for consumers, households, municipalities, etc., given the first informal waste management network? So it's all about the enforcement of the Waste Management Act across consumers, households, municipalities giving in mind the first informal waste management network. So how will you in enforce it across that particular network? So maybe we can start with Jaika. I think it was the first question. Jaika, John, Mugai. Yeah, uh, how we engage with the CBOs and the uh, private sector uh, in our projects. Once we identify the, pro uh, the community-based organizations under which JICA is working, uh, we usually have representative uh, represented in our PIU. Our PIU, the project implementation unit. We have a project implementation unit for every project that takes care of all uh, members. And uh, CBOs are usually represented. And also the private sector also represented in the PIU. Uh, PIU is the highest decision-making uh, organ in our project, within the project. So these people's uh, interests are well taken care of once they're represented in that uh, uh, section. And then, uh, for private sector, we usually contract private sector to do studies, especially in the areas of uh, uh, speciality, uh, to come up or, or provide information that they are well aware, uh, depending on their expertise. So once the project is up and running, all these interested groups are usually incorporated in, a, in what we call a project implementation unit. So all our in, their interests are taken care of. And then um, on a higher level, we have, we, have, we have what we call joint coordinating committee. Joint coordinating committee is a committee from the government side that works with JICA. And this government side we usually insist that it should consist of all groups, all, all interested uh, and beneficiaries of, of, of the project will be uh, incorporated also in this body. I think I've tried to answer. All right. Thank yeah. you, John. Yeah. yeah, thank you for breaking out the role of private sectors and the CBOs that you have a project control unit to take care of the interest at the project level private who are still contracted to con conduct some studies and their interests are also taken care of. They joined uh, the joint committee in terms of uh, integrating it with the government. So now let's uh, go to the next one on maybe, West Recyclers. Maybe I can add something on that. Uh, now, how do we identify the CBOs and the private sector, especially in our area of intervention? We usually do what is called a detailed uh, implementation survey before we commence a project. That's the time we identify all the CBOs and the private sector within that locality of the project. I just wanted to add that. Thank you, John. Now we go to our team on West uh, Recyclers. Uh, on the aspect of uh, the way you categorize the players according to the six categories that you provided, and if there is a possibility of standardizing this. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, perfect. So, very good question about the six categories of waste. Um, um, uh, dealers, waste actors in the waste uh, value chain, the six categories. Well, I, I know the word standard is a very deep word because standard also is uh, where we get the SIO ETC. So uh, let me say that we don't have an ISO on the, the categories. But what I want to say is that uh, this has emanated from or the way the KAWR came up with this category, category came from the need to differentiate the actors based on the role that they are playing. Meaning uh, that if, for instance, one was to, because it's a huge concern that we have in the waste management space, and uh, it's good that Carl Fins is back, because we've always had issues with the, the licensing regime that uh, the authorities are using when they, for instance, classify every person as a recycler in the, for instance, the requirement for a recycling license, which is a standard requirement for every person who is doing processing of waste, so to speak. The, re the reason why we came up with these categories is because we know it is unfair when, for instance, you look at a converter who is doing 200 tons a month and somebody who is doing value addition, let's say for instance he is doing first category value addition, he has a grinding machine for plastics, and he is doing 29 or 24 tons a month. When these people are, are, are classified the same, it means there is a lot of uh, details that have been uh, um, uh, not been considered. One of them is, uh, because this is a business, uh, we, we are business people, one of them is the, the income. A factory, I mean any factory, any factory in Kenya that is doing plastic production, and uh, you would have in mind a factory uh, when I say this, usually is uh, charged 43,000 for a recycling license. So of course, 3,000 is for application, 40,000 is for recycling license. If a person who has one grinding machine goes to apply for a recycling license, he's supposed to pay the same amount. So the association, of course, now the association is an umbrella for the recyclers. So as we advocate for the pride and the needs of the recyclers towards um, you know, availing a conducive environment for their businesses. So much as probably this may not be standard, which I don't know whether the standard is supposed to come from uh, maybe the, the, the government or from which side, we, we advocated, even as we were doing the public participation for the, 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 the recent uh, enacted uh, act on sustainable use management, because KEWA contributed significantly, this, wa this is one of the areas that we, we were addressing, that let people, let the, the license regime reflect or co be commensurate with the level of income for every category so that instead of criminalizing activities which are very genuine uh, people can feel welcome to offer themselves to to comply to pay licenses so that instead of paying 40,000 for somebody who is not making as much then he is supposed to belong somewhere whereby he can pay the license and feel comfortable and feel recognized and feel like somebody who is doing his patriotic duty of building the nation. So as, as uh, far as the category is concerned, what I would say is that we, we, I would like to welcome opinion. And uh, of course this is after a long discussion from the, the body that governs KAWR. It is a discussion that went for like three months until people agreed that there is a difference between somebody who is doing value addition and somebody who is doing aggregation. I think with that, I'll move to the next question, which is a not specific question, but a general question about areas of innovation in waste collection. Sorry. Sorry for that. Uh, yours were two, actually, about the standardization. 
So I think you s you've explained the first one. Then the the other one was it was saying, is it possible to to standardize this now that you meet all the stakeholders in the waste recycling? And then we have the other two questions, which are general, more on the waste collection within Mombasa and taken to another city. And the other one was on the innovation, which is more general. Maybe you, we can do that as the last item. We still have uh, four more specific questions to specific team members. Maybe you can respond to the standardiz standardization of the categories. Thank you. So. Uh, is it possible to standardize the categories? That is the second question, isn't it? Okay, I had answered that, although very briefly, because I said, yes, it is possible, but then maybe we need to expand the participation so that um, we can hear the opinion from others. Yes. Otherwise, this is the best that could be done from where we come from, uh, and other opinions are welcome as well. Thank you. Thank you. Now we go to... Name a question uh, about the plan by your team to roll out the enforcement across all the areas that is consumers, household, municipalities, keeping in mind the first, uh, the first network when it comes to informal waste management. Uh, thank you very much. What we intend to do and what we do if you look at the act, is that it advocates for collaborative approach in terms of its implementation. And what we intend to do is to work very closely with the county government. The county government has a lot of resources with regards to human capital, the inspectorate department as well as the county courts. And we've used them before, particularly with the emphasis on the plastic ban of the single-use plastics. So it's the same thing that we intend to do, to take advantage of the human capital of the county to do more enforcement. So uh, thank you. Maybe now we can go to the two question, which is more general. Uh, panel can respond to it, and then we'll go to the specific. So we have about um, four more on specific. So the first two questions that is more general. The first one is about the solid waste management collected in Mombasa and transported to another city, which is Nairobi with a deemed reason of not having the local community not benefiting. The other one was the areas. What are some areas for innovation within the value chain of waste management? Maybe we can start from uh, with Ebenezer. Yeah, I think uh, it's a very interesting question when someone says that uh, which waste is transported from Mombasa County without the community benefiting. Uh, the past, first point of the community benefiting is are the people who collected the waste and sold them to the aggregator. So now the other question that will arise is, is there a facility in Mombasa that will then uh, support um, value addition to the waste that is being created? Uh, but I've, I think I've also seen uh, a little bit of, um, uh, not a little bit, I've seen interest from investors to come in to Mombasa to have facilities that then will um, add value. Uh, but the other question is, are the quantities sufficient for the investor to have a facility in Mombasa? You know, sometimes when we see the plastic on the street, we think it's too much and it will be sufficient to have a facility uh, in Mombasa. But then you also have to conduct a study to know the kind of machine that you'll be able to invest in and what is the capacity. 
So if you will be running below capacity, then it doesn't make sense. So your return on investment will actually um, either take longer or your cost will be higher than your revenues. So um, probably the question will have been phrased differently to find out how then can we uh, attract investors in different value chains that then will help the communities to benefit. For example, if you were to look at uh, the coconut husks, right? I think I know there's a company, uh, is it Kwale or is it Mombasa? I'm not so sure, one of the two, uh, that does production of coconut products. But then the waste from the husk is a problem to them. So there could be a level of investment where you include the coconut husk with organic waste to manufacture briquettes and pellets either for industrial use or home use, right? The other low-hanging fruit there is the investment on uh, BSF, black soldier flies, uh, to be able to get uh, animal protein uh, from that. So. Those are the two opportunities, and that's how probably I will rephrase that question to look at what are the opportunities for Mombasa when investors come that will also benefit the community, rather than looking at it and saying, why is our waste going away? In fact, they are taking your problems away. So it should be, <laughs> it should, should be more <laughs> like a benefit. But again, there's also a challenge in the transportation, and that's actually one of the things that Richard will tell you the transportation cost for some of these investors is normally high, um, and that is why they need to take some time to aggregate and transport them at once. Actually, the transportation cost is normally higher that they would rather have uh, a facility that is within the county and have all waste collected. But if the quantities do not make sense, then they will have to aggregate and transport it somewhere else. Same thing that I've seen in uh, uh, same thing that I've seen in Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Malawi. They do collect waste, uh, they do pelletize, but they transport it to South Africa for value addition. Um, and, and in Zambia, they do that for glass because there's no facility to recycle glass in Zambia. So you see, if you ask the question, why is the Zambian waste going to South Africa? I think that, to me, will not be a question that will uh, really benefit. The question should be, how can we have a facility in Zambia that will take advantage of the glass waste that is there? Anyway, that's just my opinion. <laughs> And they say I'm entitled to my opinion, but the other panelists can also add on to that. Okay, before I comment on that one, I just want to give you a saying that came out of Nigeria uh, with respect to getting people together those that have a product and those that want to use the product. It says, want, want, no get, 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 no want. So I think the county, if you have a database, then you can get people together, those that need the product and those that do not want a product. So as a result, it becomes a win-win situation for everyone. <laughs> want, want, no get. Get, get, no end. <laughs> okay. Then uh, I think I agree with uh, Ebenezer with respect to solid waste management moving to other cities. I mean, if you do not have the facilities, and remember, it's about quantities. And if you cannot even investment, you cannot invest if you are not going to get the quantities because it will not be business, uh, commercially viable. So you take it somewhere else where they will treat it and you, you make your money, that, uh, that's it. And uh, 
according to innovations uh, in the value chain of waste, um, there are issues of immobility, use of electric tuk-tuks, uh, at least that way pollution becomes sort of like a, a non-issue. And there have been projects here in Kenya where the two-wheelers and the tricycles have been introduced that use uh, electricity. And uh, in, in, is it in Nyeri, there is a project where a company is into manufacturing uh, biogas as um, uh, fuel for cooking and whatever. So it is put um, dumping bins uh, at the markets so that it gets uh, organic matter from fruits and vegetables at the source. Not for it to be dirty, mixed with everything else, and then to sort it out, no. To the market, and they have been, our awareness has been raised. They put the dump there with the waste there, and it just collects and put into the digesters. So there are a lot of innovations uh, around that can also be copied by others. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think um, I will respond to, uh, I think, the question on uh, waste being collected in Mombasa, transported to other cities. And I think I will concur with uh, Benessa and uh, Alex in their response. It's, it's about uh, the economies of scale. And uh, the investment, as it was mentioned earlier, at a higher level, it requires volumes for them to break even. So if the company is Nairobi, maybe materials have to be taken to Nairobi. If we have to invest in Mombasa, do we have the necessary quantities to sustain uh, such a company in Mombasa? And uh, I don't think it's completely true that uh, the materials are collected in Mombasa and taken, uh, that is, is one floor, one direction floor. I think if you ask the companies that are in the house, there are those who are also bringing materials from outside the county to Mombasa. I know those who are getting materials from 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 Kwale, so, sorry, from 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 Kilifi, into the county, and I know one who is actually getting the materials from outside the county. So we are also importing uh, the materials somehow. So I think it's it's about economies of scale, but I think looking forward, Mombasa being a port city is probably at an advantage of hosting a large scale uh, recycling company because. If the materials are not locally available, we can always get it from other countries through through the port. So I think there is hope in that direction. I want to answer quickly to the question on the standardization of the categories uh, that uh, Richard has spoken to. And I think it, the best place to start this discussion is in the legislative uh, framework because that categorization has a financial and legal implication. Uh, I remember when we were developing our own uh, bill, we had like two categories. One, we did not want to recognize waste pickers at all. We thought that they are a problem, they not need to be in our law, we don't recognize them, we don't want to deal with them. So that, that, that terminology alone, that category was not palatable for us and we thought that we should not consider it. And then we say that we will categorize in terms of offenses and penalties that will have individual players and companies. So if you are a company littering, your fine was up to 5,000, I think something like that. If it was an individual, if it was a company, it could probably be 50,000. So we were categorized based on the, on, the, on, the, on the level of play. But then the legal team said, but, but all of them are, are violators. So I think Christine, may answer to this at a later point. But so what was agreed that since all of them are actually players, that we just make one sweeping statement. That if you find violating, you'll be liable for this number of months and a penalty of up to 100,000. So now we've moved it to 100,000. So even if you are a one player who has dropped a packet of, uh, of, of, of milk in the street, you can be fined up to 100,000. 
If it's a company that has tipped a whole container, it is also up to 100,000. So I think that characterization is important in that angle, that it may, uh, if it's everybody's lumped together, there is that implication that may disadvantage some, some group of people. And then on issues of uh, innovation, I think there is uh, opportunity in uh, product design. If you look at most products that are made from recycled plastic, they are your usual water containers and, and, and that kind of stuff. And so the market is not broad for them. I think it will be better when uh, at the product design level we come up with more innovative products that can be produced from recycled materials. I think that will increase the, the market reach. I think also there is hope in um, organic waste uh, innovations within the organic waste. Uh, mostly I think we look at biogas and then uh, compost. Now the compost it itself has problems because organic waste, the composition of nutrients keep on fluctuating depending on the season. And, uh, and, and, and so standardizing uh, organic sort of compost has not been very, very successful. And so this, that area still can attract a lot of uh, innovation and research to come up with a standard product from organic waste that then can be used as animal feed or, or compost for, for, for fertilizer for, for, for crop production and the rest. I think that would be my take. Uh, I think my colleagues, have, my fellow panelists have answered, especially the question of removing material from one county to another conventionally. I want to look at it as a, the person who asked is a person who is annoyed and a person who thinks he can benefit from the waste and cannot benefit. I want to remind that person that our laws in Kenya uh, allows for public participation where you can bring such issues to the county government to take action. And I take example of what happened in Machakos County back in 2016 where quarry miners complained that they have uh, transporters taking quarry dust from Machakos County to Nairobi and they are not benefiting. And that made the county of Machakos to come up with a cess that charged all lorries <laughs> carrying quarry from Machakos to Nairobi. So uh, there are ways in which that person can also be helped. And I'm looking at him as somebody who is annoyed and is not benefiting <laughs> from, 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 from the waste. That's just my unconventional uh, addition. Mingi penda kuchangi hapa kwenye vipi bidhai za waste zinatoka county ya Mombasa zinda county nyingine. Mene na thani yoni changamoto kama assist waste recyclers ambayo tunapania kuweka hizi recycling plants katika kontetu wa Mombasa. Kama vile tumesema alikon no waste recycling tunapania kuweka shredding machine. Na kini tunapata hizo bidhambo zinaenda sweti kuna uwaba wa recycling plants. Kwa mbo unapata hizo plastic ambayo zidia kuwa shredders zinaenda Nairobi. Unapata zili plants ziko huku zinakosa material. Zinafanya yo shredding. Unapata hizo pengine kama hiyo cooperative naweza kufunga ama ni vipi. Na thani itabidi tuwe na kongamano na watungaji sheria wa county tuone kama kabla zile plants ambayo tuko nazo recycling plants ambayo tuko nazo kwa county azija tosheka na zile bidhaa basi na kutakuwa si haki zile bidhaa kupelekwa kwa kwa county nyingine tunadhani nataka na tulifalie njuga na tulizungumzie kama recycling plants ziko kwa nini hizo bidhaa ziende nje alafu zile recycling plants tuko nazo zikose hizo material alafu zifunge hapo itakuwa tumekosesha wale jamii nafasi za ajira Kuyo na dhani kuna haja ya kongamano na watungaji sheria. Tuangalia vipi tuweza kweka sheria kama hiyo. Ambo itazuia hizo kama hizo raw materials kwenda kaunti nyingine. Jamani, hakuna material inaenda Nairobi. Mimi leo nimekuja na invoice. Daktari, nimekuja leo nimetumwa na invoice na ETR ya 5 tons. Leo leo kukuja hapa sasa nitakubaliana na nyinyi 5 tons ni trip moja si ndio na mimi nafikiria hiyo kampuni inaletaga material hapa mara mingi so si relationship ya one off so hata kama ni mingi msiweke ses 
Alafu, we, we, we also learned about uh, osmosis and divisions, dio? Where tuliambiwa na mwalimu, molecules move from a point of high concentration to a point of low concentration, isn't it? If material is going to X, from X to Y, there is, there is a relationship. It's probably likely, iyo material ikui bentoka uko inaenda. Sindio? Because if we don't have converters here, it means we don't have manufacturers here. It means we also borrowed finished product from other jurisdictions. Let me also say something, because we are also having same issues with uh, some neighboring country in the name of Ethiopia that is, has been buying now for the second year a specific prime type of material, recycled material. HDPE Yellow has been going to Ethiopia at about 25% higher price than the local price. Are we supposed to refuse the, uh, the market? You see, these regions, the Dogo Sana, we, what we call Kenya is a very small part of the region. If the demand is good in Ethiopia, how do you confuse a businessman as you say? And he's getting more money. Yeah? So, let osmosis work. Let business people get, if they don't take it to wherever it's going, how will these people get the money to collect tomorrow? What about pesa? So, Dr. Musweke, Musweke, you mambo ya ya late ya nini? Allow me to talk just slightly about uh, innovation. Eh? Me ni kuwa kusema mambo ya organic waste. And I want to appeal to all of us here. Because I know we are business people somehow. Kenyans are always having side hustles, isn't it? Let me tell you something. We have a huge potential in organic waste. We are throwing away 65, 60, 60% of our organic waste in Kenya. And we are importing ships and ships of fertilizers. You know the story of fertilizer today, isn't it? Please, if you have your money, let us have a discussion on how to invest in composting, biogas, as my brother has said. There is uh, the BSF. We have issues to do with feeds. We also have Rigra worms, lead Rigra worms, which are doing composting. These are innovative ideas that we need to encourage people to to, to get involved in. And leering worms, they don't make noise. You can even do it on the rooftop. And uh, it can give you some money. So let us uh, put money where it is right. Let us help to absorb our organic waste. Because we are generating so much of it. The only problem we are having, Dr. Ali, we have the idea, but we have no money. If there is anybody who has a lot of money, don't take it to the bank. Come to the recyclers. Let us... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but let us see how we can um, do invest locally. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, the panel, for elaboration on the material movement within, with, I mean, inside and outside Mombasa. I think that is so clear. It's more on a forces of the market, then the other one on the innovation. I think it's quite clear on areas that we can look into, especially on the design level, biogas. And then now, we're actually running out of time. Uh, we will add, we'll still have like 10 minutes. Uh, uh, we still have like 10 minutes. So five minutes will be for, we have about four more questions, specific ones actually to Kenya Association, cooperatives, uh, and JKP, but they're not here. So we have one written for Kenya Association, the other two will be verbal by Gerald, and then they'll answer. And then the panelists will give us uh, their final closing remarks, one minute maybe each, and then uh, we proceed. I see, Ebenezer, how many minutes do you need? Two. That makes it seven. <laughs> I mean, totally. So, you're responding to? Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, uh, and um, just thinking through in terms of why, do the, why 
did the person ask the question why the waste are being transported? Possibly it's because of uh, lack of uh, opportunities uh, and also financing to actualize some of the ideas that they have because um, I think the same ideas that they have is the same idea that the investor who has a lot of money has but now they have the capacity to take out the waste. So I think there should be, um, I think Waziri there was a time there was the county revolving fund, I'm not so sure if it's still functional. That's something that would help uh, the community in terms of getting access to financing. Uh, the bank is also here in terms of the, there's a possibility of groups. And what the, the banks do, it's called um, um, group lending. I think equity also does that, where you co-guarantee each other to get access to a resource. Uh, the other thing, it's over? Okay, almost. The other thing is um, um, access to grants. Uh, for example, if you, go, if you can go and check out the Afri Plastic Challenge, I think there's, there's a challenge that uh, has just been uh, launched today. Someone sent it to me. So um, if we can get to um, the level where we send out these opportunities to the community, I think it will be better so that they are able to harness from such grants and, and benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you, Ebenezer. You've donated about 10 seconds. Thank you so much. So I see the bank is here, and I know there's always about access to, access to financing. Now they are here. I really want to request you to give us your comments as part of the panel final submission. Will that be fine? All right. So let me, uh, we had four questions. So the first one is to the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Uh, so they ask, uh, the question is, in Mombasa, how many members have registered with PRO? It's actually KM stroke Petco, Kepro, is it? Yeah, Kepro is. So in Mombasa, how many members have registered with PRO, either Petco or Kepro? So that is one. Then we have uh, the other one for recyclers, Kenya Association of West Recyclers. And then we also have another one for uh, West Cooperatives. So the first one will be from Gerald. Gerald, uh, kindly, will you take a minute per, per each? Yes, I will. All right. And it's yeah. st it starts now, please. Yeah, thank you. Right. Uh, first of all, uh, is to uh, appreciate uh, this forum and this dialogue. And uh, I think uh, we are uh, somehow or uh, we are getting uh, the objective uh, because one of the key issues uh, we are seeing some of the gaps uh, that maybe needs some focus going forward and probably uh, this also may be a call that we need uh, maybe such forums uh, probably next year and more players coming on board so that uh, as we are looking forward to have exhibitors coming on board, we also have potential investors uh, uh, in, the, in the waste value chain. My other um, observation also is on issues of research and data uh, management interventions uh, in, the, in the waste sector. Uh, it's an area that needs to be uh, looked into. Into my question, two of them, one to the Kenya Association of Waste Recyclers, uh, uh, stroke Petco. Uh, my question will be, what is the position and the future for, uh, for, for, for institutions like uh, the Waste Recyclers Cooperative uh, in the new uh, regime under the EPR regulations? On the other question, uh, it will go to the cooperative. Uh, what is your sustainability um, strategy uh, after the 
support of the three organizations or, or rather four organizations that are supporting uh, the, the cooperative uh, in terms of business, in terms of sustainability and management. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Gerald. So, uh, I don't know, Susan or... Okay. Thank you. Admission in the morning, the number that I have for the whole country is 350, but uh, I'm not very sure how many are Mombasa. But uh, just to mention, what I'm aware is there are some who, who have registered, but they are not literally come members. They are manufacturers, but they are not come members. But once I, once I get the exact number of uh, the ones who have registered from Mombasa late, you know, but the whole country is 350 so far. So we still have a long way to go. Thank you. I think I'll take the pet co questions. Yeah. Um, so for us, we have Coastal Butlers that's here, that's a member of Petco, and we are continuing. I think one of the things we are hoping to do this coming month is to actually have an industry um, sensitization where we'll come to Mombasa and do a recruitment. So that's something we're looking forward to. As for the position and future for waste recyclers, the Kenya Association of Waste Recyclers Cooperative, um, I think for us, the partnership continues. They are significantly valuable in the value chain. Um, we really value the relationship and partnership we've had so far. The biggest thing is that this is a resource of all waste managers. So for us, it's easy to just partner and be able to reach the community. So whether it's the waste collection companies across the different counties, and even just, I think, two months ago, we had a sensitization pro project with them. So this is continuing, and it will probably be fostered even more with the EPR regulations. So the relationship continues. Thank you, KM and Petco, on that clarification. Now, back to cooperative team to give us an answer on the sustainability strategy. Karib. Asante sana. Kwa swali la Bwana Gerard, ambeni nuwauliza, tunamipangilio gani ya kujikimu hata baada hawa shirika hitu watatu kujitoa? Ambo na nadhani ya meyamanisha kuwa ni handi na WWF na YWCA. Tukiangalia cooperative yetu, ni umiliki wake ni wa kijamii sio miliki wa mtu binafsi. Kwa hiyo tuko na mikakati ya kwanza ni umiliki ni kupitia kwa shares, ununuzi wa shares. Ununuzi wa shares alafu iko katika mfumo utafanyi biashara. Kwa hiyo tuko mikakati ya kupanua utenda biashara wetu ambao au tutegemezi peke yake katika upande wa recycling ambao ni hiyo mambo ya shredding peke yake. Tunapania pia kupanua biashara hiyo kwamba tunaweza kufikia mahali ambapo tuko na investment pengine ya kutengeza final products kupitia hizi recyclable materials. Hiyo ni mikakati ambayo tunaiweka na kwa kuwa inamilikiwa na jamii na umiliki wake ni through shares. Kwa hiyo imani ya kwamba wakati pengine kutakuwa na changamoto pengine ya mtaji ama fedha ni tatubidi to float more shares ambao jamii naweza kununua na tukaendeleza uh, biashara hiyo. Siji kufikia hapo kama bwana Gerald swala lako limejibika ama kuna mali nataka kufafanulia zaidi. Asante pia. Asante sana bwana Muhammad about the sustainability strategy with the cooperatives which is more on a share driven. Now we actually coming almost to the close. The next round will be more on the panelists giving us a one minute summary. And then before then, we'll get to hear from uh, a friend from the bank about something on that aspect of financing. Um, but before then, um, he wants to add something. Uh, 
thank you. So I, I just wanted to say that uh, coincidentally today we also got a report from uh, the board uh, notifying our members that they have put together a committee that will be providing leadership in forming a cooperative uh, society, ASACO. So I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm responding to his question that uh, we recyclers are, are, are thinking about how to get their businesses sustainable and to take care of their financial needs. Thank you so much for the additional uh, information. So now back to Mr. Wanyonyi about the financing aspect. I think that was triggered from our panelists. Can you? Thank you. I just needed to respond to the stones that were being thrown by Mr. Kainika. <laughs> uh, on that specific issue, um, we are working with, I know someone we're working with that is um, doing, uh, managing organic waste. And the reason we are working with that person is because he has a huge market but cannot meet the demand because the fertilizer he is able to produce, the manure he is able to produce is so little compared to the orders that he has. So we've started working with him to ensure that he's able to generate more to be able to, to, to meet that market. But what that brings about is the only issue of having a, a business case for waste management. Because if, if we want to, to fundraise to do this, we may never be able to because we, ha we are limited. But banks are unlimited. So are we able to bring out a business case that will be able to get continuous funding for us to meet the, ma uh, the demand? Because it's all about supply and demand. So how can we be able to do that and ensure that we are able to, to supply the market? So I'm just saying that there are business opportunities in waste management, and those business opportunities can be funded by financial institutions. And there's no better financial institution to do that than equity because we already need and, and we are funding it. So uh, that would be my closing remark. Thank you. Thank you. We'll actually take an extra one minute where I know Dr. Neto had asked a team member here to explain something on individual and company having the same fine. So she'll explain in a minute. Okay, so you wanted to get an explanation on something on individual and company having the same fine. Oh, you are, okay. But I had asked, uh, yeah. Okay. All right, so she'll take a minute. Please bear with us, we're almost done. Christine. Uh, that I would uh, respond to this way. The mode of uh, drafting style in Kenya, when it comes to fine, we do not separate a company and an individual. For example, I'll read to you one of the offenses, section 53 of the Mombasa Solid Waste Management Act uh, states this, it's about disposal of waste in a water source. Then I'll explain shortly. Uh, basically it says a person who disposes uh, waste on water will pay a fine not exceeding 100,000. So if you are an individual, not exceeding, that's the catch, not exceeding. It doesn't mean that you'll pay 100,000. So if you're an individual, you can mitigate in court and say, I'm just an individual and I make this amount of money. Please, kindly, your honor, whether it's a magistrate or a judge, kindly give me a fine of 5,000 or 10,000 because I'm just an individual and I generate this amount. However, 
the, the, the court has the ability to see that a company, if you're a company, you have a certain amount of money and therefore you should be more responsible than the individual and not dispose that waste in water or rather, uh, for example, um, raw sewage. There are certain technologies you're supposed to do to treat the, 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 the sewer so that you do not dispose. The, if you're a company, you're likely going to pay the 100,000. So it's just a drafting, drafting style, not exceeding 100,000 to encompass both parties. Thank you. All right, thank you, Christine, so much. Now, our panelists will give us a closing remark, which will hopefully they take a minute. But before then, there will be an accompanying question you can add in as part of your closing remark. Um, oh, he's still writing, so maybe we can begin. So we start from our immediate, give us your closing remark, and thank you so much. Great. So, um, first of all, I will uh, want to say something that is very strange, that uh, all along this conversation I was uh, representing uh, Kepro. So, I want to, on behalf of Kepro, say that, uh, yes, we have members here. In fact, we have members in this uh, sitting. So, we are represented, just as my, my good friend Kadoni said, that... Uh, Mombasa is not left out in the voluntary EPL uh, scheme. What I want to say in finishing is that uh, I hope and I pray and hope that uh, we will do this again next time, God willing, and that um, we will have tangible reports as we come here. We will have things that are happening and uh, things will have started. We'll have little projects happening. And uh, I see uh, Dr. Ali looking at me like uh, uh, it is, uh, we are going to surpass that, which is uh, obviously my prayer as well. So thank you very much. Uh, kwa wale wote wamepanga kongamano hili na wale wote wamejaliwa kufika na kuchangia kwenye kongamano hili na nimejifunza mengi na niweza kujua kuna opportunity nyingi ziko mbele yetu na ino ni safari ambayo imeanza so it imefika kikomo na natazamia siku zosoni bado tazidi kuwa na kongamano kama hili asante nyinyi yeah, um I think in my closing remarks, I'll say that uh, Mombasa is one of the counties that is always open to uh, different partners, uh, investors, and uh, one of the counties that are leading in terms of um, drafting of policy that will be in tandem with the National Sustainable Waste Management uh, Act. So I think there's a lot of potential in Mombasa County. Uh, not only in plastics, uh, but more also on organic waste. So I think there's, as this conversation has started today, probably uh, the, count, the county can, can take lead in terms of bringing their different players together, where we have the community, uh, we, have, uh, we have the donors, uh, and we have uh, development partners coming in with ideas, resources, and, uh, and human, human resource. And, and, and that's where we have the impact, right? So I, I see this as, as a great start because um, uh, sometimes we might also have a, a skewed uh, view, uh, but when we also listen to the community, we also realize that the issues that are within the community 
and the solutions that are available some, sometimes have a mismatch. So it's also good to uh, ensure that the two are able to meet at some point. So uh, this is a great start, and I think the conversation shouldn't end here at Bonawaziri. Um, it should continue with all the stakeholders, uh, even if it's not in person, it could be even virtual. I mean, technology has um, helped us to realize that we can also meet uh, while we are in different uh, regions. Um, so hard to happy, happy to be here and uh, we'll encourage you to also reach out and when we're having different uh, projects that we are running will also include the communities uh, while we are trying to upscale some of the projects that we have in Mombasa as we started in Tudor but uh, we also aim to upscale to different areas. Um, we also welcome companies that are dealing in plastics to join the Kenya Plastics Pact. Uh, Asanteni. Yeah, uh, mine I would want to just share information that uh, when a project has already been launched, there is usually a lot which has been done, let me say, behind the scenes. And one of the documents that is produced behind the scenes is the needs assessment. Needs assessment, uh, most of the time, it is not made public. And where it is not made public, it is not confidential. It can be requested. Uh, we have needs assessment for our projects. If we are requested by an organization, we want to know why, would you wa why do you want such a, an information? If you are a stakeholder, we'll give you the needs assessment. Why am I saying this? Because some of the questions we've been answering here are captured in the needs assessment of some of the projects that exist. Because the needs as assessment lays bare the current situation and make a projection in the future. That is just what I wanted to share with you. Otherwise, as JICA, uh, I'm thankful to have attended this occasion. I see, it, I see stakeholders in Mombasa are really working together and working together. It means they are looking for a bright future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. My closing remarks are in the form of a comment. Usually, when you have mixed diverse people like yourselves, you make the most of that opportunity. You give them time to network, give them time to eat together, to drink together, because a lot of what has been happening or talking about here can continue into other levels. People get to know each other better because we see that uh, in most countries, people don't meet. They only meet for the first time when you put them together like this. So take the opportunity. I think they should have been on this program at least a dinner together uh, people, you know, drinking together informally. That way, they cement relationships. So that is my only comment, that we have not used this forum enough to get the most out of it. Thank you. You know, when Alex was uh, campaigning that I become the last person to talk, I, I didn't know that he had that uh, comment to make. <laughs> about an informal forum where we can talk to each other and know each other better. Uh, Alex, uh, the first dialogue that we had, it was in, in Kuala, a place called Diani, if, uh, if, if you know the place. And uh, we had organized in such a way that on the second day, I think it was three days, that on the second day, the county hosted the members to dinner. And uh, one of the challenge was to identify the last man standing <laughs> or last woman standing <laughs> at the end of, uh, of, of the dinner. And the challenge was very, very interesting. So you could fall off 
Uh, I think the first person to fall off was at around 10. Uh, most, most people fell off at around uh, 11.30 or, or 12. And then the last man standing at that time was a representative of Kefri. Kefri, I think Kefri, yeah. Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute. Eh? So he went to sleep knowing that he was the last man standing. But in the morning we realized that there was one man, in fact two, who never sat, never slept. <laughs> so they were awake until the following day's sessions. So we, 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 we had actually two people who won the game by not sleeping on that night. But I think at the end of it, we knew each other very well. And when you look at us, we interact like a family. I think COVID affected resources. And so in this second dialogue, we don't have the advantage of such, such a dinner uh, because of resources. But now that uh, UNEP is on board uh, and JICA is on board, I think the program is still on. <laughs> so we look forward to the partnership in that direction. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, the reason why I think I also made the last one is because a question was slipped to me when we were supposed to make the closing uh, remarks. And the question was concerning the law requiring waste to be segregated at source. Does it also compel waste service providers to provide material stroke equipment for the same? I think uh, the way we have framed our law, we say that the waste generators at the household level must segregate the waste into two streams. So the wet waste and, and the dry waste. And uh, the law, I think the regulations indicate uh, which color will be the, the liner or the bin for the dry waste and, and, and for the wet waste. And the service providers are compelled by law to only pick that waste that is segregated. And if they pick the dry waste, they cannot be received at the dump site. They can only be received at the material recovery facility. If they pick the wet waste, they may be received at the dump site, uh, but also they can be received uh, 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 somewhere else. So most of the companies, what they have done is because the households are still crumbling with one bin to start with, and so asking them two bins may be complicated, they are now supplying either two liners to the generators, uh, but it's, they are not mandated. I think because they feel like they may carry mixed waste and have a problem wi wi with us. So I think it will go, the generator has a responsibility, but the service provider also has a responsibility. And so where the generator can't, uh, can't provide the two bins, the provider has a responsibility, therefore, to enable the generator to provide that. So with, this, uh, uh, with that response, my closing remarks say, I think, are very simple. Uh, I want to conga with all the remarks uh, that have been said. Uh, but uh, I want to single out what Ebenezer uh, said. And this is something I said also yesterday in another uh, virtual summit with the islands uh, uh, organization, that um, the future of uh, waste management as a business is very, very promising. As Vanessa says, the opportunities are many, and I think they are increasing. The problem is that the challenges are also many, and they are increasing. Some people have uh, mentioned the issues of capacity and competencies that are available for, for, for us, and that some organizations either have cap capacity issues, have competence issues to manage uh, the waste at their level, and so they need support. I think my rallying call is that um, when we work in silos, then we will have those problems hitting us, hitting us very, very hard. We will have capacity issues, we will have competence issues, we will have skills issues. But when we break those silos and work together as a team, you will be amazed at the competencies we have as a team. So my rallying call is that let's work together. 
if all of us work together in synergy, I can assure you that what we will do will be a lot. I remember in the first uh, dialogue, we didn't have uh, a financing institution. Uh, now we have. This should be an opportunity for us to unlock resources that are embedded within that financial institution for those ones who thought that their capacity limitations was about resources. I think resources could be in the house. For those ones who need um, uh, research competencies, we have the universities on board now, and we have uh, research institutions on board. I know uh, the last standing man uh, from Comfrey didn't turn up uh, today, but he's always with us. So we can always tap from their laboratories, their researchers, if you want to design something that is unique to, 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 your, to your project or to your investment in, uh, in waste management. And today I'm also happy that we have had the UNEP in person <laughs> and uh, JICA in person. These two are not there, remember, with us. I remember we had the UN Habitat to begin with that helped us with the, with the survey. Now UNEP, which is even bigger than UNEP Habitat, is in the house. And JICA, uh, Wangi, you know my first employer was JICA. So I know how you operate. JICA usually, they take their time. But when they finally accept to support you, they support you like a woman who is in love. <laughs> They, they never leave you. So I think we are looking forward to that support. And with all those in the house, I think uh, I see a very promising future for Mombasa in terms of waste management. Thank you very much. Was it finished with a, a woman in love? <laughs> uh, let us appreciate each and every one of us for the good work that we've done. I want to appreciate all the moderators from Eva, then we had uh, uh, Brian, and uh, who else? I think they were the two, and then tomorrow we'll have others. So let us appreciate Eva and Brian. <laughs> and then to all our facilitators, thank you very, very much. We've learned a lot. We've really interacted well. So we also appreciate our, our facilitators. Uh, allow me to also recognize the Plastic uh, Technical Working Group, the team. Kindly, wherever you are, stand so that the t we can be able to appreciate you because we've worked so hard. I know tomorrow we will be able to get a chance, but please, everyone from the Plastic uh, Sector uh, Technical Working Group, kindly, kindly, kindly arise so that you can be recognized. Yeah, so those are the members. As you can see, we have from the organizations, we have from Mombasa County. So thank you so much for the good work that we have all done. And then also Waziri, Waziri, you, you are always, what do I say about Waziri? Everything about, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Waziri Asante Sana, you know, just come today and you are here and you are with us up to this time. And we know that tomorrow will be with us also. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, we wish you well, Waziri. All right, so now. Yeah. So tomorrow we request that we come a little bit earlier. Uh, to, it's, the program says 9, but we request to do 8.30 because we have exhibitions and we'd want you to participate fully in those exhibitions to see what people have out there. This is an opportunity for us. We've been told waste management is going to be the big thing. And, uh, you know, with the employment nowadays, with the work, uh, you know, any time ukiamuka hakuna kazi, this is an opportunity for us. So let us come early. We do our sessions early, and then now we take over, the, the exhibitions take over, then we can comfortably ask questions and learn more about the different exhibitions that we have. Uh, I want to also assure the team that talked about uh, us continuing with what we are doing already. Uh, we have this technical working group that is coordinating most of the partners, and therefore this can be your entry point. Because we have the county government of Mombasa here, we have the partners, both non-state and state, we have the research institutions, we have the, the uh, colleges, everybody's here. So if you want a place where you can be able to start from, this is the, the place where to, you can come in and then we can work together. 
We have been so active. We started off with Mijibora. Mijibora, uh, through the Mijibora uh, project, we were able to start the TWG, and the TWG has grown. We've had the first sector working in a dialogue. Now this is the second one, meaning that we are growing each day. So this is an opportunity for all those partners who've not worked with us, come and work to, let us work together and push the agenda forward. So uh, on uh, issues, uh, logistics, we'll discuss about them tomorrow morning. So kindly bear with us. Uh, I also request the team that was co coordinating uh, this dialogue kindly stay behind. We have a few sh things we need to discuss so that uh, we see how tomorrow will work out for us. There is tea at the back. So we'll still pray. You have your tea and then you can go. Then tomorrow let us meet here early in the morning. And I believe tomorrow we'll also take a photo, so dress nicely, look pretty, then see you tomorrow. <laughs> and then I hope that the next dialogue will have the cocktail, as Waziri said. So, sir, don't worry. We actually usually have cocktail. It's only that this time round things didn't work out well for us. So, yeah, you're welcome. So let us have someone to pray for us, and then we have our tea, and then meet tomorrow morning. Anyone to pray for us?